Awesome. Hello, everyone. We are back. Good to hey see there. you all. Yes, we are back. Sorry to interrupt the snow. <laughs> uh, maybe we'll go back to that a little bit later on in the day. Thank you all for your interaction with the last panel. Appreciate that. And uh, we are going to move on to some unexpectedly smart shows with this guy here. Yeah, it's me uh, again. Exactly. Uh, so let's go ahead and do it. We, I'm going to throw up some, uh, some slides that we have here. Um, and, um, yeah, go, go for it. Here, you, you take the seat. Yeah. You take the most important seat. Okay, I'm in the big boy chair. Imagine that. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, we'll have uh, Cole right here. Hello. Um, hi, my name is uh, Yukishiro, uh, also known as Alan DeCora La Souza um, of Otaku Brain Trust. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you about... Uh, Unexpectedly smart shows. This is a bit of a uh, talky listy thing. Um, you might even say a listicle. Um, so first, who am I? Ooh. There it goes. Um, hold on, you got that? Yeah. Go ahead. I mean, it's oh. in the top left corner. All right. Um, excellent. So uh, I'm Alan. I've completed about 400 anime at this point, um, and I'm a bit of a pretentious anime watcher. Um, I like a good think piece that seriously delves into philosophy, society, or the human condition. Things like Ghost in the Shell that are um, uh, really picking apart what a person is, and Psychopaths, which is examining society. Um... But this panel, this panel is not that at all. <laughs> uh, this panel is about shows that I've seen that I was uh, looking for something w much lighter, something that was going to be just entertainment, uh, some sort of a relaxing uh, slice of life or a dumb action thing. And they surprised me because they had a lot more going on underneath the surface than uh, what was advertised on the tin. It had a lot to chew on that they didn't even put up front. Like, nobody goes into Ghost in the Shell or Psycho Pass not expecting... Like, literally the first scene of Psycho Pass is two guys uh, in a fist fight with each other while quoting obscure philosophers at each other. Um, if you've seen that first scene, you know what the show is going to be. <laughs> um, so, no highly cerebral thrillers here um there will probably be some basic spoilers for shows but as these shows are pretty light to begin with a lot of slice of life stuff you're not really going to have much of a that's not really going to affect any particular enjoyment there and i will need to talk about some stuff a little bit to talk about these shows but hopefully that only causes you to uh enjoy uh want to seek these shows out a little more oh boy uh off off on a big one First up, we have Fate Zero. Uh, everybody here seen Fate Zero? All right, so Fate Zero is part of the Fate franchise. Uh, a sprawling uh, franchise. We don't have Jay here to talk about the... Uh, unpack the web of a billion different uh, shows that it has in um, all in their own separate timelines. Um... Uh, tied together in a ridiculous way. But if you don't know anything about Fate to begin with, it is um, a show about wizard fights. Uh, wizards uh, are trying to fight for a Holy Grail, which is a, going to give them a wish if they win it in a death tournament, because it's also a death game. Um, and they summon ancient spirits... Um, to be their heroes like Pokemon to fight their battles for them. And regardless of sense, they, like 50% of them or more, will be cute anime girls. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. So King Arthur Pendragon will be a cute anime girl. Um, uh, Elizabeth Bathory will be something. <laughs> yeah. uh, Astolfo will be... Well, you've seen Elena fan art. <laughs> Elena Blavatsky. <laughs> yes. Which is my favorite for a multitude of reasons. 
all sorts of ridiculous things. So what I expected from this show was, uh, because it's from Type Moon, a cavalcade of cool character designs with all the same faces, but, uh, you know, a lot of uh, flanges and stuff coming off of them that I would enjoy. Uh, nonsense power levels, like... Uh, the Berserker's power it includes, like, oh, yeah, it sounds like becoming angry and, uh, you know, becoming real strong. But apparently that also includes uh, being able to take over a fighter jet <laughs> and then engage in an aerial dogfight with Gilgamesh uh, in his, like, Death Star. Um <laughs> And Gilgamesh, his power is also ridiculous. His power is that he's so rich that he has everybody else's powers. Um, it just makes no sense, but it's it's always hype and pretty goofy, and it it has very circuitous plot uh, plotting. But what I also got from the show that what I wasn't expecting, and also. Um, the reason for this is because this is the only entry that w that is written by Gen Urobuchi, mm. uh, the same guy who wrote Psychopaths. And hmm? mention the other one. Hmm? Mention the other Urobuchi property. Uh, the, the big one. I, I Psychopaths is my Madoka. favorite. Madoka. Madoka, yes. <laughs> but I love I love Psychopaths. That's yeah. my favorite. Um. Uh. But it. I've seen a number of other fate, uh, like a few episodes of a number of other fate things trying to get into it. It never quite held me because it was pretty silly. But this one has like, got a lot, a lot of a darker tone, um, and spends a lot of time um, engaging with ethics and statecraft. Um, so there was pretty much an entire episode where. Um, three of the summoned spirits decide to not fight each other and sit down and have a little drink with each other while discussing how effective they w were or weren't at uh, leading their respective uh, uh, civilizations when they were alive. Um, so you have Arthur Pendragon, you have Gilgamesh of, uh, well, the first myth, um, and Iskander, um, also known as Alexander the Great. Um, and then it also probes uh, with um, our main character, Kuritsugu, prom probes how much evil can be done in the service uh, of a greater good and a utilitarian structure. So the three perspectives taken by these characters um, are what gives them the right to even be a leader. Um, and uh, Arturia Pendragon... Um, so I, I guess I'll, I'll go in order here. Gilgamesh, who is the has the oldest school mentality about this, says, "Well, I'm a demigod. I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm descended from the gods themselves, and all that is required is I am leader because of divine right. I am inherently better than other people." And he's well, he's a very pretty man. Um, <laughs> the um, so uh, all that is me, the only thing required for him to, to rule is that he is better, he is richer, and he is more powerful. Um, Arturia Pendragon um, takes a perspective that is a lot more like what we would generally think of as our leaders in kind of modern representative democracies, uh, where you think of your leaders not so much as overlords, but as uh, civil servants who are working for the people themselves. Theoretically, at least, the President of the United States is an employee of all of the people of the United States. And the kind of ideals we have for our civil servants are that they should be self-sacrificial um, and work tirelessly for the good of the people around them, kind of a derived from, like, Athenian um, uh, philosophers. Um... And so Arturia makes an, uh, an argument for a kind of personal service and martyrdom as a reason for uh, her to be a better leader. And Iskander finally makes an argument that um, 
no, that doesn't matter. And it was kind of interesting the way this was set up because Artura is usually your best girl for the show. Uh, the servant of the main, uh, the main character, and is usually always portrayed as being in the right in every other in iteration of this of this show. Here, it kind of has Iskander lay a bit of a smackdown on her, um, because Iskander is making an argument that um, he is a good leader because. He is a model for all of the people who want to follow him. He doesn't so much demand that people follow him, so much as his, he lives in such a grand and good way that other people will see this and want to be like him and want to follow him to whatever it is he wants to do. So he wants to conquer all the way to oceans undiscovered. Well, he's going to... Fight the hardest, and people will want to be like him. He's going to laugh the loudest, and people will see that as a value that they'll want to embody. He will love more than anybody else, and people will see this and uh, um, uh, model themselves after him and then follow him on his quests. And he then lays the smack down on Arturia, saying that, What happened to your kingdom? <laughs> um... Oh. Which was that after, after uh, in the in their storyline, after um, Arturia died at the hands of Mordred, um, her uh, um, Camelot fell apart because she, she had been doing so much for the kingdom that nobody else knew how to take care of themselves. Nobody else was independent enough or strong enough to take up that leadership or to even manage their own affairs, she had been doing it all for them. Uh, so she was left with ruin and regret. Um, whereas everybody else after, after Skander died just continued being conquering people. <laughs> yeah, uh, they lived and died the way they wanted to. Uh, so that was very interesting to me, and they spent an episode doing that before didn't just show up and then they go into a reality marble because <laughs> it's a show about wizard fights. Um, so then we have the utilitarian quandary. So this is this is um, ensconced in a grimmer take on the uh, on the Holy Grail world, which is already a death game, so it's already pretty grim. Um, where. Mm, where our main character, Kuritsugu, wants to actually do the best thing with his wish for the Holy Grail, if he wins it. Which is, other people are going to be wishing for, like, power or for something for themselves. And he's like, I literally want to wish for world peace. Because he's, spe he's spent a lot of his life in different war zones across the globe doing dirty things. And he's like, I want an end to war. I want literal world, like, peace on Earth. There's nothing better, nothing higher you could wish for than that. It's the ultimate good. But he's also utilitarian. And he finds himself at the, uh, the extreme, uh, the extreme uh, testing of such a ethical structure. Which is since he actually has, through magical means, the ability to achieve the ultimate good. That... Since the ends justifies the means to get there, because it's a utilitarian structure, you could do any amount of dirty, dirty tricks and evil to get there, and it would be worth it because you would just make a perfect world at the end. Gendo Yep. <laughs> well, I'd make the argument. Gendo didn't even care about the yeah, world. We just, he was, we just wanted yeah, his wife yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he led people on. Yeah. yeah, he's like, no, it's it's just it's because yeah. I'm down yeah. bad. But he's <laughs> Kiritsugo is very much making a, kind of doing a bit of a mastermind. He's less of a mastermind because he's not in control of every uh, outcome. He's more of a sneaky rogue type who's just sneaking in, like taking out people in the dirtiest using the dirtiest tricks possible. So he, over the course of the show, he kills a lot of people, betrays a lot of people who were close to him. 
Um, even like manipulating like a kind of daughter figure to him to sacrifice herself. Because at the end, it will all be okay if he makes this wish. And, I mean, I'm not really issuing spoilers for Fate if you've seen all of the Fate series. The, uh, the cake is a lie. <laughs> uh, the wish, the wish is no, the wish is not really real. It's no good. Uh, evil, evil lives there. And, um, it actually, it actually proposes an interesting thing to him because it's kind of an evil, because the, e the evil goblet <laughs> basically says, like, well... If you had two people, uh, two groups of people on two separate ships, and there was slightly more people on one ship, and mm -hmm. you needed to divide resources and you could only save one of these ships, well, then you should just destroy the ship with less people on it. And then you divide those into, into two more ships, and eventually re you end up at the point, well, it's trying to make the argument that, hey, Kirutsugu, you know, the only ethical thing would be to kill everyone. <laughs> At that point, he's like, "Oh, this is this is no good. I can't actually achieve any good with this thing." Gilgamesh is there, and he's naked. Yeah. Oh, of course. <laughs> um, I, actually, one of my favorite things about the end of this series is it occurs in a timeline like a decade or so before, like most of the other series, because it doesn't involve the main character who. Yeah. Uh, uh, Shiro. call yeah, Shira, who call outs is a very dumb shonen boy. <laughs> um, uh, that, um, in the intervening decade, uh, Gilgamesh, who was depowered and shows up in that in all of the later series, has just been like living a weird playboy life. <laughs> like traveling the world and sleeping with lots of women and getting them to pay for whatever he wants <laughs> because he's essentially like the prettiest host club boy <laughs> all right my next show here is planetess um this is essentially a show about space garbage men mm -hmm. um <laughs> anybody seen it here it yeah um Great opening song, too. Um, it is the year, it is the not-too-distant future, the year 2077. And I guess Virgin Atlantic and all these people have been running low-orbital flights through space. Um, there's a, active space stations, there's a colony on the moon. And the Earth is preparing to send a deep space mission to Saturn. I guess that's not deep space, but a large mission to Saturn because we're just getting to explore the wider solar system. Uh, but they are dealing with an environmental pollution that we're already seeing in our modern day, which is uh, orbital pollution. Um, everything in space that is in orbit is moving at an extremely high speed to keep it in orbit and to keep it from falling to to Earth uh, because of Earth's gravity. Uh, so whenever uh, something gets destroyed up there, it creates a lot of debris moving at hundreds of miles an hour. And if somebody's out there in a spacesuit or if there's a satellite up there and even a screw uh, moving at hundreds of miles per hour impacts one of those satellites, you could just take out a satellite. Um, I'm not sure if we've had some examples of this happening already. Russia just blew up one of their spaces. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Russia and China have been doing this. I'm not sure if we've had any satellites specifically taken no. out by, by space debris no, yet. but they created a lot more space debris. But it is, it is a mounting concern um, that you, if we polluted the uh, Earth's orbit enough, we could enter a uh, communications dark age again um, where we wouldn't be able to make use of satellite uh, communications. We wouldn't have GPS uh, we'd be in, reliant again on, like, transatlantic cables and, like, phone lines and stuff. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, I don't think we go back that far, but it, but it could be pretty grim. Um, and also, we, it would be impossible to explore space further if we can't even, like, manage um, what's directly outside of Earth. So... Technology is advancing, and we're already messing it up. Uh, and this is essentially a workplace comedy. There's a bunch of people in the garbage disposal unit where they go on spacewalks, find trash, 
toss it into Earth's or uh, towards Earth so that it burns up in at Earth's atmosphere to kind of keep the place clean. They are that department uh, that nobody likes because they're garbage men and they have a bunch of quirky people uh, working in their department. Um, Steve Carell style. <laughs> um, so what I was expecting, I was expecting a group of lovable, quirky underdogs. We have um, uh, our main boy uh, who is trying to become like a exploratory um, uh, astronaut on the on the mission to Saturn. Uh, we have we have a character who uh, is much more involved in like a, a human approach to people um, and. You've got a manager who can't deal with the limited budget they have. Um, uh, an experienced person who smokes too much. Uh, so, I was expecting the show to have, like, you know, funny characters. And also a lot of uh, otaku stuff about uh, hard sci-fi. So, for people who want to not, like, yell Shining Finger on a robot that has feathers, but want to know how space actually works and have, like, one of those real robot situations. Like, everything shown in here is very much how uh, space either space travel either works currently, or uh, you could reasonably expect it to have to work uh, going forward. Um, the difficulties of being uh, weightless, uh, the amount of training you have to do uh, to keep your bones intact... Um, there's, uh, they've already had the first person born on the moon colony, and her bones don't allow her to travel to Earth. <laughs> um, so yeah, you see this guy's like, if you don't want to get killed by having your, uh, face smashed in, don't open your face guard, because there's debris moving around. But what I also got from this, uh, show was... Well, just a grand view on humanity, there was an awe at the capabilities of individual and societal achievement technologically, um, and then also a dismay <laughs> at the individual and societal <laughs> achievements of man. So it is uh, the year 2077, and um, oh, I'll get into the naming of this. They are, they are looking at f further exploring space, using technology in a bunch of ways, but they haven't solved the problems of Earth yet. There's still a bunch of separate countries that have issues with each other. There's still poverty, famine, and war on Earth. Um, at one point, they one of the things that they have to drop into Earth's orbit as space debris was a monument to like uh, the end, uh, like a ceasefire or the end of a, a regional war on Earth. Um, and they have to just kind of chuck that like trash. Uh, and that that area fell back into war afterwards anyway, and they're like, oh, this is just really sad. Um, but uh, one character feels still hopeful about the future, so humanity has learned nothing from the mistakes of the last century. Um, there's space terrorism because of this. Um, uh, there are people that are very mad that billions of dollars are being spent on a project to go to Saturn when there's a lot of things that need to be solved on Earth, uh, and eventually it ends, uh, culminates in um, uh, one of our uh, our older veteran character having to have a confrontation with uh, space terrorists uh, because all of the smoking rooms have been closed down because they were bombing smoking rooms, and they just need a smoke. <laughs> uh... Because, you know, if you're in space and you need to smoke, you have to vent that very specifically because you have to control your atmospheric systems. Um, also, to really get at this, the, um, the project to, to Saturn, uh, or Jupiter, Jupiter uh, to Jupiter, um, is named the Werner von Braun, um, who is a man of... Who's had a huge effect on uh, rocketed space technology um, uh, in the in the in the twentieth century? Uh, if you were to look him up in the context of the fifties and sixties, well, he was heading NASA. Um, and there was yeah. nothing before that. <laughs> yes. uh, he. Before that occurred. 
He uh, he was leading NASA at the time that we put uh, we were in uh, that America was engaged in uh, its um, space race with the USSR. Uh, put uh, men on the moon. All of those missions were led by this man. Uh, he was the organizational head. Before that, he was already uh, at the forefront of rocket technology because he invented the V2 rocket for Nazi Germany. <laughs> because he was a Nazi. <laughs> yes, he was technically part of the Nazi part. Uh, he definitely had a Nazi party membership. He always argue, he always argued that like he just wanted to do science, um, and it was the only place he could do science. He may not have had a choice, but you know it's always debatable because history is obscure that way. And it was papered over after Operation Paperclip seized all the scientists from uh, former Nazi Germany for us before for uh, good old U.S. of A. before uh, the Soviet Union could get their hands on them. Uh, we should have let the Soviets have a few more of them. I don't know about that. We we got we got ourselves an Einstein out of it. Um, pretty good. We got Einstein before that. We got Einstein before that. Because because of well Nazi Germany. Because he was Jewish. Yes. Um, but we got all, we got some there was a, I think there was a joke that most of the people in NASA at the time were former Nazis. Uh, and they were just had uh, Nazi salutes traded to them, so if you you if you yelled Heil Hitler, they just snapped to it. Um, but uh, he he had said that he had always wanted to make a rocket that could that he and he wanted to set it at the moon, and that he just missed and hit London um, because that's what the V two rocket was used for. So it's Very funny joke. yeah. So there's there's history there's history involved here, and these are these are those problems that make us kind of groan about history are still involved today. Is it right to pursue uh, science for kind of science sake for potential far future discovery? Uh, if you have tangible problems that you could be solving instead. Uh, uh, Miyazaki's last film, uh, The Wind Rises, is a pretty good example of that. Yeah. That was like actually a guy who was not killing Jewish people. Mm -hmm. He was just he was just forced, literally forced to design yeah. uh, military airplanes for Japan. Yeah, and there's a question of like if you just love aeronautics, what are what are you gonna do with your life? All right, so um, the uh, ha, um, our main character Hachi trains to be a good astronaut. Tadabe has faith in people that they will be able to get past the kind of problems that played hum humanity, and the von Braun will be able to take humanity to new frontiers of scientific discovery and that could yield benefits for humanity bringing us uh, into a kind of existence that we can't even conceive of now and the dismay is that the benefits that we that we uh, experience from scientific discovery are not equitably distributed a lot of the times uh, not everybody is going to get a get a smartphone some people uh, and maybe somebody doesn't want that if what they need is food um, Space terrorists are making a point about this by uh, attacking the haves uh, and the P and the operations in space because there's still poverty on Earth, and space debris is an environmental issue that is not really being adequately dealt with as we're already moving on to the next uh, thing that has caught our eye. All right, here's a show that both me and Cole have enjoyed quite thoroughly: The Virgin Witch Maria. Um. This is a show that takes place during the Hundred Years' War in France and uh, with England. Um, that's and we our main character is a witch, who's a virgin. Yeah, the the premise of the show is pretty in your face. About, yeah, uh, it, it, it's it's very misleading. <laughs> <laughs> The, the premise is like, well, she's a witch and she keeps stopping fights from happening, yeah. so. It's like if you if you lose your virginity, you're gonna lose your powers, and then it's like wacky hijinks. Nope. So what I was expecting from this show with that title, I went in with little information. I was expecting a cute magical girl and some pervy humor, um, which it definitely has, and then a lot of medieval otaku stuff. If you wanted to watch Plot of Test for the Space, you watch this for its medieval history. I've actually heard some, uh, some medieval otaku mention that this show is one of the most accurate portrayals of um, a medieval 
at, like any there's medieval period is a long period but really one of the most accurate portrayals of any part of the medieval period uh animated or live action because they spent a lot of time making sure all the arms and armaments were correct the um the tactics were correct um because they have a lot of battlefield scenes I even remember seeing an overhead shot of a of a um, of a battlefield in the show, and remembering, oh, I remember playing that map in Age of Empires. <laughs> uh, so it's got a lot of that stuff. But what I also got, I wasn't expecting, was there's a lot of theology in this show, an examination of the interaction of religion, society, and government in times of war. Um, it can be uh, there's a there's a uh, TV tropes entry for um, anime Catholicism <laughs> uh, because the Japanese have um, l little to no understanding of how Christianity actually works. I've seen a total of two shows that actually understand Christianity <laughs> from anime, and it w both are uh, medieval based shows. One is the Virgin Witch Maria, and the other is um, Vinland Saga. Um, and those kind of need to because uh, Christianity is kind of important to medieval Europe. <laughs> Just a little bit. So in this show, uh, Saint Michael the Archangel, uh, by confirmation saint, um, is a major character and kind of antagonist. <laughs> Uh, for the show, along with some other people. Uh, it has a lot of depictions of the Hundred Years' War at the time. It has an episode talking about how religion intersects with war and how it intersects with government and how it intersects with homosexuality and how it intersects with um, uh, like cultural interactions at the time. Um, it was just... It really... Uh, it really did a good due diligence, and at one point, I even remember uh, an antagonist character who's a bit of a crazed monk going on an explanation, uh, um, a manic explanation of why he thinks the Virgin Witch Maria is very important, um, and uh, in a religious context. And while he's a bit of a crazy man, and he arrives at a crazy situ uh, crazy conclusion. Uh, he quotes Thomas Aquinas, he quotes um, uh, various parts of catechism, and as a, as a person who's had a bit of uh, Catholic catechism, I kind of went through his arguments in my head, and I'm like, oh yeah, this checks out. He's actually going, he's rambling pretty quickly through it, but uh, you could make a reasonable argument to arrive at where he's arrived at. It's probably has a lot of holes because he arrives at a strange place, but he referenced the correct texts and in the right context. So I thought that was very interesting. Somebody had to really understand the religion to be able to do that more than just a surface uh, survey. And then he turns into a pillar of salt. <laughs> yeah. Don't mess with archangels. <laughs> so theology. Um, it talks about how, how uh, humans should even be relating to God. Um, the relation of love to ethics, and the re and most important for this, the relation of uh, the faithful of one religion to the faithful of another religion, um, because the Virgin Witch Maria is kind of associated with old pagan uh, mysticism and witchcraft, and even have a portrayal of a kind of s remaining semblance of an old pagan god. Um, but she's still interacting with the community around her, doing um, basic healing work um, and trying to help and trying to prevent um, all of the people who are engaged in war from trampling over the people nearby. It's it's her position is she just doesn't like war, and you can do it somewhere else, just not on my front stoop. Um, and they kind of eventually arrive at a good neighbor sort of policy, where. Uh, kind of one of their highest ideals is even if you have different faiths, you should you should be able to interact with each other like good neighbors. Um, and then there's the interaction of whether or not people have um, really even a 
true engagement with their own faith because human institutions are interacting with heavenly institutions and heavenly institutions are considered to be perfect uh in catholics have a concept of the the church in heaven versus the church on earth and the church in heaven is you know really good and important and the church on earth is made of people and people make mistakes <laughs> um so there's people who maybe have a strong inner faith and people who are maybe outwardly trying to look like they're faithful but really only care about the prestige that comes with being viewed as faithful in their community um so and how this interacts with the war machine war is also incredibly profitable um there's a there's a lot of mercenary there's a, a major mercenary character um in this show and he's in it entire he's an amoral bastard uh he's in it for the money and he will just kill people to get his daily bread. That's what he's here for. Um, but there's plenty of other people who, like uh, local lords, who are will also be profiting off uh, war by looting places. But on the face of it, they say, well, no, I'm doing this because of my religious obligation to fight the English infidel who's invading our Catholic lands. But they don't actually care about that. It's... Uh, it's a, a bit of a um, cover for the real uh, profit motive. So it's it's got a very complex look at all of these interacting human systems. Oh, this is uh this is a uh, one that interviews with monster girls. I'm getting some shouts from the crowd here. Um, uh, it's actually become. The comfort show of a num of one of my of one of my good friends. Um, it, it's it's a it's a real good and cute time. Ostensibly in this world, um, there are something called demi humans, which are monster girls. Almost everybody is human, but there's a few people who are, um, in this case, uh, I guess going from left to right. Uh, well. We have I can't people can't see me point. <laughs> well, you still said left to right. Yes. Uh, so we have the teacher in the in the gym suit at the at the top. She is technically a succubus. It doesn't get it doesn't get too blue here. It's still most it's it's way everything is way more cute than it is pervy. Like it's actually pretty clean of all that. So if that's a concern, don't worry. Um, or if that's what you're looking for, you won't get too much of it. Um, the girl in the kind of uh, turquoise hair is a Yuki Ona snow woman. The blonde girl is a vampire. And the girl who is holding her own head is a Dullahan or Headless Horseman. Um, so that one's fairly obvious. Uh, they are all uh, kind of known uh, kind of mythological stories. And they technically have some sort of powers from it. But they, they're not really powers. They don't really do anything. And we'll get to kind of how that's expressed here. Um, so what I was expecting from this show was a uh, show with cute girls and a slice of life comedy. And it definitely is that. Um, uh, the, the big burly guy from uh, earlier is the teacher who is just trying to interview monster girls to learn about their life experience. Because not many people have... People are still doing research into it, and he kind of wants to be in the research field. Um, and he's like, why not get uh, direct um, life experience about this from people who are monster girls? Uh, but what I also got here was a probe of minority experience. And there's a few different um, kind of models that you could put over top of this to understand what it what is going on here. It could be a probe of various types of minority experience, be it racial or gender. Uh, but most specifically, um, it is a probe of a dis dis disabled experience. Um, I have a uh, pretty thoroughly disabled friend. It has become one of her uh, favorite comfort shows because it's uh, it, she feels more seed in this show than at any other thing, and she relates pretty highly to it. And I had another friend who... I uh, used this as a subject, um, a subject of inquiry for a graduate class on the philosophy of disability. So um, I suppose if anybody ever wants to contact me, throw me, throw me a, a shout in chat, and I can always send you his uh, graduate paper with further academic reading on the subject. Um, 
But as I mentioned, the, uh, the, um, the girls don't really have powers so much as they have problems that come from their, uh, kind of demi-human biology. The vampire's essentially just a, uh, girl with anemia. Um, so you get, per uh, direct personal testimonials of each of the characters, um, and how it could translate to the experience of other minorities, and it affect and it examines how socialization uh, and uh, kind of other dynamics interact with the lives of these girls. Um, my friend actually was able to kind of uh, we did some further research and found um, kind of some models for understanding each of these girls. The g first uh, girl up is the vampire, and she essentially has anemia and. She has required support structures from her family and her school. She has a little bit of an oral fixation, so her sister allows her to chew on her arm. She doesn't really need to drink blood, but she does need, like, extra iron to keep her health up. And she has to be excused from uh, gym class, because if she is out in the sun, she will kind of wilt a bit. Um, so it requires that... Her family is able to help her through some of her problems um, and that the school is able to make accommodations for her. Um, the uh, Yuki Ona is afraid because the all of the myths about Yuki Ona end in them intentionally or accidentally freezing a life partner to death. <laughs> and she doesn't understand her power, so she's afraid that she's a danger. So... Um, She's uh, afraid if she it touches somebody, will she will she be will she accidentally harm them? Um, so the teacher helps her by like you know um, putting her in a bath of water, having her kind of engage with that, and all she can really do is make a few little ice chips um, appear in water if she is submerged in water. Um, but she's able to understand that she's not really a danger, and this could be a thing for people who don't who have. Um, who maybe are HIV positive and don't really understand what they, if they are a danger to people around them uh, or any other sort of thing where they feel kind of othered and they're not sure um, uh, uh, if it's even safe for them to interact well, with it's, people. It's commentary on negative stereotyping. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and some of the stereotypes around that. But now that she understands that she's more comfortable with herself and more comfortable uh, being close to other people. Um, and the girls help themselves through this uh, themselves. Like the the vampire girl is very hands on with the other girls. Um, the Dolahan, uh, this is one of the weirder ones. Uh, she uh, um, she has a wormhole in her neck, <laughs> and her kind of arc um, revolves around. She actually is pretty good at interacting with a lot of people in her class. Um, but they are always awkward and don't like to acknowledge that she's disabled. Like, they just kind of, if she mentions, like, even tries to make a joke about her own disability, they just kind of chuckle awkwardly and then try to change the subject. But this kind of engages with, um, excuse me, with the fact that the disability is a part of their life experience, not something that's separate from them. So at some point she's able to talk to them and be like, hey, you don't need to look askance at this. This is a part of my life. And sometimes I will need you to hold a door open for me because I have to hold my own head. Um, uh, she has like a head harness. There's there's some things. And eventually it's it's a little goofy, but like the the emotional relations are going to be very relatable for anybody who's ever been in that, uh, who's ever had a mobility disorder. Um, and eventually she goes on to wanting to study... Uh, well, like quantum physics and other things to understand the wormhole. <laughs> she wants to basically make her field of research in uh, in that area because she wants to learn more about it. And then the succubus is actually kind of a strange one. Um, uh, I was very confused about this one at first um, because the succubus has the most disruptive power of all. The others don't really affect anybody around them any sort of way. But the succubus actually has to take a lot of um, life measures to avoid affecting people. Men around her tend, uh, if she has ex any amount of kind of exposed skin, will kind of be affected by her pheromones or kind of 
supernatural power. Um, so she needs, uh, so she can only ride the, ride the train late at night. Um, when very few people are on the train, she has to be awake. She cannot fall asleep on the train because if she falls asleep, she will not be able to control her powers. And she has to live in a rural area where there's no houses in proximity to her. And I was really unsure what this was. I was unsure if that, like, you could make allegories to say, like, um, uh, maybe a Muslim experience in America after 9-11, if people are kind of viewing them suspiciously. Um, but through f further research with my friend, um, it may be just all very tied to uh, the female experience in Japan in that uh, women in general tend to be blamed for sexual crimes against them. Um, and uh, she has a state monitor because... Um, who's weirdly kind of a father figure to her and wants her life to be good, but he's technically assigned to make sure she doesn't do crimes because she's already criminalized, even though she has not done anything. Because theoretically somebody, supposedly there are stories of somebody u using their succubus powers to control politicians or get money out of rich people. So it, there's definitely a lot of reading you can do into the show. That's uh, the, the one point at which it falls flat is like, the succubus's problems, quote unquote, are never addressed. It's just she, she, as a woman, has to take these steps because men can't control themselves around her. Yes. But the problem with that is, is that the solution yeah. presented in the show is, well, she has to take all these measures. Yes. There's no, uh, mm -hmm. there's no yes. solution that like men have to learn how to behave yes. themselves. It's you have to do all these things. Yeah. And she actually thinks that the the main male protagonist is not affected by the, her powers. Simply because he has the self-control to, like, it takes a lot of effort from him, but, like, he's able to not be a perv because he's aware and he's just controlling himself. He has to breathe pretty heavily, but he's not being a creeper. Um, and uh, one of the kind of how this uh, interacts with the life experience of, uh, if you put it into the disabled model, is it can actually be really complicated for a disabled person to... Uh, find a life partner um, and love experience in their lives because um, uh, this was uh, further research I, I went into this um, uh, kind of across the globe especially in Japan but also here um, uh, people once they reach a certain age in life um, are usually expected to engage with their own sexuality at some point um, either when they reach their teenage years or older um, but uh, a lot of disabled people are taught that, like, no, anybody interested in you is more of a predator, and this is not a life experience that should be part of your life. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it may be engaging with that in that she, um, from the individual character's perspective, she was always unsure whether she could um, even date somebody and be sure that they liked her and not somebody else, or, or not just are affected by her powers, but she's confident that this male teacher has control of himself and she might this guy might actually be able to like her for her all right moving on we've got gotcha man crowds um uh gotcha man crowds uh is technically based off like a sentai show from the 70s i believe yeah it's just called yeah. gotcha man gotcha man um they do have weird sentai powers a like Zordon mystical man who gives them the powers through a notebook and they like oh the the techno soundtrack for this show <laughs> is so amazing and is so neon colored all the way through and it has a lot of cool fights and weird characters uh it was it was a really fun ride so what I was expecting was techno fueled sentai fights and the the fighting action is really good um yeah, it was just, it was a fun ride all the way through. Uh, but what's actually in this show um, is, I was not expecting it, this is actually a sci-fi where the future technology is just social media. Like, right. um, some, some of it already existed. So it's a superhero show where the power is to lead and influence, not the fact that they can fire lasers and whatnot. Um, there are two seasons to this show, and they both focus on a different sort of social, uh, uh, social media technology. The first one is invented by kind of an antagonist uh, sort of character, 
Uh, and it's kind of like Facebook. It's called Galax. It's kind of an all-encompassing social media thing. It's like a second life where you have an avatar and you can go in and you can also chat with other people. Um, but it also interacts with your day-to-day -day life because it allows you to cr um, crowdsource a lot of things. Um, like, uh, it starts having effects on the world. Like, if you wanted to organize a group to go pick up trash in your local park, you just start a group and people show up and they start doing that. Um, a... Um, you can put on your profile that you are CPR trained or first aid trained. And there's an example where like you see just a little scene where somebody like is having a heart attack in a public place. And like one person calls 911 to get an ambulance and one person, uh, types into Alex, I need first aid. Somebody's having a heart attack. And like a person who is just a block away gets a ping on their phone, runs up and is able to help before the ambulance is even able to get there. Because they're just crowdsourcing everything. Um, it allows them to do direct democracy. Um, if or anything comes up for referendum, it just shows up on your phone and you're just like, yes, no. <laughs> Voting on things very quickly. Um, like, it kind of changes the way everybody is interacting with each other. Um, but uh, it prognosticates a lot of the problems we're having now. Um, people are very online. And since... There's a lot more engagement with uh, politics and with the with their communities around them. Uh, a lot of factionalism <laughs> arises as people start to kind of create different identities, and it starts to be an uncontrolled mess where they are summoning weird avatars from the space and causing city destruction. And our superheroes can't even fight these things enough. Um, your antagonist is mostly just a person who's, I guess... Russian social media users. They're just kind of... It's an alien who is trying to cause chaos in society by, like, instigating situations. Um, so, you know, the KGB. Um, uh, and the power that they... The superheroes have to fight them is not so much a direct like fighting power but it's too well we're very visible so we will use our power to kind of actually be louder voices and be visible and actually have a leadership influence on these factions and communities around us to kind of mediate and help us all work together to um come to a more consensus based uh solution to the problems that are facing us well bird cats is like not necessarily just in it to cause chaos. Mm -hmm. Burkatz is trying to cause a societal breakdown at the lowest possible level because it would be very easy for mm -hmm. Burkatz to impersonate, which yeah. they have the power to do, a, a official and just cause chaos from the top down. But Burkatz is very, very explicit in the fact that they want to cause a complete breakdown of society mm -hmm. from the ground up to prove that it is possible. And it is mm -hmm. shown in the show several times that the heroes have no physical way of fighting bird cats because bird cats is so much more powerful yeah than the uh, heroes so that is yeah. not a viable solution evil alien with evil alien plans um also with Sentai, though. yeah um and then the second season ooh, this one was pretty pretty interesting another alien shows up um and this one is uh, is like you know a benign alien they are offering a, a kind of their own um uh their own power that they are only offering if you consent to want to have it. And this power is pretty simple. They will make an emoji be permanently floating above your head that accurately represents your current emotional state. And you're like, what, what, is, what, is, this, what is the purpose of this? What is this effect? And it allows you to essentially credibly commit that what you are saying about your emotional state or your feelings is actually what's going on. And they'll only offer it if you want it. Like, they're not going to force it on anybody. So people come up and they take it. It has a lot of interesting things. Like, some people are like, oh, we were unsure about our relationship. Uh, like, two people in love were unsure about their relationship. And they're like, oh, yeah, well, they get the, the emoji. And they're like, oh, do you really love me? And they both kind of have hearts appear above their head, like a, like a happy face. And they're like, oh, it really is true. And they're, they feel more solid in their relationship than another couple does it. And they're like, oh, do you really love me? And the other, the emoji is like, he's like, yeah, I do really love you. And the emoji does not concur. 
Um, yeah. So it has an interesting kind of, it has interesting thoughts about um, what should and shouldn't be private for a person. Like, there are things that you want to try and get across to somebody if you're trying to communicate with people um, to really have an in-depth relationship, but it may or may not be something you want to commit to having all the time because you may want, you may not want to let everybody know what's going on in your brain at all points. Uh, so it's just interesting to think about. Like, it it doesn't even give you a hard yes-no on how these things are going to, whether these things are good or bad. It mostly says that technology is, uh, communications technology is one of the most powerful things that we have, and we have to engage with it responsibly. Uh, there's also the fact that Hajime is, like, uh, essentially the ubermensch like the, the perfect oh, i love hajime as a character too yeah, it's it's interesting because they made her a very good character but like also like a uh, superman level moral character yeah like she is the platonic ideal of what a good person is which is the show like i think the show is like communicating that it is it's not possible to actually be like hajime yeah because hajime always knows what the right answer is even in season two mm -hmm. where she is very much detached from the situation mm -hmm. she still knows that when the alien comes down she's like i i don't think this is a good idea but she doesn't do anything to influence yeah it. she's not like a mastermind or anything either she's kind of like an archetypal like good fool because she seems very strange, like she's a, like a flippant, uh, airheaded sort of girl. Um, and people are like, oh, you're not taking, a lot of the other characters are like, you're not taking this seriously enough. Like, we are fighting to preserve Earth, and there's a lot of danger that could happen. And she's kind of flippantly moving towards this stuff. Um, but it turns out, like, one of the first things is like, oh, you think it might be a monster of the week thing where you fight an alien monster every week. And the first one she comes across is like, oh, this is not actually trying to fight us. It's just lost. <laughs> so she's able to calm it down. Uh, and instead of, like, Sentai fighting it, they're just like, oh, it's just like a pet now. And she, she also, I mean, she, in the season one, she is the main conflict with Burke Katz, where it's like mm -hmm. the ultimate good versus the, I guess, the ultimate evil uh, in mm -hmm. trying to break down society. But she's, mm -hmm. like, having that moral battle with Burke Katz. All right, so I may have to move a little faster through some of these. So they crowdsourced government. They had some tribalism. Oh, boy. Oh boy. <laughs> I'm, I feel like most people are going to be familiar with melancholy of cerusism at this point, but a lot of times there are young people in the audience, and oh, young people. This is a, this is a little pet past uh, some people's day at this point, so um, I would highly recommend that people go see it. I watched this in um, uh, back when there wasn't, there was no really, there wasn't like a Crunchyroll or Funimation. I was just on some pirated internet site and I had just got it into like my high school anime club and was trying to find anime. And I had no idea what anything was. There was this huge list of anime in front of me. And uh, I remember distinctly picking this show because it had the word melancholy in it. I'm like, that's a big word. <laughs> Let's see what this is about. And I started with episode zero, the the uh, school project that they do. So I had no idea what was going on. But I knew I had to watch more of this show. Uh, so when I got in, I had no idea what to expect. And if you haven't seen it, you've probably seen the dance. Uh... That is yeah. that it was in every con for decades. Mm -hmm. yep. But there's a depth to this show. What I also got out of the show was a focus on the human being as a limited being in time uh, and space and power. Like, it goes back to, like, Cartesian philosophy here. <laughs> like, they start with, like, cogito, like, base problems here. Where a lot of it is uh, kind of illuminated through conversations of our straight man, Kion, and Itsuki, the, the pretty boy, Esper. Um, where technically in this show you have a girl, Harui Suzumiya, who's God, who has summoned uh, Esper's time travelers and aliens to her that she has probably created herself, but is unaware of this because she's unaware of her own powers. And Kion is trying to manage, uh, manage this in the background. Um... 
So basically, every week they get into some sort of mystery-based adventure. They have to they have to solve, and after they do that, there's often no evidence that this happened at all, and they kind of have a conundrum on their head where did that happen at all? There's no way to prove this. You don't have a photograph. You don't have anything to kind of make that clear. In fact, the climax of this show, they solve a problem where the world, by, the universe might have been destroyed if, if Haruhi got too upset. And at the end, Kyo and Anitsuki have a conversation at the lunch table. And Kyo's like, oh, it's real good uh, that we so, uh, saved the universe from being destroyed and we get to still be here. And Anitsuki's like, yeah, it's real good. Unless we failed and the universe was destroyed and recreated and we're completely different people who wouldn't know that we're not <laughs> the same people uh, as a previous iteration of the universe and are just going to live our lives on uh, without ever knowing that. Yeah, it's really good that Haruhi... Anyway, lunch is done. Bye now. <laughs> it's really good that Haruhi never did a time loop like that. So. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like right, like right. episodes in a row or anything. Yeah. Wild. So epistemology is the uh, field of... Uh, of philosophy that this goes into how do you know what you know and it just kind of probes that continuously and it's very fun and interesting oh the last my last one here this is not i'm not trolling guys neo yokio the jaden smith anime and i'm counting it as an anime <laughs> that it is available on netflix as well as pink christmas um this is a show about a Jaden Smith anime analog being a rich turd in not quite New York. In anime New York. Uh, what I expected, all I knew was the memes. You don't deserve this big Toblerone. Uh, this show is actually deeper than I was expecting. Uh, this is also a pretty scathing review of the culture of the wealthy and capitalism as a system. <laughs> Um, and it uses some, is, if you are were like, I don't know if I want to watch an anime with Jaden Smith as the protagonist. Uh, well, this show spends its entire runtime making fun of the protagonist. <laughs> he's the object of ire for pretty much everybody in the show. Premise wise, he's technically like a demon exorcism guy. Um... And they spent, like, an episode on that, but it's mostly just hijinks. Like them going to a tiger bar, where the gimmick is that they have a tiger in the bar. And somebody's like, this was a terrible idea. <laughs> and then they take a drink called the, uh, like, ca the Caprese Tini or something. <laughs> uh, that they're just branding and marketing to, to become, like, influencers. Um, but there's, like... A <laughs> This girl's just telling him, like, I wish you weren't the lapdog of the bourgeoisie. <laughs> and then, like, there's a Ronda one half, like, gender swap thing where there's a magical pool because there's magic. Mm. Um, and one of the characters falls in into the pool and he's like, first of all, gender is a spectrum, not a binary, because Jane Smith is asking like an asshole. That's not the character's actual <laughs> name, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it is. Mm -hmm. um, there's... It's very weird because it's kind of like watching like a uh, rich and famous like a uh, teen drama like OC or something where they're just kind of doing a bunch of silly silly shit. But at one point at the end of the sh uh, at the end of the show, the silly thing they're doing this time is having a Formula One race against the USSR, which is exists for some reason um, uh, through the city and. They go into the Forbidden City, the walled city of, of, of Neo Yokio. This is the only time you see poor people. There's apparently a walled slum <laughs> where all of the poor people are there. And they're throwing garbage and stuff at the car. They make a wrong turn and they turn around. And people like this little sound bites like people yelling like, we're dying here. And then they zoom right out and you never see it again. Um, because that is the awareness rich people have of, <laughs> of the lower classes. You never see it. You're separated from it. Uh, the voice talent in this show is insane. Like, they have... Uh, can you name some of the no, people? There's Jude Law. There's Susan Sarandon. There's Stephen Fry. Wow. Um, all doing the most ridiculous... Steve Buscemi. Uh, Not voice actors, just famous people. Just yeah, 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 famous yeah, yeah. actors. Yeah. Um... 
Jaden Smith if you want to get out of doing doing things like Steve Buscemi is the remembrancer he's constantly vaping um uh yeah just just ridiculous things oh yeah Jude Law is his uh robot butler mecha butler uh and it, another way this turns out is at one point um they get stranded somewhere because Jaden Smith has been so um uh unaware of his um, Jude Law's, uh, the, the Mecca Butler's needs, where he, throughout the episode, he keeps asking, Sir, may I plug in? In his British voice, I need to, I need to charge myself. Mm. And he says that multiple times throughout the episode, at the end, they get stranded somewhere because um, he runs out of juice. Mm. Uh, and because Jane Smith has just been not treating him like a person. At this point, you find out that the Mecca Butler opens out and there's a tiny British woman inside who's been it is, you're like, why isn't he a robot butler? No, it is a mecha butler because there's a pilot. <laughs> there was somebody who was also working inside there that you just weren't aware of. Uh, yeah, the show is, and there's a billion memes. It's great. Um, yeah, and then the also the rich are distracted from the in, interclass issues because they're fo forced to fight amongst themselves on the big board of eligible bat bachelors where Jaden Smith can't be bothered to think about anything else because he's got to get the next uh, hot branded item to compete with Archangelo who's at the top of the uh, leaderboard for most eligible bachelors. So they're just, this society develops mechanisms for distracting them from anything else that they could be doing with their time. So that's it, guys. Uh... Uh, anybody in chat, feel free to throw in shows yeah. that you think match this model of shows that were just advertising a fun, good time, but ended up making you think deeply about something and maybe even going to research something in a Wikipedia hole. Eurocamp. Eurocamp. What was your thought there? On the first flush, it is just entirely loving, beautiful, mm -hmm. serene. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot of the interpersonal interaction between the girls mm -hmm. and what's going on. Mm -hmm. Rin and her grandfather, the influences mm -hmm. that lead them to the path where they're, they're now out camping, going and getting a job to fuel their passion. Mm -hmm. You know, going mm -hmm. to the school club that's part of their passion. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's just, it's neat to watch it, to let it wash over you and yeah. enjoy it, and then start thinking about it. Boy, I know that show, like, it was popular to begin with, but I know it had a big takeoff uh, yeah. once pandemic hit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because... Every, everybody in Japan bought some uh, camping gear and started hitting up the uh, the camping spots they exp they had in the show. Yep. And those camping spots are one to one. Yeah. 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 I yeah. started looking them up, and it's like some of the scenes where the girls are sitting on the lakeside, you see Fuji mm -hmm. in the background. It's the yeah. actual campground. They took photographs. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. No. It's it's been interesting. Uh, like anime has a way of pleasantly surprising you. Mm -hmm. Uh. I, I, run, I run a thing called the Wheel of Crap at the beginning of every season where I just watch the first episode of every anime airing that season with a group of friends. And there's a lot of goofy things in there, but sometimes there's something that you just see like, wow, this was a little gem that I wasn't expecting to be so good. Like the Heike story? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of stuff. I think a lot of pre, uh, most recently, I think it was like On Taxi. Yeah. On Taxi is just oh, a no. On Taxi is just like a... Yeah. On Taxi is basically Pulp Fiction. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Still working my way through it. Mm. Oh. Once that I had was, was an old tiny one. <laughs> Didn't say long time. Okay, great. Right. <laughs> you want to walk around? Yeah. <laughs> you uh, you do done? Tank yeah. Yeah. Oh, do we need to yeah, yeah. uh, do we need to hit time here? Um, we can keep talking. We can okay. Talk. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Okay. We, uh, so, next panel starts in twenty minutes, so we're gonna just keep driving for a while. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Uh, so Dominion Tank Police. Uh, oh. Late 80s. Heard about that? Uh, Is that? That has the blow up penises in it, doesn't that's it? The one. That's yeah, the one. That's the uh, one. Yep. Which I said to I actually cut that clip out and made it AMV. Seventies music. Somebody suggested cross energy. <laughs> I'm not familiar with that. Was that's that about, guys? controversial. Yeah. yeah. I thought that was a very interesting show. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So the Dominion Tank <laughs> Police, it starts off just very just like that, inflatable penises. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that's the kind of you know, one of the gags yeah. of the show. But then, as it's going through, and it's just like really smash them up, yeah. and just all this action, and, and just 
funny, funny things going on. I mean, okay. tanks inside of Tokyo, so that's all you yeah. <laughs> I, I remember yeah. being like, this is definitely a parody. Like, it's a parody of 80s action yeah, movies where, like, right. these police are oh, irresponsibly <laughs> reckless. They are. And then, and then and the villain is the one who comes up, and, and he's over the top as well, yeah. Mato, and, and, and he's, he's going through his thing. And then suddenly, in the next to last episode, it's like, oh, I've got this painting because this is who I am. Yeah. And it all talks about, about yeah. what, what is important. It's not just important yeah. to find about uh, you know what's going on in this, in this crazy society that's going on that allows tanks to just roll down the street. So what, what year was that made, if you roughly? 1988, 89. So that was well before America started selling surplus military gear to its police. <laughs> well, the guy who made that is also, um, uh, what's his name, Ghost in the Shell. Ghost yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. And um, actually, that's the Right, it definitely had that hard sci-fi aspect yeah. where it's like, these tanks will be very specifically accurate. Also, apparently, um, I have heard mm -hmm. Dominion Tank Police was the first major um, anime work to feature the idea that... Um, Essentially, Earth's biosphere is done. Oh, you know, you know, really? And, and that, that idea, and it's kind of popularized in Japan, this idea in science fiction of what if we're not going to solve all these problems, what would that, that future mm -hmm. look like? So, yeah, it's kind of interesting. Wow. Um, one of the ones from me would be uh, Nia Under Seven. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Never, I, I'm unfamiliar <laughs> yeah. with this. Abe, Yoshitoshi Abe. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so basically, once the folks behind Lane mm -hmm. finished Lane, um, at, this was before Technolab, I think. I think it was after Lane. Mm -hmm. um, they made Nia kind of as a mental break from Lane. After yeah. that Lane, they were like, yeah. we need something fun now. Because you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lane is very much in that first category, like Ghost yeah, the Shell. Exactly. And it's, this yeah. is a cerebral... Yeah. Like, and prepare Nia, yourself and, to watch. And Nia is not that. Um, um, broke college student who has an alien take up residence in her closet. Basically. Ooh. Yeah, and just, who's of course a cute girl. Yeah. Um, all, both cute girls. Um, but it is basically ridiculous Scooby comedy mm -hmm. for like 10 episodes. And then suddenly it starts like executing on some of the social things that they've implied about society with aliens being mm. around the idea that this uh, so not to be really a spoiler right. but the um uh nia this girl who shows up she kind of comes and goes and comes and goes mm -hmm. and she's very annoying and so forth and then at one point she just stops showing up again mm. and it's like oh is this what i want mm -hmm. like this is this, I, I keep telling her how annoying she is yeah, yeah. she's gone you know and so it, it deals with that yeah. kind of stuff where it's like oh nice we actually have something I think, I think, I'm trying to think of other examples, like Maid Dragon, like, almost, oh, crossed, almost, I, the I almost put Maid almost. Dragon in here. It doesn't quite, yeah, because there's too much nonsense. <laughs> Maid Dragon has plenty of nonsense, but it, every episode, especially the, the most recent season, very specifically is focused on the concept of family, mm -hmm. and how you relate to family, how you build family, and also how you recover from trauma. Mm -hmm. Like, those two things are in every episode. So I had considered putting that in there, but I wasn't sure. Be One of the things that I'm trying to do with this panel is make it very specifically things that l that yeah. don't look like they're going to be about that. In May Dragon, you pretty much know it's going to be a slice of life about found family. Not a short stack dragon yeah. shows up. I mean, I guess I could include it in that you. W I was not expecting it to engage with uh, trauma in the way mm. it does because it is like, through and through about how these characters are getting over things that have happened to them that you don't even see directly, because mm -hmm. it's mostly slice-of-life stuff that's happen, happening. But you will just see it, like, from a, li a little askance uh, here and there, and they'll deal with it a little bit every once in a while in the, the more recent season. Like, f only at the end of the, of the second season did you even really find out what happened with uh, with your main character, oh, wow. mm -hmm. which was that she fought God. <laughs> well, a God. I'm sorry, not God, a God. I figured out the other one. The pet girl of Sakurazo. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because that looks like it is a goofy, etchy comedy. Mm -hmm. Mental health, right? Or so, is it mental health issues, or is it... Uh, um, a little bit. Sort of, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it, it's um, a bit of a social disability. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, um, that's in, but the, the bigger thing I got out of it is... So, 
um, the creative life, for lack of a better word. About, mm. It's basically about you know the wacky dorm, yeah. you know, in, in a college, actual college, not high school. Yeah. Um, and um, the fact that they're all actually like pursuing their dreams, mm. and how like that's not easy. It's not like it's yeah. nice, but like they're they have to really work their butts off, and it doesn't always work. Currently always airing work. is Blue Period, which you may want to oh, take okay. a look yeah, at. Yeah. And, like, it's a sober look at mm -hmm. uh, becoming an artist. Like, one of the first things is, like, it's very hard to make a living. Yeah. Two, it's very expensive if you go to a private school. Apparently, in Japan, said, like, there's a, like, no, there is an option. like, one, because uh, your main character is kind of uh, on the poorer side and mm -hmm. didn't think art was for them. Yeah. Um, but they're, like, Japan does have some public art schools, which yeah. cost, they said, 50,000 yen, um, uh, or maybe it's 500, but it was uh, like comparable yeah. to regular college, yeah. which isn't very cheap to begin with, but <laughs> comparable to regular college is supposed to significantly more expensive. Mm -hmm. It's like the public art school. Um, and that, that is a path he could take, but it's a long shot. Yep. And he just kind of meets all these people trying to go through the process of learning art in kind of night classes and mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, you think Peter Mario sketch works? <laughs> I don't. Oh, that's a good question. I didn't get very yeah. far into Mario sketch. In, in fairness, I, I Peter Mario is like the one show where like cute girls doing cute things is like mm. extreme. Like they do it the quote unquote correct way. Hmm. Like there is character development. And there is like it is very slow paced. Oh, but it is. What was th there was one which is a bunch of cute girls doing manga. Um, like a, a year or two ago. It was kind of girls. Like that might be the one. Yeah, that was the one with the pink hair girl who was like a, a disaster. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah she. The one. That, I, I don't. I don't get that feeling from it so much. Like Peter yeah. Mario is very like structured and like mm, sure. respectable, and like Comic Girls is like very fan service heavy. Mm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. How about Kagushi Yoda? Hmm. The one where it's a it's a manga ka and his wife has passed away and he's trying to oh, raise his daughter. Mm, yeah. 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 Trying not to let her know that yeah. he's a manga god, doing everything <laughs> right, to right. raise her, and her development and how the show goes to the very end, mm -hmm. and it's very impactful as it reaches its conclusion. Cool. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons these shows are arguably more effective than like my kind of pretentious anime <laughs> is because they're not beating you over the head with something. Yeah. Yeah. They're introducing you to characters, getting you to fall in love with these characters, and then introducing things through the kind of lens of these characters. Yep, exactly. Uh, rather than having, like, people as allegory. <laughs> as opposed to contrast to uh, some of the works of Makoto Shinkai. Right, yeah. Absolutely. Um, uh, you get much more realized characters and see how things kind of affect them at the ground level rather than at a more abstract yeah. philosophical yeah. level. Agreed. Cool. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think we'll go ahead and take yeah. That's it for me, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Yep. Uh, absolutely. Um, I think we have a video next. Um, let me go ahead and switch over to a little bit more of uh, some Kira video, and we'll be back in a little bit.
Hi there, my name is Steve Gearhart. Uh, this is my panel for OnCon 6. Yes, OnCon 6. My panel is the Shinobi Scroll, the short history of, J of ninjas in Japan. Uh, before we get to that, so let me tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, again, my name is Steve Gearhart. I run a channel on YouTube called the Unagi Observer, where I talk a little bit about fandoms, various fandoms. You know, it can be gaming, it can be science fiction, movies, a little thing called anime. You have to talk a little bit about that. Actually, I talk a lot about that. Um, also, I do the Weekly Dig with uh, Brent and John over at Anime Archaeology Channel. So please check us out there every Saturday night uh, about 8 o'clock where we talk about anime stuff. So uh, it's always a fun time. we got the chat going, so please drop on by. A uh, couple things before we start the panel, and that is, uh, first of all, no videos in this. In other words, we're not going to see videos from anime simply because of licensing issue and we don't want to shut down on con because I threw up a video here. So, sorry, no videos. Uh, the second thing is, is that you might hear some ambient noise coming in. I'm doing this pre-recorded. I do live in the city. It's called Baltimore. Um, things do go on around me. We just about 15 minutes ago had a guy who had a heart attack, so we might still hear some sirens from time to time. If you do, it's okay. Um, nobody's after me. Anyway, so let's uh, go ahead and start the panel. Um, Shinobi Scroll, the, the short history of ninjas in Japan. When we hear the word ninja, we think of Japan. And not only do we think of Japan, we think of a mysterious person decked out in black garb moving around silently, moving through and hiding in the shadows, maybe hanging from the ceiling, slowly slipping out a blade, slitting somebody's throat, maybe disemboweling them messily, you know, because you know, that's sometimes what ninjas do, right? And that's what we see. That's, that, that's what we think of when we hear the word ninja. It's, it's in our pop culture. It's in our books. It's in our comics. It's in our, in our movies. It's in anime, the whole nine yards. When you think of ninja, we know exactly what that word means, or we think we do. Um, and it has permeated pop culture. I mean, it's everywhere, right? From comedies to action movies to really kind of bad action movies, like, like the following. Revenge of the Ninja, Ninja 3, The Domination, Shogun Assassin, Ninja Hunt, and, um, you know, Cheerleader Ninjas. Now, in anime, they fare a little bit better. They, they look a little bit better. Still, we got the, you know, over-the-top gore action kind of thing going on. You know, there's always a lot of blood splashing and things like that. And, you know, we have some uh, some anime like, like the following. Ninja Resurrection. Blood Rain, Curse of the Yoma. Ninja Nonsense. This is a personal favorite of mine. The famous Ninja Scroll. And, of course, Naruto. I mean, you know, he's got to make the list, right? So this is what kind of what we think of when we talk about ninja, when the word ninja comes to our minds. Now, this is what I want to talk about, because the term ninja, when you were talking about Japanese kind of people doing these things, that's really not the right term. So let's talk about that. <laughs> Okay, so it's very interesting how we just kind of looked at a whole bunch of martial arts movies, a whole bunch of anime, and I know we can find some cartoon and comic books out there that talk about ninja, you know, like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and we look at the word ninja and we go, Japan. Well, that's not really correct, okay? Ninja is a kanji word it's a word from come that comes from kanji um some of the japanese language is related to the kanji symbols and the symbols for ninja is nin and sha nin sha now over time it developed into ninja so there you go so that's the first difference uh this is a chinese word it's not really a japanese word 
So what does it mean for the Chinese to be a ninja? What, what, what does that mean? Well, it's actually what we think of as a ninja. So we think of people who move around in secret. As a matter of fact, ninja is roughly translated as one who endures. Someone who endures having to work within the darkness, of taking on different um, identities, of having to do physically hard things. Like, for example, being able to hang from a ledge so you can hear what's going on through a window for an extended period of time. Yes, that is an actual technique that was taught. Um, so, you know, one who endures. And the other thing is that ninjas in China have been operating since around the 6th century. And they, like I said, they have these techniques. They are in constant development of new techniques. They're in constant new martial arts development, um, weaponry development, spycraft development. So you have these organizations um, and schools that teach these things. And you have Chinese warrior monks who are usually the teachers of, of, and heads of these organizations who impart this knowledge out and you know they, they are the warrior monks that, that we see in the movies that show the, the newbie how to do things and that's more or less how it worked but the ninja in china had a lot of ability to be able to practice what they're taught because at the time china was a very big place and even if it was unified loosely there was still a lot going on inside internally there was always a rebellion there's always some lord trying to kill another lord uh someone who wants to be emperor you know you get the idea so all these different schools and all these lords and all these different organizations are working and using these skills that are being taught and it is a great way for these people to say i'm going to hire you to spy on this guy over here because I need to know what his army looks like and maybe if we get a chance, you know, right, kill the guy. So they're doing this already in China. The ninja are already operating in, in China before they operate in Japan. So what's going on in Japan about this time? Well, the word in Japan, of course, is not ninja. It is, we all know it now, shinobi. Now, shinobi is not the same connotation as ninja. Ninja can talk about organizations or a specific person with that set of skills. Shinobi is really just that person with that set of skills. Now, the set of skills in question are not taught to these people in schools because there are no schools to this effect. It really is just maybe an individual happens to have this skill set of being able to infiltrate a place gather intelligence and then take that intelligence and give it to a person who needs it um, and maybe in the off chance of having to find the ability or the time or the chance or opportunity to actually kill somebody and these people were called shinobi there were no schools for shinobi nobody you know no there were no the warrior monks of japan the yamabuchi did not teach uh shinobi how to do things uh, the shinobis figured it out for themselves and they transmitted that knowledge down to heirs or to their own sons and or daughters um you know there are tales in japan of shinobi being able to make themselves look like women uh, infiltrate courts maybe kill a general or two things like that whereas in china these are entire organizations that work together groups of people working together with specific um abilities and techniques and each one has their own ranking within that organization in japan it's a freelancer a shinobi is simply a freelancer they don't belong to an organization they don't belong to any one person they hire themselves out that's really all it is so how did that change how did the shinobi become more like the ninja how did the ninja translate their knowledge of what they do and turn the shinobi into what we know the shinobi today as we see in the anime as uh, spycraft and killers and such. How did this happen? Where did this happen? And um, who did it? So how did this transfer of information happen from the ninjas in China to the shinobi in Japan? How did the shinobi eventually become more like the ninjas of China through this, this uh, information dump? Well, for starters, there's always been trade. Trade through Korea, through China, with Japan, all of them acting uh, with each other. And kind of uh, 
you know, there's some information, some philosophies, techniques, sometimes technology goes through trade. And the shinobi <clears throat> kind of learn those kinds of things every now and again through trade. So there's always been a little bit of an information trade going on. And that's kind of how shinobis generally got by. It wasn't until the fall of the Tang Dynasty in China that you had this a huge information dump going from China to Japan over a span of about 100 years to about 1020 AD, from 907 AD to 1020 AD. And that is the time period of time that the shinobi in Japan realized, oh, we can do these things as well. Okay, so how did that happen? Why did the Tang Dynasty give up all this information? Well, it had to do with the fact that they fell, that they lost power. And the reason why they lost power is because they did a number of things and didn't pay attention to a number of things. One of those things that they did is they broke with traditions in in um, in terms of the eunuchs. Eunuchs are, of course, men who have certain various skills, uh, either mental or physical. And they the idea is that if you get rid of their sexual organ, organs, then they will be passive enough and follow your orders. So, and eunuchs were considered basically kind of a higher end level slave. Um, you know, you didn't really have rights, you just were an advisor and you got to enjoy some more freedoms and a better living condition than most normal slaves that, that, that might exist. So the eunuch, the Tang Dynasty, what they did is they said, well, we're actually going to get rid of the slavery part, per, kind of. We're going to give you a lot more freedom. We're going to give you actually money. We're going to give you status. You actually are going to have status. You're not just going to be an advisor to us. You will be actually be able to make decisions and execute those decisions. So the eunuchs actually became a political power. And as such, they kind of turned around and said, in exchange for cutting off my genitals, I'm going to input people that I like better than you. And at some point, those people are going to make your life miserable. And so that's kind of what they started doing. Uh, another part of this had to do with the Fenshao, um district, or I'm sorry, not district, but uh, province, which is a very large agricultural province of the time that kind of fed the empire, the Chinese empire. And the thing of it was is that they were pretty remote enough that they had their own royal, uh, imperial, and military governors. And they kind of just sat there and said, you know, we're going to, make it tough for the imperial court and we're going to insist that they pay us more money that we're going to insist that they do things for us or else we're going to withhold the grain and over time there have been several rebellions or you know minor rebellions that the tang dynasty had to keep putting down uh, but they were remote enough that the tang dynasty couldn't actually sit an army there and keep watch so you had that problem speaking of rebellions there was always a rebellion going on in the Tang Dynasty, it seems like. It's like every other year, someone just got, I, I'm, I hate you, and they go to war with the Imperial Court. So over time, the Tang Dynasty just didn't have a cohesive army or enough people to feed into the army to fight all these rebellions, which created a situation where military governors in each province got more individual independent powers to keep track of what was going on. So it turns into a more of a feudal vassal system, which of course made the military governors and you know royal governors go, hmm, maybe I can make my own kingdom and break away. So you have even more rebellions. And then, so finally, after a while, the Tang Dynasty, you know, they're fighting all these people, they're fighting all these armies, they're fighting also bandit armies, like huge armies of just simply bandits and one of them was controlled by a guy named Xu Wen and Xu Wen was eventually captured by the Tangs and he said fine look in the exchange of not killing me let me help you in this particular area of the empire and wipe out all the bandit armies as a result this guy became a general after a while he got some political appointee appointments and after a while after that, he became a military governor, at which point he amassed a huge army because he was pretty popular with the people. Because he kind of said, look, we're all miserable. We hate what's going on. The Tang Dynasty isn't doing anything for you. 
let me help you out. I'm a four assault smuggler. I, I, I know what you need. Come on, let's make me emperor. So he overthrows the emperor, uh, the Tang emperor of China. And within a year, under house arrest, goes, oh, here, have some tea. Poisoned, kills the old emperor and he becomes an emperor he lasts about three years before everyone figures out oh he's in it for himself they kill him and things kind of get weird after that so but in that three-year period the tang generals and a lot of the other generals within china kind of were looking at each other just going a lot of things are going about to go bad for us so one by one some of these tang generals advisors, monks, you know, various people that were associated with the Tang Dynasty, Imperial Court, the Royal Court. They were looking at the civilians who were also part of the government, and the civilians were going, mm, I, we think you need to die. So periodically, a, one of these people would be brought out to the square and get their head chopped off. So over the next hundred years, Tang generals started going, we need to be somewhere else. And as they're fighting and losing battles sometimes, they go, you know what? Japan is looking pretty good right about now. Maybe maybe I can be an advisor over Japan. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't be here anymore. So as society over a span of 100 years is chasing down the remnants of the Tang Dynasty, whether it be heirs or heirs to generals and, and, and that nature, they all get up and they eventually leave and go to Japan. As they go to Japan, they take knowledge and sometimes technology with them. So they show up on the shores of Japan, they go to the local lords and they say, hey, I used to be a general in the Tang Dynasty, or I was an advisor, I was an economic advisor, I'm a foreign advisor, I'm agricultural, I know this, that, and the other thing. Hire me and I'll work for you. And, you know, I'll give you my knowledge, which the Japanese readily took. The, um, you have to understand at this point in time, the Japanese thought very, very highly of the Chinese. Um, when you talk about Japanese education at the time, it is almost filled entirely with text from from China, whether it be stories, whether it be talking about alchemy, whether it be talking about various sciences, um, anything that you could get their hands on. Um, if you were a nobleman in Japan, it would not be unusual for you to be able to speak some dialect or read some dialect or write in a dialect of China so that you can read and write Chinese poems. That, that was kind of, you were at the height of intelligentsia if you were able to do that. So that was a status thing. So yes, they said, yes, please come over, please teach us what you have what you have to offer. And so you have these guys coming in and along with them, they bring their staff. Usually they also bring in a Chinese monk, a Buddhist monk, a Zen Buddhist monk, a Taoist, somebody who might know how to fight. Some of these guys were warrior monks, and some of these guys had the knowledge of the ninja. So they understood the techniques and these kinds of things. As they come in, as they're being hired, these warrior monks would also, as they're spreading the word of Buddhism within Japan, which is mostly a Shinto nation at this point, Buddhism is starting to take root. And so these monks are coming in as they're showing Japan more and more about Buddhism, more than what they already know at this point. They're also saying, oh, and by the way, let me teach you these other things. So then the shinobi go, oh, oh, look at these guys. Oh, that's kind of cool. Um, let's learn from them. The schools haven't started yet. There's no school ninja schools. There's no ninja organizations. There's still none of that. But the shinobi are starting to learn the techniques of um, the Chinese ninja. Not only that, but the warrior monks of Japan, the Yamabuchi, are now also starting to learn this and starting to impart that knowledge as well. And this is very, very important for what happens later on. <laughs> Thank you.
So at this point, I want to stop and, and make an important distinction between Chinese ninjas and Japanese shinobi. Now, before this point, I, I was kind of talking about how the shinobi were, were not really organized. They were just individual freelancers, more or less. And the Chinese ninja were more organized into schools and organizations and work for, uh, in politics and that kind of thing. The, the biggest... The other big difference between the two, between the ninja and the shinobi, was that the ninjas had technology, had, had a more concise technology for what they were doing. They had uh, a better skill set for what they were doing. In other words, the, the shinobi, because it was just kind of passed down from generation to generation to an heir or a direct family member, um, the ninjas had actual text, manuscripts. Here's how you do this. Here's how you learn how to do this. This is how you teach someone how to do this. So the ninja really did have a step up in terms of um, training, in terms of uh, learning curve. Um, you know, they're always trying to improve. Their spy craft was far better. Um, weaponry, um, and of course the use of gunpowder. So... All these things were something that the ninja worked on. They were constantly trying to find new ways to use these implements, these tools. Uh, how do you better smuggle information in and out of a place? How do you better disguise yourself? How do you sneak around better? How do you train your body to be in difficult places? Like, you know, sometimes when you have to hide somewhere, you have to be, you know, all you know, scrunched up like a double-jointed munchkin or something. And, you know, you have to train yourself to be able to do that. You have to be able to train yourself to defend yourself so that in case you need to fight your way out of something or in case you need to kill somebody. Like when they say, well, we have the information and this is bad, so we really need to kill that guy. Um, can you do it and get away with it? Uh, <clears throat> so these are the kind of important things that the ninja were, were, were going after. So, you know, it wasn't just field craft of being violent and being stabby. It was how do we improve on these skills so that we can be the most effective. Whereas the Shinobi, they didn't have really technology. They kind of had to make it up on the fly. They were clever. You know, this isn't to say that they were really crappy at their jobs or anything. It's just that they didn't have the advantage of having a manuscript to work from from being able to pull out a, a scroll and go, oh, this is how I can sabotage a bridge. The ninja already knew how to do that. The shinobi really didn't. There was no information for them to do that. There was no technology for that. Gunpowder, while known to the Japanese at this time, they really didn't know how to weaponize it just yet. Um, but these are the things that, that the ninja would actively look at and go, okay, how do I sneak a blade in? How do I poison a person? How, what poisons do I use? Do I want to use a slow-acting poison? Do I want something where the guy's just going to drop dead like that? Do I want to be stabby? Do, how do I get in and get that information? Do I copy it? Do I steal it? What do I do? How do I get it out? Those are the things that the ninjas were always thinking about and going, how can we best do this? And so it was a concentrated effort by the Chinese ninjas to develop not just techniques, but technology. And that was another big deal for the, for the information drain from China to Japan. That's why the Japanese really took this in. They understood Japanese, as much as they might not want to admit it, to admit it they knew that they were behind in terms of certain sciences and technology that the Chinese were, and they were always trying to get that information. They were always trying to reverse engineer. They were always trying to strive to get themselves up to that level. So Chinese ninjas, no different. They have their own level of effectiveness and technology and techniques, whereas the Japanese are trying to catch up. So I just wanted to make that kind of be known that this is kind of important and why this information drain and what the ninja actually knew why that's so important now as i said before one of the biggest differences is not only that but you also have the difference of again having the manuscripts having someone to teach you having the schools to teach you and having the organizations that are attached to those schools so that you can use that as your profession so the shinobi didn't have that but as the Tang Dynasty fell, and over the 100 years following that, this information drain from China to Japan as a result of fleeing the remnants of what happened in, in the Tang Dynasty, 
the shinobi started to learn more. But it was the Yamabuchi that were really just kind of imparting this information. And Yamabuchi had no real desire at the time to create a school. It was just like, oh, this is knowledge I know. So I'm going to teach you. You don't teach other people. This is directed for me to you and you do it direct. You know, okay? So no one else knows so that we can benefit from it. That's how they operated until pretty much the ninja showed up. And even after they learned that and doing that until about 1182 where a disgraced samurai and a Chinese warrior monk happened to meet each other in the mountains of Iga, and they said, hey, maybe we should do this. In 1182 AD, Japan is in the middle of the Genpei War. The Genpei War is just like most wars that happen in Japan up to this point. If it's not an invasion, then it's about secession of some type. In this case, it's about the emperor. Now, of course, within how this usually happens is that you have the imperial court where you have probably a couple rival powerful clans that are vying for the attention of the emperor's family. And, you know, so they get favors, power, and so forth and so on. Uh, the emperor decides to abdicate the throne. He goes, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to put my heir on the throne. And everyone says, but your heir is two years old. I don't care. Here we go. Boop. So the two clans go, well, this is not going to work. And uh, so, you know, we need to put somebody who's going to be uh, responsible and able to actually lead and not be two years old. And, you know, the terrible twos. And so the two of the factions are just like, okay, well, here's this guy that we've been supporting in the imperial family. We choose him. The other clan goes, well, now hold your horses. We, 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 got, we, we got this guy over here, so we're, we're going to choose him. We're going to put him on the throne. No, 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 no. Our guy, our guy. No, 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 no. Our guy, our guy. So obviously it goes into a war of succession, or succession, and they fight. And it's a five-year war, and it goes on and on and on. And in one of the battles, Kyoto is taken by one side, and this is the side that Daisuke Nishina is on. He is a lower level, lower ranking samurai. He's not a general. He's an officer, but he's not a general. Um, he is on retainer, which means that he, while he's not a ronin, he is uh, allowed himself to be bought and used by the lords of one side, of the one clan. And he is on the losing side of the battle where the general is of his army is killed. And generally what happens in this instance is that if you're a samurai on the losing side of a battle, you have some choices that you have to make. You can surrender. So here's what happens in surrendering. You're taken before the victors, and the guy looks at you and says, um, yeah, you gotta die, and you're killed on spot, head, head gets chopped off. Maybe you're taken prisoner, maybe you're ransomed, maybe you're offered a job. Maybe they say, hey, you know, uh, would you be willing to work with us? That does sometimes happen. So that's a chance that you're taking when you, when you do that surrender. The other part of a surrender is that someone's just going to go, don't care, and they kill you anyway. Because this is how samurai, uh, no pun intended, get ahead. This is how they improve their lot. This is how they get more of a pension, maybe more lands, more rice, production of rice, which means more wealth, um, you know, things of that nature. Uh, maybe you increase in status, in rank, things like that. So the more samurai you kill, the more samurai note that you kill, and you bring before your your general. The general might go, mm, "Good job. We're going to increase your pension. We're going to give you some more land. We're going to give you some more arable land that you can grow rice on." Wouldn't that be great? So, if you surrender you, and you're samurai, you have a chance, pretty good chance, of someone going, "Yeah, I really would like some land," and take off your head. That's how it happens. Or you can run away, <laughs> which is what Nishina did. He ran away. Um, in running away, which is not uncommon, means simply means that you're, it, you're going to a place where maybe you regroup or maybe you just leave the war entirely. But nevertheless, you have to leave the field of battle because the victors are chasing you down and wanting to kill you for a variety of reasons. So Daisuke Nishina, he's running away, and he has the unfortune to come across not only the victors trying to come after him, but his own side, which is also fairly normal and kind of common. 
saying, well, you know, hey, look, you didn't do your job. We had to fall back. We had to we had to get out of Kyoto. You didn't really you weren't really of much help. Um, if you want your family to retain the lands that you have, the pension that you have, and the status that you have, and maybe even pass your title down to your son, um, you're gonna have to kill yourself. Sapuku, right? <clears throat> right. So Daisuke says No, <laughs> I'm not gonna do that either. So, at this point, they said, fine, you're not a samurai anymore. Period. Your lands are forfeit. Your family's out in the street. They hate you now. Don't even bother going back home. No pension, no nothing. Get out of here. If we see you, we're going to kill you. So, everyone pretty much is out to get him. Daisuke Nishina, he <clears throat> then goes on, and he's just like, he's in Honshu, and he's just like, I'm in the mountains. I need to go somewhere. I need to figure this out. I know I'll become a Ronin. A Ronin can still have the Bushido code. They may not be samurai per se, but they can be hired as samurai and enjoy certain comforts, shall we say, of a samurai. Maybe not the ranking or social status, but certain physical comforts. You know, roof over your head, good weaponry, clothes, food. You get the idea. A little bit of pay. So he goes, that's what I'm going to do. The only problem is, as he finds out, is that everyone's got a bounty on his head. So people are wanting to kill him. So he's stuck back in the mountains and he goes, okay, well, I got to keep moving. And he keeps moving and he goes into the Iga province. He's in the mountains of the Iga province, which is kind of a good place to be. It's tough terrain. You're not going to have a lot of armies moving around there. Uh, not very many people are going to go there. So if you're trying to hide, if you're not trying to be found, then this is a good place to be. So that's where he winds up. As he's you know, kind of wandering around trying to figure out how am I going to survive from this point on. You know, I can't be a Roman. I'm no longer a samurai. Everyone wants, kind of wants to kill me. Uh, this kind of sucks because the whole reason why I did this was so that I could protect my village and fight for the rightful emperor, so forth and so on. How can I get all these goals together? And he becomes lost. Not just physically, but also in faith, in his mind, he's 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 a shell. So as he's kind of wandering around zombie like, he comes across this Chinese warrior monk called Kane Doshi. Kane Doshi is, of course, versed in in ninja techniques he's a warrior monk and this is what he used to do he used to teach these things and and to various organizations and he is at this point in time in his life he's going around trying to spread the word of buddhism buddhism does exist in japan there's very different variants of it um uh, kane doshi is of the zen buddhist and he is trying to you know just tr spread the idea around and so he comes across Daisuke um, Nishina and says, maybe I can help you. At this point, Daisuke says, I'm going to change my name from Nishina to Togagushi, which is the village that he came from. So now that he's changed his name in the hopes that nobody can find him, Kane Doshi says, I'm going to teach you how to do things. You're a samurai, so this is going to be helpful. This will be helpful. I'm going to teach you some new skills and things so that you can do the things that you know how to do. Like, you know how to be a warrior. You know how to fight. You know how to make decisions. You can lead units into battle. You can do these various things, but we're also going to teach you some other stuff so to help you. Well, you can't be a ronin. You can't be a samurai anymore. You can be a mercenary, and you can be helpful and useful in that way. But before we do that, I need for you to get your head straight. So he converts Daisuke to Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, and which helps with being able to make moral decisions and things like that. So, which is, believe it or not, you go, wait a minute, Shinobi making moral decisions? Well, yeah. I mean, they're, they're not, as a, you'll learn later on, they're not really actually assassins. More on that later. So he says, Kane Doshi says, so I need you, in order to complete your training, 
in order to do this, in order to create a group of mercenaries, of like-minded mercenaries with similar techniques and skills, I need you to renounce the one last thing that's holding you back, which is your Bushido code. <clears throat> because you're not going to be able to do these things if you hold on to the Bushido code. By holding on to the Bushido code, you're restricting yourself from being able to do what other people might consider underhanded. We don't consider it underhanded, we just think it's practical, more practical. So Daisuke says, okay, sure, and gives up the Bushido code. This is important because basically what this, this is saying is that, look, you know, if you uh, are going to take the life of a shinobi, that means you're going to have to do things that might be questionable to other parts of society. You can't be hindered by a code of that nature. Shinobis have their code. Ninjas have their own codes. They, they, these codes do exist. They're just not Bushido codes, which are very restrictive. And so that's a requirement to become a Shinobi later on, is that you cannot be a Samurai and a Shinobi at the same time. You can have skills of both. You can be one. You, you can be a ninja and masquerade as a Samurai. And you can be a Samurai and work with ninjas, but you can't be, one can't be the other. You have to give up, one has to give up the code to become the other. There's, sometimes people say that there are samurai ninja out there. No, it's just that maybe they adopted a couple techniques that enabled them to be better samurai. But if you don't give up the Bushido code, then you can't be a ninja or a shinobi. You have to give up the Bushido code. Okay, so Daisuke gives up the Bushido code and they said, okay, well, let's go on the next step. Let's find some like-minded people and let's make a mercenary group. Kane Doshi has another reason for doing this, and this is that he is using ninjas, or I'm sorry, shinobis, to spread the word of Zen Buddhism. Because if you have a mercenary group that is willing to do things for you to protect your village and do the things that the samurai can't, then they're going to look favorably on what you believe in. And so if these shinobi believe in Zen Buddhism, hey, there you go. Then people might go, hmm. This is a good good thing to believe in. So Kane Doshi has his own ulterior motive. So at this point, they've melded together the elements of being a shinobi, of being a ninja trained shinobi, you know, having these techniques, skills, and starting to create the equipment and spy craft, and marrying it with the the fighting abilities and decision making abilities of the samurai. And they're sitting there and they're going, this hasn't, ex this doesn't exist. This is, this is the first time that we've, we've come across this. This, this doesn't exist outside in the world. It's always been one or the other. So, hmm, this is kind of interesting. And Aisuke says, well, you know, we're using ninja techniques and we're using Japanese martial arts techniques and, and bladed weapon techniques. What do we call this? I know, we'll call it ninjutsu. And this is how ninjutsu is born. And when they created their first mercenary company, they had to create a school. And we're going to talk about that right now. So here you have the first ever shinobi school that taught ninja techniques. And it was called Tokokeru. And it taught ninjutsu, what we know today as ninjutsu. A little bit later on, nine more major schools would pop up within Iga province. Um, a few of them would reside in, Ko in a village called Koga, which sat on a toll road, one of the major toll roads of Japan at that time. And um, then over probably the next uh, 100 years or so, there would become over 50 schools of Shinobi in the Iga province alone. The interesting thing about the Iga province and why so many of these schools cropped up was because they were largely left alone, even though there were um, daimyo and you know Japanese lords of um, you know high rank who were supposed to be the rulers of these areas. The people of Iga were largely left alone. The people of Koga were largely left alone because it was such mountainous terrain that was hard to traverse. So it was hard to move a large army around in this province. So you would be able to climb up this mountain and then you come in and you see this wonderful valley full of villages or a, pl or a plateau full of villages, um, you know, rich agriculture, you know, uh, a lot of timber. That's actually how Iga got its wealth was that it sold timber to the rest of the empire, Japanese empire. 
And they were largely left alone because it was hard to move an army around. So at best, you could move small units around. So the local leaders, who were very much um, smaller nobles, you know, you know, maybe they they were in charge of the town or maybe a couple farms or something, and they were called uh, Hizamari. Um, and the Hizamari um, were very local. They didn't really have armies or anything. They were just kind of like almost like a glorified chieftains. So what would happen is that they, that these guys would donate to the Daimo or going to send some small units in. And everybody wants to be left alone to make their money and just to do their thing. So they would contact the Shinobi, one of the Shinobi schools or one of the Shinobi mercenary groups and say, hey, this thing is happening. Can you guys do something about it? And what would often happen is that you would have a small mercenary group or a school set up an ambush, pretty much wipe out the unit, do that two or three times, and then the overall lord of the land would probably get the idea and go oh okay fine fine you local guys you take care of it just as long as we get our money get our tax money we're good so that's kind of how things went in Iga province for a very very long time and this went on f until japan basically started to fall apart as you know we're approaching the sengoku era but first we have a couple wars that we have to get through uh before we get to that and so but here's the interesting thing is that as the nation around the Iga province was falling apart, they were successful, they were peaceful, they were able to continue with their schools, which, by the way, Shinobi meant that you did this part time. You didn't do this full time. You did this to protect your village. Maybe you helped out a local lord, spy on another local lord, and that's how you made your money. You supplemented your income. So being a Shinobi was not full time. You were a farmer. You cut down trees. You Maybe you were an artisan. Maybe you were a cook. That was your main gig. Doing a shinobi stuff was your part-time gig. So, you know, it, it was just a good time for these people. And then times got better in terms of wealth when Japan started to fall apart. Again, inside the Iga province, inside of these villages, you had the local lords who were in control. And as the country was starting to fall apart, as these wars were happening around them, these local lords got around, the Hyunorazai got around and said, you know, we don't need to be part of this. Let's create some unions here. Let's create some alliances here. And so there were about four or five different unions and alliances where they all just kind of just said, you know what, we're not going to hurt each other. We're just going to, you know, in, in numbers, we'll protect ourselves. We'll be, you know, collectively protecting ourselves. And that's how they kind of got through things until Japan finally just fell apart to, through about two wars and the Sengoku period, at which point the shinobi flourished. Before Japan slipped into constant warfare, before it slipped into the Warring States period, the Sengoku period, before it all fell apart, before the empire just crumbled into little fiefdoms and kingdoms, the shinobi, like I said before, were really working only part-time. They were supplementing their income for whatever it was that they were doing, being farmers, um, lumber, artisans, whatever it was. So what would happen is that the Hirsumurai within um, the Iga province might hire them to spy on another one, or maybe just outside of the province, outside of Koga, maybe another fiefdom or another province, someone will come in every now and again and say, hey, we need some help. Can we hire this person to do this? Now, as Japan fell apart all around them and they were pretty much stable and wealthy and had their thing going on, more and more people came in and said, hey, we need your help. And so it was all these different levels of nobility it was the em the emperor himself it was everybody they all came to the shinobi and said can you help us and this is where they realized that they could make a lot more money so a lot of them stopped being full-time farmers artisans or you know whatever and became full-time shinobi because they were recognizing that they were going into from war to war to war and it seemed like everything was falling apart so they were in high demand so how do they get hired? Who, how, how do you get to them? How do you, how do you hire them? They're supposed to be secret, right? Well, your average shinobi was secret. You didn't know who they were. So if you wanted to hire somebody, 
it's just kind of like today, if you want to contact the underworld, you kind of have to know a guy who knows a guy, right? So back then, you would also have to know a guy who knew a guy who would be able to identify and set up a meeting with the leader of the Shinobi um, mercenary group or the Shinobi school. If it was a school, it was usually uh, titled by the name of Soke, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, S-O-K-E. And so... You would set up this meeting, and this guy, he is, like I said, the leader of these organizations, and they were probably shinobi, well-trained shinobi from the past. And because they're older now and they can't quite do the things that they used to be able to do, this is their function, their leadership function. And what they would do is they would meet with you, they would see what it is that you needed done, and they would go, okay, we'll do it, but here's the price. Then you haggle over the price. Once you agreed upon the price and your payment was made, then Desoke would turn around and go to a find a middle guy, a middleman, from his school or from his organization and say, okay, here's the job, here's the person that, that we're doing this for. <clears throat> He's paid, so you're ready to go, set it up. The middleman, which is you know kind of like you know closer to the actual shinobi who's going to be doing the work they know who these shinobi are who turn around and go okay i pick you 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 and you to do this particular job here it is go and that's how they went about their business that's that's how they were able to stay secret and go about um doing their their intelligence gathering and that's another part that that i want to stress here is that the shinobi saw themselves not as killers. That was not their primary function. Now, they could definitely kill people. They could definitely assassinate people. And as I said before, they are willing. They were willing and able to do ambushes on small units and do small unit actions. And they were perfectly capable of doing sabotage. But really what their main goal was, you hire us to find information for you, for you to be able to act on. That's our goal. That's what we do. Believe it or not, people who would be assassins, the, the ones who would do the killing, a lot of them did that because they couldn't progress further in their spycraft skills. So really they were just kind of thugs. And the rest of the Shinobi organization would kind of be like, okay, you're on the lower level rank because all you can really do is beat up people and kill them. We want to do more than that. That's something that we want to do if we have to, you know. Shinobi are trained to intel uh, to gather intelligence. If they have to fight and kill their way out to get that intelligence out, they're trained to do that. But they're not trained killers. They're trained spies. That's very important. So, assassination, while it was asked of them, it was actually uncommon. It was not that often that they were asked to do that because everybody understood that's not really what they were about. Now. They understood that from time to time, a shinobi would be the perfect person to do an assassination because of whatever security or that happens to be around. And so they would take on those jobs. But even then, those jobs were not meant to be suicide jobs. Like you didn't hire a shinobi to go in to kill someone and then have that person killed. The whole point of a shinobi is being able to get in to do the thing and get back out. <laughs> right? So there, there was no like, you know, like, suicidal you know you know you know they didn't kill themselves so they wouldn't be found out or whatever their whole point is we do the thing we get out so that we can get paid and our families get paid it's a job so you can't do a job if you're dead so that was kind of the whole point so there's a big myth about ninjas and shinobi being the, the greatest of assassins they were good certainly and they were top notch absolutely but that was not their main goal. That was, that, that's not what they were doing. However, once the wars started happening and the Sengoku period and Japan slipped into Sengoku period, they found themselves doing more and more of these kinds of jobs and doing a lot of more of intelligence gathering and a lot more sabotage because there was so much going on. And this is a, a point where they actually started working closely with samurai. Now, here's the interesting thing about the relationship between the shinobi and the samurai. The samurai, as I pointed out before with the very first, um, you know, shinobi, real shinobi, the, you have, a, you have a, the Bushido code. You have a code that you go by. And in order to be a shinobi, you have to give up that code if you ever had it. So if you were a samurai, you have to give up that code to be, to be a shinobi. shinobi. 
so but what samurai would do is they, they're just like well okay you give us the information and then we'll act on it so what often happened is that the shinobi would go out and they would say hey your target is coming down this route it's really lousy route for ambushes so what we're going to do is we're going to make it so they can't go down this route but they'll come down that route and that enables you the samurai to attack them and have a better advantage and wipe everybody out that's more or less the relationship the shinobi would give tactical strategic intelligence and if need be help to create a situation that the samurai can win in that was their relationship and it worked very very well and so now that they are starting to develop these relationships all these wars started happening the sengoku period happened and this is what happened so here's what happened here's how the shinobi finally became the shinobi of legend which would eventually translate into anime so <laughs> um up until uh, the genko war there have been always these small little rebellions. There's always these lords going after each other, feuds and things like that going on. It was, you know, very, very internal and it didn't affect the country at large. And the Shinobi, uh, the Shinobi were being hired, you know, within the Iga pro uh, province and a little bit outside of the province. And occasionally somebody from another part of the country might say, hey, can you help us out? So it wasn't. For a long time, the shinobi weren't able to get the word out of who and what they were and what they could do for you. That was until the Genko War. The Genko War started in 1331 and lasted until 1333, only about two and a half, three years. And this war is kind of interesting in and of itself because at this point, this is where the Shogun has been in power for a while now, for a few centuries, a couple centuries. And they're used to running the day-to-day -day, um, activities of the empire. The emperor had given up his, uh, from a couple centuries ago, had given up his power day-to-day -day governance and to do other things. And since then, every successful uh, um, successive emperor would do the same thing. They would focus on these things, whereas the shogun would run the nation. Until Emperor Godai got onto the throne. He decided that, well, I think I'm a better better ruler than than the shogun and i think that the power should come back to the emperor and to the imperial palace and back to the nobility the shogun said mm, not so fast not so fast i i disagree i, I think we're going to continue doing this thing godai said mm, no no i think your day is done okay well i guess we're going to have to fight about it the genko war happens this is kind of an interesting war for the shinobi because what the shinobi have done is said, okay, we've been kind of doing these things inside of our province. And periodically we go outside of our province and we kind of do this intelligence gathering, but nobody really knows who we are. And when they do know who we are, they sometimes ask for us to kill people, which we don't kind of want to do. We kind of want to do the intelligence gathering because that's easy. You know, that's what we're best at. And, you know, we, have a good better chance of coming back from those missions than from assassinations because sometimes we die during assass assassinations and death is bad <laughs> and so um when the genko war happened the imperial um palace used the shinobi to great effect and the shinobi were able to demonstrate their abilities of gathering intelligence creating situations which would enable samurai to do ambushes or to have tactical advantage they would um you know do a lot of sabotage uh which is very important in warfare and from time to time they would take on the odd job of killing somebody but it was largely what they wanted to showcase was that was were the other skills and they were able to do that very successfully in the genko war so successfully that everyone else took notice and said oh wow okay um these guys are really good too bad that most of them fought on the wrong side shinobi played both sides but they mostly fought for the for, for the for the emperor um while the emperor did win the war he didn't win the people over and he basically was kicked out of power about two or three years after the genko war but the shinobi more importantly gained status and stature and they became go-to guys so a lot of other people from other parts of 
the empire would send messengers and go, hey, we need you. We'll pay for you. And it wasn't a small amount of money. Uh, the Shinobi were smart. They 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 got paid. They they did not. They were not cheap. This wasn't something where okay, yeah, here's a bag of rice. Go for it. No, uh, uh they got paid. All right, everyone got paid. The second war that established them as really good at what they do is the Onin War. And the Onin War sta started from uh, 1467 to 1477. The Onin War is important in Japan simply because it's what ushered in the Sengoku period, the Warring States period. Uh, long story short, um, the Shogun um, left the Shogunate without leaving a suitable heir. And there were two samurai families within the Shogunate that had legitimate claims to the, sh the seat of the Shogun and were trying to advance their person. And the Emperor couldn't decide. So the two samurai families started attacking each other and it escalated to the point where this, they burned the city of Kyoto down and the emperor had to be taken away out of the city to someplace safe because they were just having at each other. And then pretty soon all of Japan took one side or the other and there was a massive civil war and no one won the Onin War because the, the two samurai families that were trying to get the shogunate wiped each other out. They're all dead. And the emperor chose a weak heir to the shogunate. The rest of the country said, whatever, you, you've lost your power. We're going to do what we want. We're going to make my kingdom. I'm going to make my kingdom. We're going to do this blood feud. We're going to take over these lands. Chaos and mayhem, pain and death. So as all of these individual little kingdoms and nobles and everybody doing their own little thing, they're like, well, we really need the Shinobi. So off to Iga province they went, sent the messengers, and the Shinobi went to the far corners of the empire to do their thing. And they were very, very good at it. So good at it that they helped to destroy the empire at that point. So while they were making a lot of money, Iga province was nice and safe. Koga was still um, you know, in control of the toll roads. Things were great for the Shinobi until they weren't, but we'll get to that in a second. One of the things that anime bases its, uh, bases its stories off of are exploits. And the Sengoku period and the Onin War and the Genko War Gave a, give us plenty of exploits. Uh, I'm going to give you one in particular. And his name was Hanzo Hattori. You might recognize that name. Hanzo was a guy who kind of switched back and forth from being a shinobi to a samurai during the course of his life. He, he, he switched places several times. Whatever would fit the job he needed to do. And he, what he is notably famous for is rescuing people. So he would go in with by himself or maybe two or three other guys and go in and slaughter a whole bunch of people, rescue the people that they're going after and bring them out of the castle. He did this for Tokugawa Yasu's family. His wife and his son were held ca captive and they were being ransomed. And Hanzo said, I'll take care of it. Went in with two guys, slaughtered a castle full of people, got them out. He would later on, after Obanaga's death, he was assassinated by one of his lieutenants. They knew it was the Tokugawas that were behind it. And so people were hunting down the Yasu. Hanzo, on his own, pretty much slaughtered a whole bunch of people. And when they said, okay, enough's enough, we'll let you go, he took Yasu with him. And then that helped to usher in the Tokugawa period, also known as the Edo period, and reunited Japan. So kind of gives you an, an idea of where anime gets their exploits of ninjas from and shinobi from. So what happened to the shinobi? What, at, at how, how, what, what happened to them? What, how did they decline in power? Well, it was pretty brutal. <laughs> So how did the shinobi disappear? Well, they got wiped out. <laughs> Long story short. Uh, what had happened was as Oda Nobunaga was uh, unifying Japan and is, is working towards that goal, in 1579, um, he expressed uh, two things. One, he was very distrustful of most shinobi. 
he did use a core group out of Koga, which he was fine with, but the rest of them he didn't really trust. He thought that they were going to turn on him at some point. Also remember how he was talking about how um, the Iga province and Koga were pretty independent of the nobility of the feudal system? Well, he didn't like that. Oda Nobunaga didn't like that. So he was talking about this to his son, who's, who decided on his own, without his father's permission, to take a small force into Iga, thinking that, that because there weren't so many of them, keep in mind that they believe the Count of Shinobi was like around somewhere between ten and 15,000, that he could just walk in there and just start killing everybody. Well, as we all know, if you take a small unit into Iga province to wipe out the Shinobi, the Shinobi are going to wipe you out. And that's what happened. A very good general of Oda Nobunaga's was killed, and his son barely made it out alive. So he was dishonored by this whole thing. It would be a couple years before he would be able to act on his uh, revenge. And that was in 1581, where he raised an army between 40 and 60,000 um, troops. The, the exact number is not known, but it's believed between those two numbers. What is known is that at that point in 1581, there was only 10,000 shinobi in the Iga province. So when they went into open battle, um, Oda Nobunaga was able to attack from six different directions with forty to 60,000 troops going up against 10,000. What do you think happened? Yes, they all got wiped out. And that was pretty much the end of the shinobi. Now, as I said before, there was a core group that existed and there were certain little other groups that were allowed to exist because they showed um, fealty towards Oda Nobunaga, like they helped him kill the other shinobi so they became what is what we know as shinobi today you know if we say that shinobi still exist they come from that group of of shinobi but they really didn't do much more after that um hanzo hattori was pretty notable um in in 60 in the in the early 1600s rescuing tokugawa yasu and his family a couple times but beyond that, the shinobi pretty much fell from prominence because there were no shinobi left. The other part of the shinobi uh, culture is that not a lot of stuff was written down. You have text from the Chinese warrior monks who taught the ninja ways to the shinobi. But the actual shinobi text themselves, they don't really exist. Um, there is debate as to whether or not shinobis actually still exist today. Technically, there is at least one. Um, one school of shinobi that is able to provide historical text that they say that they go by. But beyond that, nobody really knows if the shinobi actually exist. Um, or if it's just kind of like a reenactor's guild. So, unfortunately, that is what happened to the shinobi. But in anime, we get great anime. Shinobi in anime. We, we, we get a whole bunch of great guys. A lot of action. A lot of sword fighting and a lot of intrigue and all that good stuff but this is where they come from this is the the, the real deal um thank you so much for watching this panel um i can't wait to answer your questions and i hope you enjoy the rest of on con six Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi. Hello, hello. We are back um, from the amazing... Hey, there we are. We're all here. It's great. Um, and uh, just finished the Shinobi panel. There we go with Steve here. Uh, and we, we get um, John's ear as well, which is great. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that, that works. Um, <laughs> The two-headed man. I feel like grows. son. Yeah. <laughs> man with two heads. <laughs> is that a Steve Martin movie? Yeah. 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 Wow. And, and a B movie classic. Right. That is that is absolutely yeah. true. Um, so um, speaking of Shinobi, um, no. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, I really love that panel, um, uh, especially because it's so hard in anime where anime does not treat Shinobi in any sort of realistic way like it, it's it's gone so bad kind of like samurai right you know, yeah, where there's absolutely. not a lot of like realistic samurai things um what got you um 
Um, what inspired you to make this panel specifically? Like, what was it about that that kind of int intrigued you? Um, honest to God, it was that time that you and I watched uh, Ninja Scroll. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and <laughs> one of the things that I thought was interesting was that in Ninja Scroll, they actually talk about the feud between the Toyotomis and mm. the Tokugawas, mm -hmm. and um, and how <clears throat> how they were spying on each other. And, mm. and for those in Chatland. Uh, the Toyotomis were in competition with the Tokugawas to see who would be the leader of the, un the now newly unified Japan after the uh, War of State, uh, the, the Warring States period. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> the Tokugawas had done a very underhanded thing and mm. had an assistant yeah. you know, do the deal mm -hmm. on on Oda Nobunaga, mm -hmm. and the Toyotomis got kind of short end of the stick. Yeah. So for a few years afterwards, <laughs> uh, as the Tokugawas were consolidating power, the Toy Toyotomis were trying to get back at them. Mm. And so there was this like low-level kind of like intelligence slash like you know uh, ninja operations going mm. going across each other, or shinobi um, operations. Now, Ninja Scroll was interesting because it was like you know the, basically the myth of the, <laughs> of, the, of the ninja of, of flitting around, being stabby and. And killing people and stuff when, mm. in fact, the shinobi were really just like, no, I, I'm doing this to make money so I can go home and eat. <laughs> yeah. So that's, you know, yeah. a little bit different. Yeah. Um, kind of like we talk about with, you know, samurai were basically <clears throat> just soldiers, mercenaries. That's kind of all they yeah, were to, to begin yeah. with. Yeah. Uh, and then I grew from there. Um, uh, totally. So when, you, uh, when you're looking at um, representations of shinobi and anime, which ones kind of stand out to you? Not necessarily accurate, but which ones are the, are the ones that you, that you like really enjoy? Um, I, so I'll be honest, it's, it's the ones that, that, and it's kind of a trope more than anything else. Mm. It's, it's kind of like how they go, it's the modern day ninja, you know, something in, in, in the future. <laughs> and you get the idea of, you know, just basically characters in black using technology, doing black ops mm. and, and things like that. Those are always kind of fun because they're mm. actually more of a true representation of the mm. show. Be a little mm -hmm. bit. A little okay, bit. yeah. Um, but, you know, there's always something to be said for watching, you know, feudal era anime and just watching just some unknown black clad person with, the, you know, the menacing eyes mm. and you know, just with the various types of weapons because the samurai in the anime normally have the swords and that's pretty much it yep this the 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 shinobi have like all manner of things mm -hmm. you can have throwing star mm -hmm. hands you can have like the little hammer with the hook you can mm -hmm. have the chain you got nunchucks you can have you know poison gas or you know in some cases magic yeah sure yeah <laughs> you know, why not why not exactly yeah. um so yeah, so it's it's more. I, I don't think I have any one particular mm. anime ninja character mm. that I like, mm -hmm. but I think it's just more along the. It's entertaining. Yeah, is, is, mm -hmm. is what I find. Yeah, um, except for Naruto. Except obviously. for Naruto. Naruto being okay, the iconic. Yeah. So so the thing about Naruto, which I'm, you know, I, so like my mind just goes, we're not going. Naruto doesn't exist anymore. You know? It's just like it's this thing over here. Yeah. And the odd thing about Naruto, it's mm. funny that you bring it up, is that there are certain elements of Naruto that are actually accurate. Hmm. In terms of when they're talking about the villages that they live in, ah. and because it's very much, uh, not that I really watch the series yeah, yeah. closely because my God, it's Naruto. <laughs> um, no offense to any fans out there. Yeah. yeah. Um, if but, it's a gateway drug, it's your yeah, gateway drug. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but the way they did depict the village is often, I think, a pretty fair mm. representation to what was going on in the Iga province and in and Toga, mm. the, the, the village where. Mm. It's more of a kind of like almost a guild-like, almost alliance mm -hmm. kind of like you know the, the those kinds of things to mm -hmm. rule the land as opposed to having a shogun or mm -hmm. a dynamo or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, the rest of Naruto, no, not so much. <laughs> not so much. Sorry. So they didn't have sexy jutsus. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Not a lot of orange jumpsuits no. back in the day. No. no very, no. very, very odd. It makes for great spying. Huh? Yeah, no, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Don't look at the bright, shiny, loud kid hanging. <laughs> Well, it's, it's traffic uh, cone ninja. <laughs> it's, it's called camouflage in plain sight. Uh, I <laughs> see. Yes. So no one, no one would think he was a ninja. Exactly. exactly. Because no of how way. ridiculous the outfit is. So no that's... No, they would be secretive. He's so out there. Mm -hmm. Nobody would expect that. Everything makes sense. Um, uh, you mentioned um, uh, in the panel about there being shinobi today, so they say. Right. Can you dig more into that. Yeah, so basically what that is, is it's, it's um, so there is supposedly 
one shinobi school left. There's a guy mm. out there who claims to be an actual shinobi. Mm. And he and when he says that he claims that, he claims that he's an actual shinobi, not just like a reenactor or somebody mm. who's a historian or maybe comes from that lineage. Mm. He's he claims he dude's like ninety years old now. <laughs> so, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um but some people claim that there that um like businesses who use industrial espionage uh, use okay. shinobi. And so there's this myth that mm. there are industrial, which which is actually a real thing, sure. industrial espionage, that these people are actually trained shinobi to mm. sneak into mm. you know, places to gain information. Mm-hmm. Um, formula. Yeah. <laughs> and um, the thing is, but the, the romance behind that is that they are supposedly using the skills from texts that do exist today. Oh, so there are okay. a handful of texts from... Um, from the Warring States period that exists today um, that show various methods. Mm. Now, if you were to go to China, they're all over the place because that, mm. that was a thing you did as part okay. of your government. Mm. Um, in Japan, so, not so much. Mm. Um, it was more verbal, it was more vocal, handed down verbally. Mm. Uh, so, the, um, sorry, no, the, the, um, so the text today exists and they're claiming that a school does exist to train mm. people. Interesting. Well, whether or not that does actually yeah. is a thing, who knows? And the, that it kind of makes sense because on, on the one hand, I was thinking, oh well, industrial espionage exists. They are spies. Thus, you could call them modern shinobi. It's just a you know, it is a right. a job description. But right. when you tie it down to the actual techniques, uh, it would be funny to say. I, I'd love to see their website. You know, yeah. you know, <laughs> we, we we are the industrial espionage. You know, and here's the seal of approval from shinobi 300 years ago yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> certified certified shinobi yeah licensed in bondage <laughs> yeah. customer testimonial when i hire my shinobi google gives them 4.5 <laughs> oh, testimonial number two deceased number three deceased, deceased. Yeah. deceased yeah um that's that's really interesting um um why do you think the shinobi um why do you think they died out in that sense? I mean, obviously, you know, events happened, but you'd imagine there would always be a call for that, and so whatever else is happening historically, there there would still be schools, there would still be things going on, um, and obviously we have you know spycraft now. Um, so why do you think that kind of um, that wasn't preserved, if you will? Well, this is where the myth meets reality. Mm. Um, so after Oda Nobunaga pretty much wiped out. The majority of the ninjas. Mm-hmm, he still yeah. had a core of ninjas, or I'm sorry, shinobi that worked with him mm. that he trusted, and that's the surviving group. Okay. Uh, so as time went on, they were needed less and less and less to do the. Oh, of course, things. right, they because you have Edo right, period, right, 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 right. The Edo period. So you you you, huh. you didn't need them as much. Right. And what they did is that their techniques kind of so, sort of just melded into the actual military. Uh, and okay. so and, and so far that you know like how do you do intelligence gathering? Mm. How do you how do you extract and how do you do things like of that nature? Like secret police kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, that, okay. that kind mm. of thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it's not so much that it was like the action of like. Hanzo, who would go into a castle with like two or three guys and just murder everyone mm. to rescue the person, um, it, it, that stuff was was gone and uh, and done with. Mm. Now, like I said, the, the text survived, and there's some, you know, the, of course, the methodology would survive certain, you know, over time because mm. it developed spycraft for the Japanese. Mm. True. But um, during the Edo period, it was really no use. Yeah, for them. yeah, and, makes and sense. by the time that the you know the Japanese were doing their expansionism. Mm. In the late 1900s, starting in the 1920s, they already had their modern mm. secret police, had their yeah. modern um, uh, techniques, intelligence techniques. Yeah, you're, you're not n- really going to, you know, go to Paris and start throwing, throwing stars. Start throwing or, yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, makes sense. Uh, that's really interesting. No, um, was there anything else you wanted? Anything else like after doing the panel, like it's kind of in your head that you're like, oh, I wish I'd, I'd mentioned this or anything like that. <laughs> Not really. Um, it's it's just a very interesting story in so far that you know we have this really huge uh, shinobi ninja myth, and we have all these wonderfully bad movies from the nineteen eighties, <laughs> you know, telling us how these like neon colored ninjas were somehow <laughs> secretly working through society. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, but it's it, one of the things that was that was interesting in in, in uh, researching this and tying mm-hmm. it into anime is that in anime you have this big secret world of the shinobi mm. and it's really from the Chinese who have been doing it for centuries mm. prior but in Japan you realize that they only lasted 300 
400 years, mm. and that was it. Mm. And so mm. it was a really short time frame that they actually operated in. Mm. It's kind of like the uh, Cowboys of the, of the American West. Yeah, they, yeah. they, they only lasted like 80 years. Mm. You know? If that, yeah. yeah. And yeah. Uh, so it was just really interesting to see how, and also it's a great way to see the understand, and to understand the relationship of Japan and China at that time, mm. and that flow of information and the desire of the Japanese of that time to say they prized it highly they valued mm. it very very much mm -hmm. and this will you know when i talk about samurai later on that's mm -hmm. that's another thing yeah and um so i thought it was just really kind of interesting to to, yeah. to see that cross kind of cross-cultural yeah. which you're not going to see today <laughs> yeah. right now huh i wonder what why I mean? that was strange cool all right well then we're going to take a quick break we'll be back at 3 30 in the p.m eastern time with a pre-recorded panel about Noragami and a crash course in Shintoism. Sorry, Shintoism, not Shintoism. That sounded Shinto. weird. Um, and uh, so we'll be back in about 15 minutes with that. So we will see you then. Hey guys, right now we're in Denden Town, which is basically the Akihabara of Osaka City. Today I just want to go figure hunting. Uh, we're actually right outside our first shop. So we're just going to see what we can find. Um, I have nothing to... I love Osaka. Look how old these ones look. These are... <gasps> oh, MG. No way. Aria? <laughs> this is one of my favorite shows. Oh, she's only 500 yen. Man, if they had the set of these, like if they had Akari, who's the main character, I would probably get this, but I'm, I'm, for some things, I'm very much a set person, so I'd rather just, like, get all the characters, but this is so cool. 500 yen, man. They even have read or die stuff. Like, I love the stores that have a bunch of old stuff. That's your favorite girl. That's a really good, <laughs> nice, that's a really good place. That is a nice one. Yeah, there's this one too, but she's, uh... But she's just holding a, an iron rod. She's not doing no gun on that one. 700 yen. It's yeah, it's, a, it's a huge for 700 yen. So they have Meg from Burst Angel, which is really cool. I actually love the design of Meg as a character. But the show is like, eh, okay to me. So I could take it or leave it. But this is a really nice looking figure. Like, you can't really see it. But I love the pose that she has. They do have a lot of older stuff though. Like, Mahime gunslinger girl a lot of like early 2000s stuff here oh blood plus as well this is also one of my favorite shows air oh do you see this one it's from air i have like a price figure of her but i don't have a figure this nice she's hard to find i usually can't find air stuff some little busters i keep seeing this one everywhere of the reen playing with cats all right next shop time oh cute look at these are these all from the new yeah the new, the new season Look at the ash in the snow. Oh my God. That's adorable. That's very cute. Oh, that's adorable. That's a nice um, Rika figure. Oh, they have Renge, but they have. Oh man, this has gone up in price. I remember when this was like 40, 50 bucks, but now it's like 8,000 yen. But if I get a Renge figure, I'm really going to want it to be like a full size figure, not a Nendroid. They have a lot of Rikas over here. They have like a chibi one. They have one of her in like a gothic Lolita outfit. That's so cool. Oh, this one's actually really nice. I mean, it's more expensive, but you can tell that it's a much nicer figure than like a prize one. They finally have Dr. Stone stuff. Um, I haven't really seen a lot of Dr. Stone stuff yet. Um, I guess it's still fairly new in retrospect, but yeah, they have some of that stuff now. What'd you find now? That's cute. Misaka and Misaka Misaka. Oh, that is cool. Oh, Minato. Oh my god. I've never seen one of him. Don't really, I don't even think I have any figures that are dudes. I just have a lot of figures that are girls. I love this My Hero Academia one of Jito. This one's really oh, cool. Nice. Look how big that is. Anyone who's ever been to a movie theater in Japan will recognize these characters. <laughs> no more. <laughs> This is ba these are basically the characters that tell you like, oh, you know, don't film at the movie. We don't support piracy and all that stuff. And they're really funny and like, it's like a nationwide phenomenon. Alan just found one from Emma, which is like a Victorian romance anime. And like, that's in actually insane. Mm -hmm. Like, that this is something we found. The anime is like, I think it's like 2004, 2005 anime. And it's just not ever talked about that much. This is what they call the junk figure section where it's like, figures that might have something wrong with them. 
this is um Lum and I can't really tell maybe it's because she's got a lot of scratches on her but this is a pretty good find um for something like this even like they're calling it like a junk figure I guess but yeah I guess it's like figures that maybe don't have boxes or might be missing pieces and stuff wow I don't think I've actually ever seen um Euphemia in this particular outfit um, as a figure. This is giant. Oh my gosh. I wonder how old this figure is actually. They give you a tiny discount for it being opened by a couple bucks. But oh man, that is beautiful. I love this show called Bakuan. It's just really cute moe girls who ride motorcycles and they have like a motorcycle club at school. And I love the figure with the motorcycle. That's very cute. Oh, 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 oh no, the price. Oh no. <laughs> oh, it's it's kind of oh lost in space. <laughs> oh man, I don't know if that'll ever go down. I'm gonna hope it does because I really don't know how popular Kanata lost like Astro Lost in Space is, but oh man, this is like it's insane. This is like my current dream figure, dude. Oh my god. Look at her! Look at her! It's such a nice one too. It is so nice. She's under a hundred, maybe, but oh my god, she she's she's worth that much. But I just oh, I'm not gonna justify it now. If you watch my last figure video, you'll know that I picked up an Eve figure from Black Cat, and I thought that was the only Eve figure in existence. But um, yeah, apparently not. Apparently this one also exists, and it's also really affordable. Like this one's cool. I definitely would have gotten a. I still like the one that I have, but um, I would have also picked this one up had I seen it. <laughs> Very cool. These Necopar ones are really cute. They're huge, and I just love their cute outfits. They're so big that their hair has to be, like, clipped on manually. <laughs> oh, this is the Euro Camp opening. <laughs> Alright, we're in the next shop, and uh, I noticed this Kino's Journey um, figure. I actually have never seen this show yet. But it seems right up my alley, and everyone keeps recommending it to me, so it'll probably be next on my list. Any yeah, robotic notes. Yeah, science adventure notes. series fans out there. <laughs> bunny girl senpai stuff. <laughs> this show is so good. There's another bunny girl senpai up there. That's the cowboy bebop set I have, but I I have the set, but I don't have Ed. Remember? Oh yeah. I found the set in America, and the girl gave it to me for like five or ten bucks. It just didn't have Ed. Gosh, with Ed, it's uh, 7,200 yen. Oh my gosh, I didn't realize that this was this rare. This is the first time I've seen this since mm -hmm. I bought it um, in America. That's crazy. Oh, I'm actually super jealous it has Ed. I, Ed's my favorite, and I just still bought the set without Ed, but oh man, look at that. That's so cool. The Bungo Stray Dogs figures are really nice looking, actually. Whoa, whoa, Journey. Yo, do you remember when I played that game in college? Oh, oh, Journey. That's, that's cool. pretty. Is this the cat returns right here too? Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> that's pretty old. Lots of Vocaloid. All the time. Everywhere. So many Mikus. I've always thought this Asuka figure was really cute. Her in the little like plug suit inspired kimono that or yukata. That's so cute. Look at the Shaman King ones. These are pretty new. These just came out. Cause um, you know, Shaman King's getting its second season soon, so I love those. These Yoko's are cute in her normal outfit. Usually Yoko figures are pretty expensive, but that one's only uh, 19 and this one's like 16. Oh, they have Clanad ones, but of course I own both of these. It's weird that they have two different boxes for them, but I think she's basically the same figure, but I do own these, so. I got quite a bit of Clanad. Oh, okay, they have uh, Rio too. I have her, I think. Mm -hmm. Do I? Crap. I think you have one I'm of her. pretty I don't sure know if I you have, have her. This exact model, though. Oh man, this is why I need to take a picture. <laughs> it's worth it to dig sometimes. Oh, okay, this is um Bunny Girl sent by. This is cute. I haven't actually seen her in the red one. Here we go. Here's another Clanad one. See, there's Kotomi. I definitely have her though. That box looks like it has some sun damage though. There's more Clanad. Oh my god. I think this is Fuko. Fuko's adorable. Yeah, that's Fuko. Which I have her too. Some Clanad fans gonna come in here and be so happy <laughs> that they're all here. Alright guys, we've spent most of our day 
just looking at figures. I didn't purchase anything this time, which is pretty crazy. I usually do. For now, we're gonna go rest a bit, rest my feet. I'm tired. Guys, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to push like. Don't forget to subscribe for more anime and Japan content, and I'll play with you some other time. Hello guys, today I'm kind of freaking out because I am at the Fruits Basket Cafe today. I'll be honest, I wasn't a big fan of the original series, but I've been watching the remake of the series that's currently airing and I really love it. I'm really into it. This cafe is in Harajuku. It's just a four minute walk from Harajuku Station, but it won't be here very long. Let's take a look and see what we can order. So a lot of this food is based off of food that Toru cooks in the anime. For example, she uh, cooks a lot of onigiri and she has really nice miso soup. So it's based around stuff that she makes. I love the kyo curry, it's so cool. Neko kare, that is adorable. I'm personally a fan of Yuki and I kind of wanted ice cream because it's a really hot day today. So I think I'm going to get the Nezumi Parfait. Uh, Nezumi meaning mouse. They also have Momiji and just a whole bunch of the, uh, the main characters and all of this food looks really really good. But again, I'm, I'm most likely going to get this uh, ice cream because it's so hot today. The Toru drink looks really cute and well put together. It looks so adorable, but I think it's just maybe too hot for that. Again, normally with these anime cafes, if you order a drink, um, you get kind of like a, a cup holder for free um, with it. So any random character, and we'll see which one I get. So of course they give you a paper mat, which a lot of anime cafes tend to give you. This is really cute. Ah, and yes, these are what the coasters look like. So there's more characters than I thought. I have no idea who I'm gonna get, but we'll just have to wait and see. Until the 21st, you have these characters. And then the next week, they're going to have, I guess, different characters, it's a secret. my two coasters. Um, I'm really happy to get Saki because my friend really really likes her so this will be a gift for my friend. So I got the mango juice and it's after the character kill and here it is. You can see that I have a cat straw and it definitely looks like Kyo's hair so let's give it a taste. Yep, it's just basically mango juice and it's really good and nice and refreshing on this super hot Tokyo day. I love that they bring you a little popcorn, that's so nice to snack on. All right, here it is, the Nezumi Parfait. It is so cute. I love the little Yuki here. This is actually sugar paper. Um, it's very common in Japan to have a little character made out of sugar paper, so it's edible, actually. Let's take a tiny little taste. This is so cute, look at the ears. There's like little ears, uh, sugar paper too. Oh, this is adorable so perfect on a summer day. Oh, that's actually really good. It's like a vanilla bean ice cream. Yeah, it's really great. Oh my god, guys, there's a cracker in the ice cream. That's so funny because mice like crackers. That's the stereotype. <laughs> that's so cute. I really liked the uh, mango drink and the mango parfait. Both were really excellent. Now it's time to pay and go check out the shop. Okay, now we're going to check out the store. Oh my gosh, some of this stuff is so cute. Oh my gosh, the shirts. Uh, 32 is a bit more than I'd want to spend on a shirt where I'm not like 
obsessed with the anime, but this is a really adorable shirt. And it has the Zodiac on the back. Oh, that's a good shirt. So I definitely have to pick up something for my friends. I really wish I could pick more individual characters because my friends really like Saki and Arisa. But I might just have to go in blind. Maybe I should. Maybe I should just get one of these. All right, you know what? Yeah, three buttons. I'll get three buttons for my three friends that love Fruits Basket, and they are, will be welcome to change characters when they get them. All right, uh, it is time for our panel on Noragami. So we are gonna switch over to that. Um, it's a shorter panel, so it'll go for about half an hour, and then we will hopefully get the panelists on the horn virtually to talk more about that. So we will see that in, um, uh, hopefully in a little bit, but now a bit about Noragami and Shinto. Welcome to Noragami, a crash course in Shintoism on Con Edition. I go by a tuple one half on Twitter. You can also find me on YouTube as a tuple. This presentation is basically supposed to be a light primer on Shinto through the lens of the anime Noragami. If you aren't familiar with Noragami or if you haven't seen it, don't worry. I don't think that sitting through this will ruin the show for you. I'm mostly talking about who characters are, not so much the events of the plot. But just to be fair, here's your spoiler warning for Noragami and Noragami Argoto. I'm just going to be talking about the anime. I'm not going to be covering the manga, though the manga is quite good. I do recommend that you check it out. I'm not going to be talking about Yato's identity or anything like that, but I am going to be ruining the endings of some Japanese myths. So if you haven't finished reading your ancient sacred texts, I will be spoiling those. So that said, let's get into it. So what is Shinto? Shinto is Japan's native religion. It is a broad amalgamation of all of these ancient local folk religions that became more and more uniform to one another over time and eventually came together to create Shinto as we know it today. Shinto is really, really old, like archaeological evidence dating back to 300 BC old. It has no known founder and no single text as its basis. So there's no equivalent to Jesus or the Bible in Shinto. There are texts about Shinto though, the oldest surviving being the Kojiki, which is from 712 AD, and eight years later, there's the Nihon Shoki. But these are not scriptures. These are essentially record books from those times, recording things like important events and important people and important folklore. So for a lot of the myths in Shinto, these are considered the main primary sources for them. Shinto is unique in that it has not really left Japan. It hasn't spread the same way other religions have. However, a lot of religions have come to Japan and influenced Shinto. In particular, Buddhism. A lot of Shinto gods are borrowed from Buddhism, but it's also influenced by Hinduism, Taoism, Confucianism, basically any neighboring religion. But pretty much everyone in Japan takes part in Shinto in one way or another. Even if you're not religious, you probably still visit a shrine at least once a year, probably for New Year's. Everyone in Japan also takes part in Buddhism in one way or another, but because of the time and scope of this presentation, I'm not going to be delving into Buddhism, I'm just going to be focusing on Shinto. 
So because Shinto is so ingrained into Japanese culture, it's easier to think of it as a nationwide set of traditions as opposed to a religion in the Western sense. I also think it's important to mention state Shinto. Shinto became the official religion of Japan from the Meiji era to World War II, and this was a tactic to rally patriotism, to the point that Shinto is still kind of associated with right-wing politics politics even today. So one of the most important elements of Shinto is kami. Kami basically means gods. The Kojiki defines kami as any being whatsoever which possesses some eminent quality out of the ordinary and is awe-inspiring, which, you know, is pretty vague. Collectively, the Shinto gods are referred to as yaoyoruzu no kami, the eight million gods, basically implying that there are infinite gods. Shinto gods can take the form of all sorts of things from ancestral ghosts to natural features like mountains and rivers, but basically in theory, anything can have a kami. My computer can have a kami. The chair you're sitting in could have a kami. Ankon could have a kami, a kami just to watch over Ankon. So you can see how the number of gods adds up very quickly, and how it's no wonder that some of them get forgotten. And this is where we get the premise for Noragami, which means stray god. So even though there are so many gods, Shinto does have a primary mythology with primary gods. So if you're going to know any myths from Shinto mythology, these are the ones you should know. So first we have Izanami and Izanagi. Izanami is the female, Izanagi is the male. Together they stirred the ocean with a jeweled spear, and when they pulled it out of the water, the drops off the tip splashed in the ocean and created the main island of Japan. The two then went there, got married, and had lots of children, some of which were other gods, some of them were the other islands of Japan, and this is basically Japan's creation myth. And this myth was taught as history in Japan until World War II. So Izanami and Izanagi, they are having a great time until Izanami gives birth to the fire god, and she is horribly burned and dies and goes to a place called Yomi. Yomi is underground, it is very dark, and lots of monsters live there. It is essentially the underworld. Izanagi misses his wife and goes to Yomi to get her back. He finds her and she says, I can't go back with you because I've already eaten the food here. And those are the rules. Once you eat the food, you can't leave. But she says, wait here. I'm going to try to work something out with the guys in charge. But whatever you do, don't look at me. So what does Izanagi do? He lights a fire and looks at her and realizes that she is a rotting corpse. So he hightails it out of there. Izanami is angered by this and gives chase, but Izanagi outruns her and seals the entrance to Yomi with a giant boulder so she cannot get out. Peeved off by this, Izanami says from behind the boulder that she is going to kill a thousand people a day because of this. And Izanagi replies that he will make sure 1,500 people a day are born. So here we get Shinto's explanation for the life and death cycle, but this myth also illustrates the important point that kami are not these perfect ethereal beings. They are very human, they have human emotions, they have human reactions, they can get hurt, and they can die. Another cool thing about this myth is that Yomi is a real place, or at least its entrances. The top image is how it's portrayed in the show, the bottom two are photos of the real location, so you can go and see the big rock that Izanagi supposedly put there. And no, you're not allowed to try to move it. So in Noragami, we go to Yomi and meet Izanami. You can see that she has the rotting flesh thing going on in that top picture. She is very lonely. 
and she wants her guests to eat so that way they get stuck there the same way she is. Uh, she commands an army of Shikome or hags of the underworld. In some variations of the myth, she sent an army of hags to chase after Izanagi and he still outran them. And she also has this very long, creepy, moving hair that tries to reach out and grab you. This is not an ability that is solely associated with Izanami. In Japan, female ghosts have very long, dark hair with supernatural properties. So Izanami has this ability in the show essentially because she's a dead woman. After Izanagi left Yomi, he was very germy because Yomi is a very unclean place and he had to cleanse himself. And when he washed his left eye, Amaterasu, the sun goddess, was born. When he washed his right, the moon god, Tsukiyomi, was born. And when he washed his nose, Susano, the storm god, was born. Amaterasu and Susano end up having this really intense sibling rivalry going on. And Susano, being a storm god, when he throws fits, things get very messy. So after one of Susano's fits where he messed up a ton of Amaterasu's stuff, she says, I've had it, I'm going into this cave, and I'm taking the sun with me. Good luck living in darkness. Everybody realizes that this is terrible and they need to find a way to get her out. So they throw a very loud party and make it sound like they're having tons of fun to try to make Amaterasu want to come out of the cave. She does get curious from the noise and peeks out from the cave. And when she does this, they immediately put a mirror in front of her face. And Amaterasu is this beautiful sun goddess. So she is totally entranced by her own reflection and they're able to lure her out of the cave and seal it behind her, giving the world sunlight once again. Amaterasu goes on to become the highest rank deity in Shinto. Her shrines are very big, very pretty, very well maintained. She is also believed to be the ultimate ancestress of the imperial line, that is, until the emperor denounced his divinity after World War II. So Amaterasu is not hanging out on Earth with everybody else. She is up in a place called Takamagahara. Takamagahara is in the sky. It is connected to the earth by a bridge that some people interpret as a rainbow. This is where the gods live. It's where they gather to meet. In the show, it's where Bishamon's giant estate is that is not like hidden in the backyard of one of her shrines. It is understood to be up in the sky. This is also where Yato's tiny piece of land is. And Takamagahara is traditionally depicted with golden clouds and very traditional Japanese architecture. You can kind of see in the top left image the big red columns and the people in the background dressed in traditional court garb and how the color gold is incorporated everywhere as well. Now, since Amaterasu is in charge, when she decides someone is going to become emperor, he is going to become emperor. And that brings us to the three talismans of sovereignty. The mirror that was used to lure her out of the cave, a magic sword that Susano found after slaying a serpent, and a fertility jewel that Susano used in a baby-making contest against Amaterasu. As I said, they had a very intense sibling rivalry. These three items were supposedly given to the first emperor by the gods in order to prove his sovereignty over the land. These are real-life items that are referred to as the imperial regalia. This is not a picture of them. This is an artist's interpretation of what they might look like. There are no photos of these items. There are no drawings. The only people allowed to see them are the emperor and his, like, highest-ranked Shinto priests. So you can imagine them to look like whatever you want. I prefer Sailor Moon's version myself. 
But this idea of regalia, items that are sacred to the gods, this comes up in Noragami. So regalia and Noragami are the dead souls of humans that have the ability to turn into tools for the gods' use, usually a weapon. And in Japanese, they're called shinki. Shinki has multiple meanings in Japanese. It can be used to refer to gods themselves. It can be used to refer to a newly crafted item. And it can also be used to refer to the imperial regalia. It's a play off of these ideas of items that are important to the gods, but also these lives that have been crafted into something new after death. Now, let's take a look at some of the gods that wield regalia in the show. First up is Ebisu. The traditional depiction is on the left, Noragami's depiction is on the right. He is one of the seven gods of fortune and is the only one out of the seven that is derived from Japanese mythology. The rest are derived from Buddhism and Hinduism. He was originally named Hiruko, and he was the first child of Izanami and Izanagi. But he was born without bones, so they threw him away. Then he grew his bones back, as one does, and he became the kami of fishermen and merchants, and was renamed Ebisu. He doesn't look very similar to his traditional depiction. His regalia are his coat and gloves. He's very clumsy because of the whole no bones thing, so they help him with dexterity. And he shares some of his personality with the traditional god, where he's very honest and very difficult to anger. Next we have Bishamonten, also one of the seven gods of fortune. She is the kami of warriors, or he. The biggest difference between the traditional depiction and Noragami's is that traditionally Bishamonten is a man, but Noragami's version is a woman. I'm not entirely sure why she's dressed like a sexy cop, but I do have a theory. So if you look at the traditional depiction, you can see that he's stepping on some enemies. So I think they took the idea of stepping on people and ran with it. That is my theory. So Bishamon Ten is derived from one of Buddhism's four heavenly kings. He is a great warrior that has amassed a huge horde of treasures and weapons over the course of his journeys, and he always triumphs over evil. And we see this reflected in Noragami's version, where Bishamon Ten has so many regalia at her disposal. She's also very dignified and holds herself to a high standard to the point of being obsessed with triumphing over evil, which becomes a problem when she thinks Siato is evil. So next we're going to go over the rest of the gods of fortune. They aren't very important in the anime, most of them don't even have lines, but I still want to go over them. First up is Daikokuten. He is the god of commerce. Traditionally, he has a sack of goodies over his shoulder and a mallet that is sometimes called the magic mallet or the money mallet. And in the show, he kind of looks like your shady uncle running the festival booth. I'm not sure why. Maybe because those are associated with making money? But he's holding a bunny, and the reason he's holding a bunny is because Daikokuten is also known as Okuninushi. And Okuninushi has a tale about him where he helped a rabbit, and in return the rabbit gave him some good fortune. And if you go to some of his shrines, sometimes they have adorable bunny statues. And in the show, he just really likes rabbits. Then we have Ebisu, who I already went over. Then we have Ben Ten, the goddess of music and art. She looks really similar to her traditional depiction, but if you look closely at her chest, you can see that she has a little tattoo of a treble clef that they added. Then we have Bishamon Ten, who I already went over. Then we have Fukurokuju, the god of wisdom and wealth. So you might think that he has that fancy top hat to show off how wealthy he is, but actually it's to hide his giant forehead. He has a really big forehead. That is how you recognize him in traditional art. So yeah, the hat is not to be fancy, it's to cover that up. 
Next is Hote, who we know in the West as the Laughing Buddha. He is a god of happiness and health. He looks really similar to his traditional depiction in origami. They gave him some hair, that's about it. Then we have Jurajin, the god of longevity, who in traditional depictions is a little old man with a cane, and in origami he's a little old man with a cane. Then during New Year's, they all get in a big flying boat and pass out presents to the good children. I have no idea how this works in real life because Japanese kids don't get presents for New Year's. They get cold, hard cash from their relatives, but that's the story. Uh, the Seven Gods of Fortune, they get in a boat and bring presents. <laughs> Next up is Kofuku. Kofuku is a bimbogami. She's a kami of poverty. These are traditionally depicted as really dirty old men that have nothing to their name except a hand fan, and that's why her regalia is a fan. Bimbogami are not worshipped. They possess people and houses and bring very bad luck. So in the show, she goes by the name Kofuku Ebisu. Ebisu after the god of fortune, Kofuku means little fortune in Japanese. And she hopes that by using this name, people will mistake her for a kami of fortune instead of a kami of misfortune and maybe not try to run her away. Next is Tenjin. Tenjin was a real person. He looks really similar to his traditional depiction. His actual name was Michizane, and he lived during the 9th century. He was a scholar, a poet, and a politician. But he fell victim to some dirty politics, so they fired him, exiled him, and he died in exile. Soon after his death, a huge storm came and devastated the capital. It caused a lot of fires, it destroyed the homes of his political rivals, it killed some of his political rivals, and the imperial court went, Oh my god, Michizane's ghost must be pissed. And in order to placate his spirit, they restored his family's former status, burned his order of exile, and deified him. And he is now the Kami of Learning. He is one of the most popular gods in Japan. That's one of his shrines in Tokyo. Very big, very pretty. And students will go to his shrines to pray for good grades. That's a very common thing to do if you have a big test coming up. So in the show, Tenjin knows he's a big deal and he's kind of full of himself. In that screen cap, you can see all these wooden blocks behind him. Those are Emma. They're these wooden talismans that you can write your wishes on and then leave them at the shrine to hopefully have them granted. Those are some Emma from a Tenjin shrine in the bottom right photo. They have bulls on them because he is also associated with bulls. But we can see that Tenjin got off really good in the afterlife, which kind of begs the question of, well, what about everyone else? So Shinto is not very specific when it comes to the afterlife, but essentially when you die, your soul is a kami, and you become a kami that looks over your descendants. So there's ancestor worship in Shinto. It's common for homes to have this little shrine on a high shelf called a kamidana. It's dedicated to your ancestors, and you might leave little offerings there or decorate it for special times of the year. I have a picture of Yato's little shrine because it kind of looks like a kamidana. There are also funeral rites in Shinto, but no one even bothered to write them down until the 1800s. And considering how old Shinto is, that's kind of ridiculous. But something important about Japanese funerals is usually that the dead are buried or cremated in these white robes. So if you're ever wearing a kimono or a yukata, you want to make sure that you do left over right, because right over left is reserved for dead people. Um, I recently came up with a personal mnemonic to help remember this, uh, where left over right, tie your obi tight, right over left, you'll be left for dead. 
Uh, I don't know how useful that might be to other people, but that's what I've been using. So as soon as we see the characters of Yukine and Nora on screen, we immediately know that they are dead because of how they are dressed. Nora has this interesting triangle headband. We don't actually know what those are, but we know that they were popular during the Heian period and that they show up a lot in art of ghosts, mostly from that period. There's theories that they were meant to ward off evil spirits and stuff like that, but what this is supposed to tell us about Nora's character is that she's probably been dead for a long time, so it kind of adds to her mystery. Then we have Tokoyo, the far shore, literally meaning eternalness, forever unchanging. This is the distant land across the sea, and it is the world of the dead. And in Noragami, this is where spirits can dwell and become corrupted and become phantoms. So in the Japanese, phantoms are referred to as ayakashi. Ayakashi has three meanings. The first is that it's a type of ghostly monster, or yokai. Um, it's also used to describe any supernatural phenomenon that is related to the sea, and it's also a mask in no. No is a type of traditional Japanese theater where all the characters wear specific types of masks. And an ayakashi is the mask for a male ghost or wrathful god. It's that terrifying picture in the top right. Masks are also kind of important in Shinto in general. People wear them for fun during festivals, but they also wear them for rituals. That red mask with the long nose is a tengu mask. Tengu are believed to be the servants of gods. So sometimes when there's a procession, someone might dress up as a tengu and help lead it and wear a mask like the one in the photo. So in Noragami, phantoms are these ghostly monsters from the far shore, so they're related to the sea, and you can control them with masks, and they're very wrathful and scary. So Noragami is playing off of all these different ideas that surround the word ayakashi. Shrines are a huge component of Shintoism, so if you want to go to a shrine, you're probably going to ask for some good luck, or maybe you have a wish you want to be granted, or maybe you're just going because it's New Year's and everyone else is going. But if you want to go to a shrine, you probably first have to pass through a tori. A tori is a big arch and it's meant to act as a gateway that marks where you enter into the territory of a kami. Yato, of course, wants a really big fancy one. That one in the upper right is Japan's most famous tori. It's really big, it's in water, you have to use a boat to go through it. But not all tori are fancy, especially if you go out into the countryside. A lot of them are simple, they aren't even painted red, so they come in a lot of shapes and sizes. You might also see shide hanging off of them, those zigzag white pieces of paper. They are there to mark the presence of a kami. So once you pass through the tori, you still can't go up to the shrine. First you want to clean your hands and mouth. There's going to be some sort of fountain or trough that has fresh water in it and a wooden ladle so you can clean your hands and mouth before approaching the shrine. Purifying with water comes up a lot in Shinto. We see it in Noragami where Yato uses it to help cure his blight. So you can finally go up to the shrine and you're probably going to want to give an offering. You are essentially bribing the kami to grant your wishes. Common offerings are food, alcohol, or money. The traditional offering is a 5 yen coin. And 5 yen is nothing. It's about 4 cents, give or take, whatever the current exchange rate is. But the reason that 5 yen is the traditional offering is because 5 yen in Japanese, goen, is a homophone with goen as in the word for fate. So when you give a kami a 5 yen coin, you are symbolically placing your fate in that kami's hands. You're saying that you trust them with your fate 
And that's why Yato is so happy when someone gives him a 5 yen coin, because it means that people trust him and are showing their respect to him. So you will approach an offering box, put your coin in, there might be a bell attached with a rope above it, you can ring the bell to get the kami's attention, and then you can pray. And the standard way of praying in Shinto is bow twice, clap twice, pray, and then bow again when you're done. This method became standard during state Shinto, and before that there were a bunch of local variations. Shrines are not just buildings, there's the mikoshi, the portable shrine that people carry around during festivals, and I already mentioned the kamidana, the small shrine in your home, so that's something else that comes in a lot of shapes and sizes. So you visited the shrine, and while you were there, you might have seen a shimenawa, which is a rope meant to enclose a sacred space and protect it. We see one of these around Robo's tree. You see them a lot around trees. They can be very small, like the photo on the left with the stump, or very big to give you an idea of scale. Look in the lower right corner. That is a person posing under a very famous shimenawa at a shrine in Izumo. You also might see a miko, or a shrine maiden. Yato wants to have lots of miko to pamper him and take care of all of his needs, but miko do not serve the gods quite that directly. They essentially do odd jobs around the shrine. They help keep it clean. They also help with rituals, most notable the kagura dance, which is a dance with a bell instrument that has a ribbon attached to it. That top middle photo, you can see some Miko practicing the Kagura dance. You see Miko in anime all the time, but they are not actually the ones in charge. The ones in charge are the Kanushi, or Shinto priests. You don't see these in anime very often, presumably because they are not cute girls. Like, there's Rei's grandpa in Sailor Moon, and that's kind of it. But they are the ones running the show, they are the ones operating the shrine and leading the rituals. So you might want to get a souvenir from the shrine, like a lucky charm. Larger shrines will have things for sale, like omamori, which are these little satchels, and you can buy them for all kinds of good luck in school or career or love. Uh, I already mentioned Emma. You can pretty much write whatever you want on Emma or draw whatever, so it's actually pretty common to see anime characters on them. And some shrines totally embrace this. Uh, one example, there's a shrine that gets a lot of tourism because of the anime Anohana. So they have these pre-made Anohana Emma that you can get. You might also want to get a fortune, especially if it's New Year's. So from what I've read, this can vary depending on where you are. Sometimes they'll have a certain tree or a big fence that you can tie your fortune to, and depending on local tradition, you might get a good fortune and you want to tie it to let the kami know that you approve of it. Uh, you might get a bad fortune and tie it because you don't want to take it with you, you want to leave it at the shrine, uh, and sometimes you just tie it no matter what, so this can vary. Yato loves all sorts of lucky charms, whether they work or not. And a big theme in Shinto overall is just repetition and routine. So whether or not you passed your last test, you might still be going to the Tenjin Shrine to pray every time. Or whether or not your fortune from last year was accurate, you're still going to get another one every New Year's. Uh, Shinto is not really about faith in the same way that other religions are, as much as it's about honoring tradition, and leaving your fate up to your local kami, whatever that may be. Thanks for watching, I hope you learned something. Again, I'm Otuple on YouTube, um, or Otuple one half on Twitter, and uh, yeah, have a good OnCon! And we are back! 
that was Noragami. This is the panelist behind the Noragami panel. I uh, want to introduce yourself. That is awesome. And uh, folks in the chat, let us know. Oh, uh, we are having audio issues, so one second. Always something, you know. Um, so we will double check. That is coming in. That should be fine. Um, let us try something, and we will get there. So we need a probably. Uh, we'll try that. Um, Doop, doop. Uh, whoops, that's not going to work. Hold on. Um, we will try this instead. Uh, and we will pull that from there. We'll see if that works. Uh, All right, we'll see if that works. Um, all right, uh, give us a try there on audio. That doesn't. It doesn't look like that's coming. That's working either. So give me just a minute. Sorry. Yep. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, Skype is apparently coming in on a different audio channel. So I've just got to figure out a way of grabbing that. So always a little something unusual. Um, could we do? It's interesting. Normally there is another. Well, we'll try this one. Boop. And then we will use um, that might be it, and transition over to that. Um, all right, let's give that a try. Ah, still nothing. This is really annoying. Oh dang, I hate when this happens. Um, oh, maybe I need to hold on. Uh, that that could be it. Yeah, different thing. Um, transition over there. Ah, that might be a little bit better. Um, give that a try. Okay, so can you hear me now? Is it working yet? That looks like it's working. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, quick reintroduction. Uh, hi, I'm Mary Minton. Uh, and yeah, I've been trying to make more anime stuff for uh, YouTube and videos and stuff of late. Yeah, uh, and doing a great job of it. Um, um, so, Noragami, I know, is an anime that's uh, near and dear to you. Um, um, one of the things that always interests me about like religion in anime is how how it's presented because sometimes it's kind of you know it's there but it's not meant to be realistic. Sometimes it's meant to be realistic but it's not really there. Um, and it seems to me that Noragami like like manages to to walk that line really well. Where Shinto is obviously a, a really important part of it, um, but you also recognize that there's a, a certain you know shonen-y aspect to uh, uh to the anime is, is that reasonably accurate uh yeah i mean it's ultimately an urban fantasy it's kind mm -hmm. of you know how um are these ancient gods supposed to operate uh with modern society the way that it is um and kind of uh with the whole premise that uh you know yato was this god that was really important back in the day for certain reasons um and now he's not because uh, just life in Japan has changed, society has changed. Um, and yeah, so it's um, kind of a nice mix of, you know, visuals and actions, but also incorporating all of this, you know, ancient folklore. It's an interesting point you brought up because I know folks have talked a lot about how um, uh, modern Japanese people um, aren't religious. Um, um, but there's still a lot of ritual in modern Japanese society. How much, of, how much do they like touch on that specifically in the show, the idea that people are still kind of going through the motions, if you will, but how much like faith is there? Um, I mean, I think it's sort of um, is what I tried to touch on in the presentation yeah. where uh, like you don't really think of it as like faith in the sense of mm -hmm. like 
belief and like you know going to church every sunday it's yeah. just kind of this thing that's like there mm-hmm. in japan i mean there's like a shrine on every corner yeah. um and you know it's not just uh religious things that are rituals i mean there's all these little rituals cool. in japanese culture every day making sure to you know take your shoes off when you're inside doing mm-hmm. um you know your little greetings and aisatsu every day um where there's all these little like micro rituals in Japanese culture. And that's kind of because um, of how Shinto is practiced as well. Um, And so people say they're not religious, but it's like, you know, they had a coming of age ceremony. They, you know, are going to shrines on a regular basis. They're, you know, visiting their family for Oban. Um, And so it's, sort of interesting where uh it's just a different type of faith yeah. like um where it's it's like there but it's not because it's just so omnipresent that mm. you almost don't notice it gotcha that's interesting and that also tracks with the representations i've seen of it in like historical movies and so forth and so on where shinto even in the edo period was just a thing you did um you know and obviously there was there was a perhaps a stronger belief in the supernatural aspects of it. Um, or, or I guess a, a stronger, like, direct day-to-day belief. Um, yeah. But, uh, but but still, it was kind of this, like you said, this background ritual kind of thing that, that, that happened. Um, what are, uh, are there other anime featuring Shinto that you um, particularly like or find particularly um, remarkable? Uh, absolutely. So I actually have a lot of recommendations. Okay. Yeah, um, nice. So I, I have four anime and two games. Cool. Okay. Uh, so uh, first, uh, you know, a lot of people have already seen this, but My Neighbor Totoro. Oh, um, yeah. Because huh. I think it's so interesting to rewatch and going into it with uh, kind of the idea of this is a story about kids that get to meet a kami. Um, because you have Totoro's tree and it has the Shiminawa around it Um, and it's kind of, they move to this new town and the, you know, local Kami essentially like greets them Mm -hmm. and so I think it's so charming to re-watch Totoro kind of with that in mind and also a lot of people still haven't seen it Um, Yeah, that's true So if you haven't seen it, like that's another good excuse to watch (laughs) it Um Another one that I really love is uh, Kamisama Kiss. That's also, uh, the manga is also quite good. Um, and it's a reverse harem anime, but it's about a girl that um, the local land god has gone missing. And so she gets recruited to be in oh. his place. And she gets like uh, all these fun, uh, like, little servants and like uh has all this hijinks with local yokai and stuff nice um and yeah that that's a really fun one and if you like uh they even have like some ovas that uh animate like the ending of the manga and stuff and it's it's like it's just like a good satisfying watch nice um there's also um inari konkon which i always like kind of describe as like it's Himitsu no Akko-chan meets Kitsune Magic okay. um, where it's like she she gets these like Kitsune uh, transformative powers and it's like a little magical girl-ish, not really, it's kind of more about her putting on these disguises mm. um, and the hijinks with that um, but it, you get all these beautiful shots of mm. like um, the local Inari shrine, and uh, yeah, it's just um, it's just a really nice uh, put together show. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I also uh, really like uh, Matoy the Sacred Slayer, which is like mm. a semi recent, pretty obscure uh, magical girl anime uh, that is not the best writing wise, uh, but it's Shinto themed, where the main character. Her powers, uh, she basically just like calls on the power of the kami that are near her. Mm. And because the idea is that kami are everywhere, she just starts pulling uh, like these beams of light from like vending machines and grass and all the nearby (laughs) buildings and the pavement. And so she ends up incredibly overpowered. Um, 
because just it's that same idea of like kami are everywhere mm. um it has like a really bad uh death flag in it <laughs> and like um it's got a lot of fan service mm. but it's also like it's it's just so unique mm. Mm. um that you know i like it stands out in my mind yeah. for like what it's trying to do <laughs> um cool yeah, and then uh, game wise, uh, I'd always recommend people like Persona Four just in general. Mm -hmm. um, the Persona series is so like mainstream at this point because yeah. like everybody's played Persona Five, uh, and Persona Four uh, is finally on Steam, so mm -hmm. like more accessible than ever. Um, but yeah, I always pitch it to people saying like it's like Pokemon because <laughs> like you uh, have like your your little guys. And, and you're fighting and it's turn-based. Um, but, like, your starter is Izanagi. Mm. So I, I always recommend it to people that are interested in, like, Japanese mythology and mythology in general because it, it is mythology from everywhere cool. incorporated into it. But Persona 4 specifically is, like, Japanese mythology themed. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, and then the other game is uh, one that I only actually found out about recently uh, called Okami, and it's you play as a uh, Amaterasu in the form of a wolf. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of this. Yeah, and it's uh, it's very Zelda-like. It's very, uh, you know, you go around and talk to everybody and you solve uh, their little problems and you do puzzles and dungeons. Um, but there's so much Japanese fol folklore, like, just packed into it. Um, and, yeah, and it's, uh, it's like, a really... Uh, fun, like even just to to watch someone play it, it's uh, just a really nice game. That is really cool. Um, cool. Is there anything else that kind of came to your mind after doing the? I know every time I do a panel afterwards, I'm like, ah, I forgot to mention this one thing. Anything like like that that's kind of on your mind? Uh, actually, yeah. So um, later in uh, the anime, uh, there's uh, Tenjin has like uh, if you. I remember like the first time I watched it, I think I just assumed it was like one of his regalia or something. Mm. Um, but then I looked it up. Uh, he has this special like plum tree lady that okay. helps him out. Um, and that's kind of a side story to his exile where he had this oh, favorite yeah. plum tree that supposedly uprooted itself and flew to where he was in exile in order to be with him. Mm. And of course, there's a Tenjin shrine with the actual plum tree that supposedly flew there. Wow. Um, and like, you can see it in everything. Um, and so I thought that was sort of nice that they um, incorporated that as well. That is really cool. Cool. Well, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. And uh, hope to um, see more panels from you at future OnCons. Yeah, um, sounds good. Where can people find you? Oh, yeah. So uh, my Twitter is otuple one half. Um, my YouTube is just otuple. You can also just type in um, hypnosis mic into the YouTube search, and my most popular video will probably hey. pop up. <laughs> um, and yeah. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so uh, have a good weekend. Cool. All right, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to switch over to um, to some um, uh, other stuff. We've got another panel coming up at 5 p.m. See you all there. All right. Hey guys, today we are at the Arena Tanimura Cafe, and this is the single cafe that I'm the most excited for. Arena Tanimura is a popular shoujo mangaka, and I've really just loved her series for years. I started off with Full Moon, it was my first shoujo manga, so really excited to be here. So this cafe is surprisingly in a lot of cities in Japan, including Sendai, which almost never happens. So. Man, I'm so excited that they decided to put a really cool cafe in Sendai that usually does not happen. Anyway, let's take a look at the menu. It has um, an original Irina Tanimura artwork on here that I think she actually did especially for the cafe. So it has all of her 
basically bigger series on it, like Gentleman's Alliance Cross and Full Moon. So earlier I ate lunch. I specifically wanted to eat dessert here, and I have known that I want this item uh, for a while now, so I'm going to get the uh, chocolate bread whipped cream kiwi and strawberry looking dessert. It looks very cute and very yummy. You can also get other dishes for either lunch or dinner, um, some of which are inspired by her different manga works. This one being my favorite based off of Full Moon as the Tushinigami, it's the Negi Ramen. So cute. The cat curry is also very cute. Looks like they uh, make rice in the shape of a cat. I have Alan here with me today. Okay, he's gonna get the ice cream and pancake set, which looks like maybe it's a Kamikaze Kartajan one, so there you go. Yeah, that is because of the wings. So the one really confusing thing is usually at these cafes when you order a menu item and a drink, you usually get a coaster. They asked us which coaster we wanted beforehand, which was actually really surprising. Usually they don't ask you which one you want. I kind of wish it would have kept it that way because they've been asking which ones people wanted. So unfortunately the full moon one is sold out and the Jean one is sold out which makes sense, those are her two more popular series. So people must have just come in here uh, as soon as the cafe opened and bought them all out. But that's okay, I ended up getting the Eon one because that's another series that I read when I was younger. The only one that I don't see down here, um, which is an Arena Tanimura series that I've read is Mistress Fortune and 31 Idol. I don't see them down here, maybe because they're not as popular. Mr. Fortune was only one volume, um, but 31 Idol is, I think, still going on. So I'm not sure why they don't have those, but this seems to be her newer series. All right, so we just put our order in for one of these, one of these, and one of these, and one of these. we got our drinks. This is the Full Moon inspired drink and that is the Kamikaze Kaito Jean inspired drink. I'm gonna give this a sip and you give yours a sip. Yeah, I really like that. Mine is like a, a lemon drink. I'm not sure what's at the bottom to make it darker, but there's little stars, little star pieces. Maybe they're like little jellies. I'm sure I'll get there, but this is really good. It's nice and refreshing. So the Kamikaze Kaito Jean drink is an apple blend drink with little chunks of apples in it. As soon as I got the drink, they brought us our desserts. So I'm gonna dig in for a bit and I will let you know how it is. This looks like some kind of strawberry or soccer cream um, with some fruit and of course the bread with chocolate in it. And then Alan got pancakes with ice cream and some fruit with it as well. So we will let you know how it is. So starting with Alan's meal, he said that the pancakes were actually super high quality, very warm and fluffy, and a really nice uh, butter and syrup to go with them, and that the ice cream just basically tops off the whole dish. As for mine, I've dug in a little bit. Uh, you can see that there's chocolate all the way through uh, this bread piece, and then they also give you some bread pieces on the side, I guess, to dip in. I just think chocolate pairs so well with strawberries, so I'm very happy. I was also thinking that there was a chance this could be a strawberry whipped cream instead of a sakura. And it's sakura and I couldn't be happier because I love sakura flavored things so much. The little heart sprinkles just make it. If that's not Arena Tanimura, I don't know what is. And I can't get enough of this drink. This is actually really good. It's just very soothing. So we're gonna flip over our coasters. Now when we first came in, as I said, they told us that we needed to just pick one, so I don't know if they're all uh, Eon or if they're different, so let's find out. We have one Eon. <gasps> I'm gonna freaking cry. <laughs> they said this one was sold out and this is the one that I wanted. I guess you just weren't allowed to pick it. Maybe I wasn't. Maybe, I was, maybe you pick one for coming in. And then you're gonna, I am gonna literally cry. I'm 
so happy. <laughs> this is, guys, this is like my first shoujo manga I ever read. I still have the same volume one that I've had since I was probably 14. Oh my gosh, that's so great. Okay, let's see what else. Time Stranger Kyoko. This is a series that I haven't dug too much into, but I really, really want to. Oh yes, and this is her new series. I am super happy with all these. We all got different ones. Uh, we got Eon, Full Moon, Time Stranger Kyoko, and I actually don't know the name of this one. There you have it. <laughs> oh my god. I'm just gonna have to frame this one, aren't I? I cannot believe I actually got this one. I came in really disappointed thinking that they were out of them. All right, well, excuse my used plate, but we both ate uh, every single bite of our meals. They were both really, really delicious. And at the bottom of my drink, that purple you saw, that was actually all jello. It was like a grape jello. It was really, really good. guys, so this is the official shop for the Arena Tanimura Cafe. You can get stands of your favorite characters. I am not sure why they're missing some characters. I'm going to take these barcodes up to the front because I really want Mitsuki and I want Maroko from Full Moon. So we're gonna cross our fingers that we can get those. These over here are actually cookies. It's a little plastic tin of cookies with characters printed on them. That's really cute. And of course over here you've got buttons from some of her bigger manga. And over here we have little plastic plates, kind of like key holders, um, but you have to get a random one. And as you can see, there are all kinds of them here. Not only those, but these two. So you have no idea what you're gonna get. These are 800 yen, but I think I'm definitely going to get some of the character stands. And they also seem to be what they call clear portraits, I believe. guys, well there you have it, the Arena Tanimura Cafe. Unfortunately, it only went on for three weeks, so I could only catch one date for it. They actually give you a stamp card for every time you visit, or for however many items that you buy. And at your third stamp, when you come back, you can actually get a free item. But since we got four items, we were able to get a free item. Those free items were sold out. However, they're letting us come back before the end of the month when they restock and get more, including the stands that I bought. I bought two full moon character stands, but they were not on display because they were actually sold out. Um, but you could go ahead and pay for them now and then you can pick them up uh, next month. So I decided to do that. I hope you guys enjoyed the video and please stay tuned for more anime cafes. Check out one of these around me and I will play with you some other time. What's up? I am in Sapporo, Japan right now for the snow festival. I've been in Sapporo for about 24-ish hours now. This is my first time at the snow festival, so pretty stoked to see what we can find. It's nice because... Ooh, <laughs> it's nice because they let you actually walk on the street. They block off all the cars so that this is basically a walking way for the ice sculptures. So I think here behind me, they're actually fixing snow sculptures that may have either melted a little bit or had some chips fall off of it. I love anything that's a character. This is Doraemon, probably one of the most popular manga and anime for kids in Japan. He's my favorite so far. 
very cute. It looks like a lot of this road is characters, and I think a lot of these are specifically Hokkaido characters. Mitsubachi, the honeybee. <laughs> Hokkaido has so many characters, maybe because Hokkaido is so, you know, so big, it's the biggest prefecture. Oh, look at the little horse. <laughs> That looks so fun. So I started actually pretty far back of the line. So this is kind of like the very back section of the ice sculpture area. Behind me here, there's nothing else. So I'm gonna go up back where I came and go the other way, see what's over there. So this structure is pretty neat. Obviously all made of ice. Inside you can kind of see the uh, alcohol that they serve as well. But the coolest thing though is that even inside the tables are made of ice. All right, you know what? I made my way back over here because I want to get this one. It's piping hot. Yeah, that's so good. It's so perfect on a day like today. starting to snow again guys as soon as I'm starting to walk back to my place so that's just like half of the experience right tomorrow we're gonna go take a look at the actual snow sculptures but I am freezing my hands are so cold but I have one more thing I want to show you guys as a before bedtime snack kind of thing all right I got a little snack before um, I head off to take a shower and go to bed. Hmm, what could it be? It's something that I've been looking for all day and haven't been able to find until now. It is a cinnamon roll bun. Like, cinnamon roll the Sakurio character who I absolutely love. And I've been to like three other Lawson's today in Sapporo and they didn't have it until the very last Lawson's I checked. <laughs> I didn't get any filling. I bit his eyeball out. All right, guys, I'm off to bed. I will see you in the morning. All right, good morning, guys. It's about 10 a.m. right now. I'm trying to figure out what I want to eat. I am very hungry. I really want to get Sapporo ramen while I'm here because so far it's my favorite ramen that I've tried in Japan. But uh, the ramen place doesn't open until 11.30, so I have an hour and a half to kill. So maybe I will go to Don Quixote to find some souvenir stuff. And probably after that, ramen hopefully will be open soon. Last night, it must have snowed a lot because, well, the <laughs> cars are covered in snow too, but the ice sculptures are now covered in snow. So yeah, last night they were, they were clear of it. So I wonder how they clear them off. So right now I'm at Don Quixote and they always have, whoa, someone destroyed something. They always have three pairs of socks for uh, just under a thousand yen. So I am going to get this pair of Sonic socks and I'm tempted to get the Charmander ones. I have these Mew ones. Oh, they have more Sonic ones. Okay, I gotta get these. Always gotta get the Sonic ones. Oh my God, they have another pair of Sonic ones. Oh, and it's modern Sonic. Okay, I got three pairs of Sonic socks it is. Oh, it's really snowing now, guys. This spot right here between Tanuki Koji and the fish market, best place to take pictures, especially when it's snowing. The lighting's really good. And plus you can get the Sapporo TV tower in the background. All right, for real now though, no more getting distracted. Some dude just looked at me weird because I'm talking to my camera. Man, why can't it snow like this in Sendai? Just like this would be wonderful. Alright guys, made it into a little dainty little ramen place. We'll try it out. That was great. Let's uh, let's keep on moving. Now we're going to head to uh, the snow sculptures. Hopefully that ramen can keep me warm for now. Oishi tono no. If you're not aware, um, the Ainu are the indigenous people of Hokkaido and during this festival there's a lot of Ainu culture around. There's uh, a shop, a little museum, even um, I believe this is like 
Ainu traditional singing or music or something like that. So behind me is a snow sculpture from the anime Golden Kamui. Golden Kamui actually takes place in Hokkaido and it's about the Ainu people. I haven't had the chance to watch it, but it's something I really, really want to watch. I've seen Golden Kamui stuff everywhere here in Hokkaido. Ooh, I think I need one of those right there. Yep, I need that. And get. Hmm. Really, like, really cold. So far, this is my favorite one. This is from Oregairu. Just so cute. Ah, it's so well made. I love it. Look how like few people are here. It's crazy. The snow festival ends tomorrow, but today is Monday. It's a work day. Tomorrow's a holiday. So maybe that's why there's no one here. Everyone's at work. I was, I was thinking that this place is going to be packed shoulder to shoulder, but man, this is so nice. This ReZero one is probably my favorite because I'm a huge fan of the show. I think last year, um, even though I wasn't here, I saw pictures of a ReZero one, but this is a Hatsune Miku and ReZero crossover. At first I thought that this was Rem, but it's actually Miku. Here we have the My Hero Academia one. I think this one, I don't think My Hero Academia has had a snow sculpture before at the festival, so this is really cool. I'm really almost getting overwhelmed with how much there is to see. There's so much and so much food. Probably my favorite festival in Japan that I've been to so far. Oh my God, it's like a Tezuka one. This is all Tezuka works. The Astro Boy looks so cute. So well done. There's Mickey Mouse. Is this Anpanman? This one's super well done. The shapes are all perfect. It's just like, it radiates Anpanman. I love how like the water is coming out of the top of the whale. That is so cool. Teto, okay, so Teto, she's like a vocaloid, but like not at the same time a vocaloid. I won't go into it, but oh my God, how cute. Hikakin and Seikin. These are Japanese YouTubers. They're probably the most popular Japanese YouTubers. All the kids in Japan love them. Everyone knows who they are. So I just passed by a bunch of snow sculptures, but I will go back to them. I am just so cold. I want to go like, sit down and drink some coffee or something. I'm just so cold. So when you gotta call it, you gotta call it. I just ate the floor in Lawson's. What I mean by that is I completely fell all the way down. That was embarrassing. Anyway, back to the snow festival. goodness okay I might have a new favorite I just love that this year specifically there's been so much Kirby stuff in Japan I love it oh this is so cool he looks like he's been through a lot he's, he's, he's a little dirty and then right next to Kirby is this Dragon Quest one King Slime Dragon Quest is so popular here in Japan so no surprise to see this at all still that Kirby one though I cannot get over how much I love that we have Detective Pikachu! Not only do we have the other Pikachu from earlier, but the one from the Detective Pikachu movie looks quite sad. Actually, he looks very sad. That's a nice Pokeball, though. For you Ghibli fans, Kaonashi. So, I, I, I promise you, I'm not kidding you. I think in English it's literally No Face is his name. I don't know. I'm not the biggest Ghibli fan, so... Sometimes I don't know. I'm just going based off of what that says. So this area right here is the international snow sculptures. So for example, this one's from Hawaii in America. This one's from Indonesia. Here's the Finland one. And this one's from China. This one's also from America. This is apparently a sister city of Sapporo. And it's Portland. Here we go. So these are all of the uh, countries that participated in the contest. I see a Vulpix 
in the distance. I'm telling you guys, this festival is just so full of surprises every turn. Guys, they even have a Pokemon Center like in the middle of the park. And you can go in and buy Pokemon stuff so that you don't have to walk all the way to the station where the Pokemon Center is. How convenient. So while I'm walking this path, uh, it's just incredible how there's not many people here. Maybe because I'm catching the next last day and it's Monday, so it's a work day. Um, but yeah, it hasn't been too crowded. I've been actually really impressed. And honestly, like, at first I didn't think there was going to be this many snow sculptures but there's so much and I'm, I'm surprised like every time I turn a corner I see something that I hadn't seen and I walked through here a little bit yesterday and I just don't remember half of the stuff that I'm seeing now so honestly you know what yeah, like I need to go back around here so I can catch the uh the snow sculptures that are this way that I would have missed pray for Australia so this one is probably dedicated to Australia because of the uh recent fires there a little cute koala on the back. I am surprised and not surprised at the same time how many Pokemon statues there are. I mean, Pokemon is so popular it makes sense, but man, there's been one, two, three, at least four. Oh my gosh, I keep having new favorites. I just love Pokemon's Sword and Shield so much and all of the starters are perfect. All right, guys, I think I managed to see every single snow sculpture. I could have definitely missed some. There's so many and there's so much you can miss, but it is really starting to come down now. So I think now would be a good time to call it for dinner. Earlier, I did a paper survey for one of the Sapporo Snow Festival uh, workers and she recommended soup curry, which I've been meaning to eat for a while now. It's a Hokkaido specialty, and the last two times I've been in Hokkaido, I just didn't really uh, get a chance to ever go eat it, so I think now would be the perfect time. I'm guessing it's like curry, but more soupy and has vegetables maybe, so um, I don't know, but I have to go find a good place. I have no idea where I'm gonna go, but I guess I'll go walk around and see what I can find. That's the lessons over there that I fell completely in the floor end, so <laughs> never can go back in there. So if you remember from yesterday, um, I got a ticket to go up to the uh, Sapporo TV tower, and I got a ticket for day and night, and I'm pretty sure I can use that ticket again tonight to get a view of the city at night, so we're totally gonna do that after dinner. All right, I found this cozy little place called Oichi. Vegetables, pork, I ended up ordering the uh, pork hamburger steak soup curry. What a lovely thing to watch while eating. I'm in here completely alone. Gosh, I just thought every restaurant was gonna be packed. This is nice. We definitely have some peppers in here, um, an eggplant, potatoes, carrots, broccoli, like a sweet potato maybe? And then this is like pork hamburger right here. And then I got it with uh, some cheese as well. That's really great. That's actually sweeter than a normal curry. It's just, it, it's almost more flavorful, almost like it has more spices in it too. Guys, that place was super good. First time I had soup curry, I think it's perfect in weather like this. It's just nice and warm, so hopefully I will be warm as I'm going through this fairly heavy snow. I'm going to head back to the Sapporo TV tower so that we can get a good look of what the city looks like at night. All right, guys, let's go take a look. That's it. That's uh, my last night in Hokkaido. This is probably the most fun thing I've done in Japan so far. The food is good, the crowds aren't bad, all of the staff has been super nice throughout this whole event, and everything is like super easy to get to. Most things are free, like walking around looking at the scu uh, snow sculptures is free, uh, watching the ski show is free. The ice sculptures, looking at those are free. The only thing you really would have to pay for is obviously going up the tower and uh, the food. I hate it, that it has to be over. I planned this so quickly, like I didn't even know I was gonna do it until maybe three weeks out. So I'm, I'm already gonna start planning for next year. All right guys, and with that, it's over and done and I will play with you some other time. See ya.
Hey guys, this weekend is going to be super fun. Today's Thursday and today in Japan it's Umi no Hi or Ocean Day and then tomorrow is sports day. So this Thursday and Friday a lot of people have the day off so a lot of people just go and travel during this weekend. Fortunately in the prefecture that I live in the COVID cases has not been bad so that's good. So I feel like it's fairly safe to go out and travel as long as we're wearing masks. I've never been to Nito before outside of doing visa stuff so this time we're going for fun. Originally we were going to go somewhere like Nagoya or Fukuoka or Tokyo but of course with the way things are right now I think it's better to kind of like stay closer to home stay in my prefecture and go to smaller cities I have no idea what to expect this weekend but let's have some fun <laughs> all right guys we're gonna do something I've never done before we're gonna take the Hitachi train which is different than like the normal local trains. It's like more of a rapid service train. It costs extra to take it, but it'll get us to our destination a lot quicker and I've never taken it before, so it sounds super fun. We just got to check into our hotel. We're like right at the station, so I love the station plaza area. It's really nice. All right, let's go check in and then I guess we'll figure out what we're gonna do. Yeah, I made it to our hotel room and we have like the perfect view of the trains. I'm so excited. I love watching the trains. The best thing about this hotel room is that it is like literally connected to the station and below the hotel is like a shopping mall with arcades and stuff so you're literally just right here so if you ever come to Mito this is a really convenient place to stay all right we're at the arcade like right under our hotel let's see if we can find anything to win they already have rent a girlfriend stuff this anime is like airing this season and it's cringy but it's interesting they already have stuff out for it. I love this Ren. Oh, she looks so cool. Okay, I totally have to win this Megumin. Megumin is best girl from Konosuba. She looks pretty winnable. I think I think we can do it. Let's try, let's try. 500 yen coin, let's go. We got nowhere, but we still have four more towns. I'm going for a middle approach this time. That did not go very well. You gotta grab like halfway grab it. I'm feeling it. Alright, one more try. Alright, this is not the one. This is not the one. Straight, but it has to go back and up. You gotta know when to quit. You just gotta know when to quit. It's okay, we tried. We tried so hard. The Kirby is so cute and flat. I love the Sonic one, but I'm pretty sure I have a Sonic plushie just like that at home, so I don't know if I want to go for the Sonic. But it's nice to see that they have Sonic stuff. Now we're heading to a store called Dashinban. Dashinban, there's just a bunch of anime merchandise, plushies, keychains, and figures, my favorite. Let's see what we can find there. This is so cute. Hanamaru is from um, Love Live, but they always have this like thing where she has Sonic, and that's so cute, but I would not pay 500 yen for a folder, but it's still very cute. You know, I could just buy a Megumin figure <laughs> instead of trying to win it a million times. <laughs> There's Nagisa as an android. I already have her favorite series. Check out the uh, Steins Gate girls in the cheerleader outfits. Yeah. Isn't that cute? Are they ever in the cheerleader outfits in the game? No. no? They have Ferris Nyan Nyan. She's 10 bucks. That's like super cheap. I've seen so many Full Metal Alchemist figures lately. It's actually interesting. Like out of nowhere. One day I want to get the whole set of the k -On girls. Oh wow, from Your Lie in April. This is actually a pretty expensive figure. Around like 150 US dollars for her. The Azunyan is cute. See, these would be cute, but I want them to have their uh, instruments. I think it'd be cool to have a set and it would look like they're playing instruments. Oh, they have the Zombieland Saga girls. Zombieland Saga is so funny. I can't wait for the second season. These figures are really nice too. They're like super nicely made. Is this from Slayers? It sure is from Slayers, wow.
Alan just went back to the hotel to take some of the stuff that we bought at Rashenbang up to the hotel. Later, when we're back in the hotel room, we'll show you what we bought. So if you ever come to Mito and want to do some like anime and weeby things, there's a Sega arcade near the station, there's an anime near the station, there's a Rashenbang near the station, so you could probably spend a good half a day shopping around those areas for stuff. I wouldn't say that it's worth the trip from Tokyo to come here because there's, the shops are really small, but if you're ever just in the area and you want to kind of like get out of the crowds of Tokyo, then yeah, there's definitely some anime shopping here to do. Gosh, we found another arcade on the way to dinner, so gotta stop by. This one is way less busy than the Sega one, and I am all for that. But maybe they don't have as cool stuff. Oh, I do love the sleeping piplip. The Inosuke plushes are cool. Okay, not as many cool stuff as this one, so back to dinner plans. Hi guys, we finally decided on where to eat. We're gonna have yakiniku, one of my favorite things to eat in Japan. Alan's currently figuring out what's on the menu via the tablet, and they bring as much food as you order um, for the next 90 minutes, so fun stuff. These are the sauces. You've got like a sweeter sauce, you've got lemon, and uh, this is like a spicier sauce. I kind of like burn all of mine on purpose. I kind of like that charcoal-y taste. So don't judge me for literally overcooking or burning all of my meat. Put one of these on too. we just finished dinner and came back to our hotel room. I want to show you guys what we bought at Bashinbang earlier. I bought <laughs> Tom Nook! It's a little Tom Nook stuffed animal and it's so cute. I'm gonna, uh, let me open it up. <laughs> He's so cute. <laughs> Look at this little... <laughs> I love him. He was like 2,000 yen, so about 20 US dollars. And I thought it was totally worth $20 because my house, I already have like some Nintendo-y uh, Animal Crossing specifically stuff in my house, like a pillowcase and uh, a blanket and stuff in my living room. So this will go so cute in there. Okay, Alan, what did you buy at the store? I got this Wano Kingdom Luffy figure. Wow. For only 500 yen. Wow. Which is crazy. All right, guys, well, there you have it. There is our first day in the Mito area in northern Ibaraki. Tomorrow is going to be super fun. We plan on going to the beach and we're going to a town that is the setting for the Girls into Ponzer anime. You may know it. I hope to see you in the next video and I will play with you some other time. I guess we just kind of ah. Uh... It's so good. Hey guys, what's up? I am right outside of Sendai Station in a super prime area for shopping and food and stuff here in Sendai Japan. Today I wanted to show you guys the Jump Store. It's basically a store of Shonen Jump manga and anime merchandise. One just popped up in Sendai over the summer, so it's really fairly new. There's a lot of cool stuff there. Let's go check it out. Uh, dressed up as Santa because the day's actually Christmas Day. It's such a cute idea. I love these little things that they have. They're like little keychains, but they're the uh, cover of the actual manga. I think that's really cool. I don't know if you open them and they have the manga pages actually printed in there. I'm not sure. It seems like the really big thing at the Sendai one is Haikyuu, which totally makes sense because Haikyuu as a series takes place in Miyagi Prefecture in Sendai if you watch the show. A lot of the games take place in Sendai Stadium. They really went all out for Christmas here. Um, they have like little special bags. I guess whatever series is on it is stuff that you get inside of the bag. Like for My Hero Academia. So obviously One Piece is pretty popular in the States too, but it is nowhere near as popular there as it is in Japan. One Piece is just everywhere. Chopper is like the Mickey Mouse of Japan. I feel like in uh, the States or in the West, One Piece gets kind of made fun of. It's kind of like the casual show that you watch. It's a casual anime. But in Japan, you respect One Piece. I'll just say that much. 
Of course you have your Dragon Ball Z stuff. Um, that's kind of an obvious thing you have to have at the Shonen Jump shop as it's popular with uh, basically American fans, Japanese fans. So one of the biggest current things at the Shonen Jump store is My Hero Academia stuff, which as you know is like the newest shonen show that everyone's super super into right now. They call it the new Naruto, the new Dragon Ball, the new whatever. Some people aren't gonna like that I just called it the new Naruto, but hey, whatever. These are so cool. I always need some Germix and these are so cute. They have all the all of the, the bigger characters except for Ida. Ida's best. Where where's Ida? The cups are cute too. Those are adorable. Of their little costumes? Heck yeah! Oh, here we go. There's Ida. That's one of my favorite characters. One of my favorite features about the store is the uh, height chart. You can kind of compare your height to your favorite characters, and it's really cool. So I'm about the same height as... Uh, you're about the same height as Bakugo? No, you're about the same Todoroki. height as Todoroki. Okay. I'm the same height as Kirishima. Wow. I'm tall, I guess. On the other side, they have the heights for the One Piece characters. Look how tall Brooke is. He's all the way up there. I'm as tall as Usopp and you're as tall as Nami. Oh, am I? Oh, nice. Yeah. That's the same. It's the 170, so about where you were at. That's cool. Little chopper is so short. They let you compare height to high Q characters. You know, it's cool that they still have Bleach stuff. I know Bleach kind of ended in a fire and just burned and people basically stopped caring about it, but it's really cool that they still have Bleach stuff. I know that they recently had uh, the Bleach live action. So maybe some stuff is coming back. Um, I know that for a while in the States, it seems like no one was cosplaying Bleach, no one had Bleach merchandise, but recently I've seen a lot of Bleach merchandise here. I don't know if that has to do with the movie or what. And of course, it would not be the Shonen Jump Store without Naruto stuff. This is so cute! Okay, so we talked about the big three, but how about stuff in Shonen Jump that isn't talked about as much, like Slam Dunk? It is cool that they have a small section of Slam Dunk stuff. Just something that you don't hear about as often. This section seems to be an assortment of different random series for Shonen Jump. We've got some Yu-Gi-Oh! We've got Food Wars. There's more Food Wars down here. There's even Black Clover stuff. I don't think this is doing super well in the States, but I do know that Asta got put in uh, Jump Force the game, so maybe it'll pick up. But yeah, it is cool that they do have the Black Clover stuff. Oh, speaking of which, this whole section is Black Clover, actually. But then you just find like small stuff, like series that don't get talked about that much, like World Trigger. They have a couple of things from that. What I'm looking for is one of my favorite Shonen Jump mangas, which is Shaman King. Let's see if we can find some Shaman King stuff. They have a few D. Gray Man stuff. Um, I remember the anime was getting a reboot. I'm not sure how big that is now, but it is cool that they uh, have some D. Gray Man stuff. I'm spotting some uh, blue exorcist characters and some blue exorcist merch. Oh, uh, here we go. Prince of Tennis. <laughs> Who watched that when it aired along with Mare on uh, Cartoon Network? Yeah, you can't really find a lot of Prince of Tennis stuff at all in the States. This is really cool. This is like my first sports manga ever was Prince of Tennis, so I love seeing this stuff. Here we go. I feel like this is one series that uh, got people into re either reading manga or watching Shonen stuff. Yu Yu Hakusho, so they have a small section of that. The mugs are really nice. That's really creative. I like that a lot. And the prices aren't too bad for stuff like this. So uh, 1,500 yen, so a little less than $15 uh, for the mugs. Honestly, that's not too bad for something like this in a specialty store. <gasps> is this City Hunter? Oh boy. That is City Hunter, dang. I have a friend who is super into City Hunter who would love to have that. I don't know what they would do with it, but a uh, friend, if you're watching this video, I did think about you. <laughs> Here's the One Punch Man section for you guys into One Punch Man. Golden Kamui. Here's a, a I think this is a newer show that's um, currently airing that my friend is trying to get me to watch. I have not seen it yet, though. Here we have some Tokyo Ghoul merch. 
Along with all the merch, they have off to the side here a bunch of Gachapon, specifically Shonen Jump uh, Gachapon, like these My Hero Academia ones are really cute, Prince of Tennis ones. They even have Ultimate Muscle. Do you guys remember that show back in the day? Gosh, that was such a dumb show. And of course they have an entire setup just full of different manga from Shonen Jump. I still haven't found my Shaman King. Maybe it's just not popular at all anymore, which is so sad. It's definitely my favorite. Alright guys, that was the Shonen Jump Shop here in Sendai, Japan. It's in the Parko building right next to Sendai Station, so it's so it's so easy to find, it's so easy to get to, there's signs everywhere for it. Also fun fact, the Pokemon Center is literally the very next shop, so if you want to kill two birds with one stone, you should totally come here. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this peek into the Jump Shop. I will play with you some other time. Hello everyone, we are back. It is time for our last panel of the convention. Thank you all for sticking with us this whole time. Uh, we're gonna get Steve back in here to talk about uh, Magical Girl shows, right? Yeah, that's exactly what we're gonna yeah, do. Yeah, they have a, a, a full, complete history of Magical Girl, I believe. Is yes. The, the yes. for the next one. I kid. Um, <laughs> got some samurai coming at you here, if I recall correctly. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful um, Magical Girl Samurai. That's exactly <laughs> what we are Why doing. Why does that exist? I don't there's, know. There it, be it, one of it, those. it 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 sounds like it would work. You gotta yeah. call dibs on that because somebody right now is going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> samurai Magic Girls. Yes. Exactly. All right. Hello, hello, everybody. Um, let me get situated here at the uh, Starship Enterprise. Uh, uh, Thank you. All righty. I hope everyone had a great OnCon. It, uh, I had a fun time. I'm actually here in Brent's place, and it is quite magical, I have to tell you. Um, no, seriously, we had a great time today, and, and, um, and I hope you're having a good time as well. So... Let's go ahead and get started with talking about the samurai, how they went from being these great, wonderful warriors to sad, bloated sacks of bureaucracy. So, yes, that's essentially the history of, of the samurai right there. Um, so when we think of samurai, we think of um, basically a very stoic character. We think of a, a man who has a purpose, a mission, he is uh, very capable, he can, um, but reserved, uh, very action-oriented, kind of wise. So a very, very stoic kind of, kind of person. And this image is what we get whenever we think about samurai. And when we think about samurai, what, what country do we think of? We think of Japan. Now, that's by no mistake, obviously, but there's actually a propaganda reason for that. And the reason for that, and the reason why we get such characters in anime that are samurai, is because of this. And it has to do with the Meiji Restoration. So when the Meiji Restoration came in, and they wanted to modernize Japan in any way that they could. But they also did some things with the feudal system which caused the samurai to lose power. But to get the people of Japan to buy into what the government was doing, which is to provide... Um, like transportation, trains, to, to have new improvements in agriculture, to science, technology, and all that wonderful, fun stuff. They needed the people to buy into it because it was going to be a major project to, be, to take the people out of one form of government that they've been in for millennia and basically, in terms of time, overnight, put them in a new, new world to be able to compete with nations like the United States. Remember, in uh, 1853, Perry shows up. Admiral Perry, Commodore Perry shows up, he says, he delivers a note and says, hey, you're going to open your nation to us or else, basically. And they come to the conclusion that they're going to live in the world, they have to be in the world. But in order to get that, you have to buy the people. So what's something that 
what's what's an iconic image that the people can rally behind it that's that seems like a symbol of the um, of the power of the empire of the power of the emperor and the imperial court something that you can trust well everybody knows you can trust a samurai right so the Meiji government from the imperial court on down basically said okay well, we're going to capitalize the heck out of the samurai so they created a lot of myths around the samurai and in the idea of showing loyalty fealty um, you know which are virtues of a samurai and they wanted that from the people so they would not necessarily question when the government said um, we're gonna take your land so we can run a train through here and instead of them fighting against it like they've been doing for centuries they would say uh, okay maybe maybe this might be a good idea so they would use the samurai in, pro in propaganda to help them <coughs> sell being modern and it was kind of an interesting way of using the past to sell for the future so this is why when we watch anime we get the samurai that we get a very powerful man uh, a guy who is skilled smart wise loyal um, very very you know few and sparse with words um, knowledge of Buddhism you know just a the perfect guy that you want to, to follow never surrender never surrender yes a guy you want to <laughs> that's right so following a leader and this is what the samurai represented and the samurai represents the imperial court which represents the government so this is what they were selling so this is how we get anime characters and we get anime along the lines of uh like things like gintama afro samurai samurai shoplu or shampoo and a, and a little anime you might have heard of um uh, Rurouni kenshin have you guys heard of that you know i you know maybe you might have heard about that I'm not sure what do you think brian uh, no yeah 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 so 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 basically it was just an idea to sell and to to put it in the words of the history of nukaraya i'm sorry for my japanese i'm horrible my pronunciation is horrible um nukaraya kaiten wrote uh let's see here bushido or the code of shield race should be observed not only by the soldier in the battlefield but by every citizen in the struggle for existence if a person to be a person and not a beast, then he must be a samurai, brave, generous, upright, faithful, and manly, full of self-respect and self-confidence, at the same time full of spirit and self-sacrifice. This is what they were asking of the Japanese people. They wanted the Japanese people to say, you are samurai. Yes, you are. You might be a peasant. You might be in the mud, you know, planting rice, but you're a samurai and we need you. So this was the whole idea of, 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 of putting the myth out there. So getting people to, to, uh, to, to buy into the idea of being modern. So how did the samurai start? How did this cast start? Well, the samurai, when they first came into being, were not warriors. They were administrators. Uh, so basically what happened is that in, uh, was it 946? Or I'm sorry, 646, there's uh, these reforms called the takeout reforms. And the emperor Tenji instituted these yes tenji tenji uh instituted instituted these um these reforms and they wanted to style a better government for japan and they modeled it after the tang dynasty in china and the idea was that the emperor realized that he needed to buy he needed to have more better uh, have, have better control over the populace and way, the way he wanted to do that was create a better and <clears throat> more detailed feudal system. So going reaching down. So what's the best way to get people to tie, be tied to you is that you give them a position of authority, power, and a little bit of wealth. So you take it all the way down the chain to the people. Now in the Tang Dynasty, there is various levels of, of bureaucrats because the Tang Dynasty was so huge, there are very many levels of it. The Japanese didn't need that many. They needed only 12. So, you know, because, you know, not as big. And, but the, the, the ones that were the sixth rank and lower were called samurai. And samurai comes from the, um, let's see if I can find the word here, uh, subaru, which means to serve. So what would happen is that the imperial court would find somebody in your village. So, uh, yeah. So, so the emperor would find somebody in your village who had some type of ties to the imperial court, 
whether it be a blood relation, a marriage, some type of some type of connection where they can say the imperial court can say, "Hey, you, I'm going to choose you to administrate these lands for the local lord." While you are helping the local lord, you know, administrate his lands, you are going to also report back to the imperial court. So, it was, the guy was kind of put in a tough situation a little bit. He he would on day-to-day -day basis, would make sure that the farms are going, that the taxes are being collected, and things like that. And at the same time, he would do a report for the local Diamo and saying, hey, here's how things are going, maybe we can do these things better. And while he's giving that report, he's giving the same report to the emperor. So this way, you control the emperor, and the imperial court is able to control pretty much daily life. This would go on for, until about 1000 AD when the emperor at that time decided to go, I'm going to focus on making flower arrangements and um, maybe do a little bit of justice, you know, court justice kind of things. And, oh, I'm going to point this guy, call him a shogun, and he's going to run the day-to-day -day stuff. So the shogun at this point in time becomes the actual authority in Japan. The emperor becomes more or less a figurehead and of his own choice. So the samurai start um, reporting back to the shogun. Now here's the kicker. Up until this point, the local lords like to live well. And sometimes they have to fight battles. These things cost money. So what happens is that the local lord will go back to his lands and go to the farmers. Um, I need money, so I'm going to tax you. And often what happened would be that farmers would be taxed to the point where they would lose their lands and become basically unemployable and homeless. This caused peasant rebellions, at which point the samurai would be tasked to hire warriors to come in and quell the peasants, the peasant rebellions. Now, these were just like really small rebellions, you know, per lord. You, you know, it wasn't like a big national thing, but it would happen from time to time in various other places. And the imperial court would rely on the local nobles to take care of it because Japan really didn't have a standing army at that point. So the samurai would hire these guys to kill the ringleaders, kill whoever they needed to be killed, bring the peasants under control, at which point the local lord would turn around and say, you cost me a lot of money. I had to hire these guys to kill your family members, so um, we're going to raise taxes. So it's this continuous vicious, vicious cycle. Now keep in mind that the samurai, the administrators, are tied to these local areas. They're from that area. They know people. Some of them you know, have families there. And so these people would go back to the samurai and go, please, for the love of all that's holy, do something. You, this has got to stop. We cannot maintain this. We, we, if, if we do this for this guy who's greedy and just wants to, you know, eat rice cakes all day, I don't know. You, you know what? What? You know what are we supposed to do here? Please do something. You have the ear of the emperor. So the samurai turned around and said, "Okay, well, every time there's a rebellion, we're going to hire these warriors, right? How many of these warriors are actually local?" It turns out that a lot of them are. So the samurai says, "Well, I'm of this rank in in the bureaucracy." If I hire these warriors as part of my government crew, I can give them some money. I can give them a stipend. I can give them a rank. They will become officials of the imperial court. That means that they'll have authority. They'll be able to do things. So I'm going to make these warriors samurai. So they become, so now this is where you get the warrior component of being a samurai. So instead of being thugs and killing people for money, now they actually have status, which is almost as good as currency. And they're tasked to police what's going on around them. So as, as they're doing this, then the samurai turn around and go, okay, Lord, I know, I, you know, the, to the Lord of the, of the land, Diamo, and goes, look, you know that I am an official of the imperial court. That means not only am I here to assist you, but I also represent them. I also represent the people that you're taxing. So you're taxing way too much. You've got to stop. The Lord would turn around and say, huh, that's okay. I'll just hire some, uh, some thugs to go down there and kill you and all your friends. 
about that. I've hired them. They are now samurai. They belong to the imperial court. They are representing the emperor. If you attack them, you are attacking the emperor. Do you really want to do that? No. So what happened was then at that point, a more even balance came out of, of that in terms of taxation, in terms of ruling, and who has actual power sharing. Because these samurai are, are we're, we're doing a tech check to make sure that we, we, have, uh, we have full sound and video. Um, so to make sure um, that uh, everyone is behaving, you know, they send the reports back, the samurai send the reports back, but they don't send them back to the emperor, they send them back to the shogun. And this is important as well, because now the shogun has even more authority and more power within the imperial court. So now the power of the emperor is totally eclipsed. Not only that, but the re there's a reduction of power of the nobility within the imperial court. So now the shogun is calling all the shots. And he's able to say to, to the nobles saying, look, I have a bunch of samurai that are running the country right now, so they can't be here in Edo, you know, just because you want them to be here for six months out of the year, which, mean, which is basically a way to control people. So we're going to keep the samurai out there since I'm going to be here. Maybe we'll keep the higher ranking ones coming in about a couple months a year. The higher ranking samurai would come in, meet with, with the shogun, advance the agenda. So now the nobility is finding that they don't have as much power in the imperial court. They still have power. They still have legal authority. They, they still have all these things. But they aren't nearly, they don't have unlimited power. They can't just go up to somebody, kill him without some type of cause. And the samurai are there, almost like Jedi, just to keep the peace. And that's, and that's how they act, and that's how, that's how they move. So, as we go through the, through the history of this, this goes on for a couple hundred years. And uh, then the samurai start getting a little rowdy. And they realize that they have a lot of power. And having this power unchecked is a bad, is a bad idea. So the Shogun says, well, how do, we, how do we keep these guys in check? Well, we need to hold them accountable. We need to hold them accountable to law. So what kind of law do we give them? Well, we allow them to, to develop what's called a Bushido Code. So you've all heard of that. Now, Bushido Code is, there's not one single Bushido Code. It's actually many codes, uh, dozens of codes have propped up over the years uh, in Japan. Each, each one of them has three core concepts to them and then kind of like local traditions and laws that, that factor into it. So to control the samurai from top to bottom, they have to adhere to a code. And the three concepts of this code are um, pretty rigid and purposely so, to give the samurai balance um, and authority and to also give them temperance. So the first part of this is from a text called The Way of the Horse and the Bow. Or I'm sorry, The Way of the Bow and Horse. And this is basically a military manual. And what it does is, is it teaches you comportment for how you act on and off the battlefield. It's kind of like how we would look at today how an officer is supposed to act when he's not engaged in military functions and when he is engaged in military functions. So that's what that means. So it's, it, it's, it's, it's a way to make sure that they aren't just thugs with swords riding around. So there's an organization to it. There's a training to this. There's a respect to it. There's a loyalty. There's, there's definitely a hierarchy of command that has to be followed. Okay, so there's, there's the physical, the combat. The next part, the, the second um, um, core concept of this is, has more to do with justification of who they are, their faith. And Zen Buddhism is perfect for the samurai. So Zen Buddhism has a has a has an inter Buddhism in general has an interesting uh, philosophy of which is you don't kill people, you just don't, right? So at this point you're saying, well, how does the samurai do his job if he's not allowed to kill people? Well, that's where it kind of gets interesting because within Zen Buddhism, there is a uh, portion of it called the Amida Buddha, Amida. I'm sorry, the Amida Buddha. And the Amida Buddha is a kind of a shortcut for samurai. And basically, Amida says, look, we know that you're killing people. And we know that sometimes this has to happen. 
as long as you were doing this for the greater good, it's like if you're killing an evil person, we can take that into account. So that when you die, these are things that I will judge you by. And if you are killing for the sake of killing and you're just an awful person, you know, bad things aren't going to happen to you. If you're a good person and you're and you're just forced into the situation where you have to kill for uh, justice, uh, righteousness, uh, protection, these, these things matter, then when you die, I will take you into, the hope is that the samurai will be taken into by the Amida Buddha to his domain where he lives one more life, where everything he does is examined and scrutinized by the Amada Buddha. But the Amada Buddha also helps him along, helps guide him to make the right choices. So the samurai basically just say, okay, so as long as I do it for the right reasons and I do it effectively, not in a malicious, torturous way, then perhaps Amada will look upon me favorably and when I die, I might go to this domain, live one more life, and if I do well, then I'll go on to heaven. That is the hope of the samurai. Now, how this connects to, to Zen Buddhism is the idea that life and death are the same thing. You cannot have death without life. You cannot have life without death. And because samurai deal in death, they realize that Zen Buddhism basically allows them to be the harbingers of death. Like they, they, they are actually performing a service, a spiritual service almost. It's, it's kind of a weird way to say, oh, it's okay, I can kill these people because spiritually speaking, I, I have to beat out death because death is part of life. So it's, it's kind of a weird way and kind of twisted, uh, twisted logic there, but that's what it was the appeal. So that's your second core concept of the Bushido Code. The third core concept that you're gonna find anywhere has to do with Confucius. And the idea between, uh, behind Confucius philosophy, not religion, is that, again, if you are going to be a samurai warrior, you want people to follow you because you are representing the imperial court, you're representing the government, you want people to stand in line. Now, if you're just a thug with a sword or a pike or a bow and arrow or something of that nature, and you're just, that's, and you're just, you know, just muscle, basically, that's all people are going to see you as. And that's not what the samurai want to be. So Confucianism provides you refinement. In order to be a leader, you have to have an education. So this education talks about cultural education, it talks about literal education, reading, writing, arithmetic, uh, things of that nature. To be a samurai, you have to be literate. You have to be able to read Chinese philosophy, which is a very big deal, actually, because at this point in time in Japan, um, Chinese philosophy, thought, um, poetry, art, technology, government is highly valued by the Japanese. So to have these, um, so to be able to lead the people, you have to be able to be a good example. And to be a good example, you have to learn. You have to be literate, learn uh, to read and write. You have to do, be able to do certain ceremonies. This is where the tea ceremony comes up, the flower ceremony, the ekiban ceremony, where you, you, know, you bend the flowers and everything. That's actually, there's a reason behind that. It's supposed to teach you patience and, um, and, and just a, a, a solid state of mind. Also, what this does is that the Confucianism also tells you that you have to revere your ancestors. You have to have piety, you have to have uh, fidelity. Uh, not only to your wife, but also loyalty to your, to your, um, to your commander, to your lord, to the shogun, to the emperor. These are all very important things. If you don't have these things, then you're just a thug and you're not a leader. So these are the three core concepts that you have to have in a bushido code. Now, at this point, once you have those three concepts, you learn them and, and you get them. Then that's when you take into effect of local traditions, local laws, and things like that that can like uh, support or enhance those three core concepts. So once you become, once you learn all that, and you become a proper samurai, the question remains: How do you become a samurai? I mean, do you just get to go show up one day and you learn these three core concepts and that's it, and you, and you get to be a samurai? No. So they're 
basically three ways to get it. Generally speaking, three three ways to be a samurai. The first one is that you're born into a samurai family. So remember, these were originally imperial appointments. So then you have the ability to be born into and it's hereditary. So your sons or your son could be a samurai as well. So this is passed down from generation to generation to generation. And if you decide that at a certain point that you want your son to learn the ways of a warrior, which is most often a good idea, because if you're going to lead other warrior samurai, you should probably know a thing or two about how to wield a sword or a spear or a bow and arrow. So you often are either, if you come from a poor samurai family, you're taught by family members who are also samurai on how to be a samurai. And then once they feel that your education is complete, then they announce you as a samurai. If you're rich, then you send your son or sons to a samurai academy. These are actual academies that are all across the nation in schools where you go to learn um, basically, uh, you know, basics like um, Aikido, fencing, um, all these different things, um, as well as literature, poetry, learning how to read and write, how to administrate, how uh, tactics, all these different things. So you go to that, and normally you would go f until about somewhere between the age of 17 and 20, depending upon where you are in your skill level, and you take a test. And the test is different from academy to academy to academy. And the test determines whether or not you're, you have the skill set to be a proper samurai. You graduate from that academy, and then your status is considered. And if you come from, if your samurai uh, status has a higher rank, odds are you'll get that rank as well when your father retires or passes away. Uh, sometimes you start off at, at the bottom rung and you have to work your way up. Okay, so that's one way to get through it. You're born into the family. The other part of this is, of course, as you probably could tell, you need money. Okay, so sometimes the rich merchants or rich nobles would say, oh, I have a lot of money and maybe I can just buy an appointment to the academy and send my son or sons to this academy and have them become samurai. Perfectly legit but they still have to be able to pass the, t the exam that the, the academy presents. If they can pass the exam, they become a samurai. Now this is the point where the noble then sets, set, um, steps in and says, oh, hey, um, my son's not gonna be a low-ranking guy. He's gonna be a high-ranking guy, okay? So, so here we go. So there's a lot of nepotism in this, in, this, in this second part. Third part, which is sort of the more romantic version, which is you get the battlefield recommendation. So let's say you're some poor schmuck who gets recruited by the samurai to help fight in a battle and you carry a spear, you walk into battle and you do really well. You actually know what you're doing and you, you comport yourself well on the battlefield. You're, you don't look like a sadist. You look like you know, you know how to handle a spear. Uh, people follow you into battle, those kinds of things. The samurai or commander or officer of your unit might recognize that and go, you know what, this guy might make a good samurai. So you don't have to be that young. You can, you can actually be in your teens or your 20s and, and still get to be a samurai. So what they do is they come back after the battle, particularly if you once the battle is won, and you go to the commanding general or the noble and say, hey, this guy here did really well. You tell him about the guy's deeds, and you say, I petition him to become a samurai. At this point, if they agree with you, then they turn around and they say, okay, yes, you become basically what's an apprentice or a squire, if we're talking about, you know, if you're talking about knighthood, to another samurai who will coach you over a period of years and will determine whether or not you are a proper samurai. At which point you become a samurai, but you're, you start off at a little lower rank and you have to work your way up. So that's, those are basically the ways how to, to, become, how a, um, to become a samurai. Um, let me... What happens if you fail the exam? If you fail the exam, you don't die. So that's the question, is uh, what happens if you fail the exam? Um, if you fail the exam, you simply fail it. You can return to an academy after a certain amount of time. It depends on the rules of the academy. You can even go to a different academy. Um, the, the, the point is, is, that you, um, is, that, is that you train and someone has to approve you. So it could take years for you to become a samurai. As a matter of fact, Akira Kurosawa's uh, Samurai Trilogy shows this, shows how long it takes for an individual to become a samurai. It's a really good 
trio of movies. You should watch them. So, like, an uh, average day of a training of someone who, going, who goes to the academy to, to become a samurai, you wake up at 6.30 a.m., you go to the dojo, you, um, you, you, you do your abulations, you eat a, a sparse uh, breakfast, you uh, do some weapons training early in the morning, you do physical training in the morning, you do unarmed training in the morning, then you have another break for about a half hour, then you learn stuff, Chinese poetry, how to, how to write calligraphy, things like that. And then you end the day with a short physical regimen. And then you have to go home at 4.30 where you are expected for 4.30 to 5.30 to do your studies. From 5.30 to 6.30, you do your dinner. You, have, you eat your food. And from 6.30 to 7, that's your own time, whatever you want to do with those 30 minutes. And you go to bed at 7 o'clock at night. And then you repeat the process, and this can take a number of years. The samurai, the process of, if you, if you are a father and you want your son to be a samurai, the process starts at the age of three, where you give your son or sons um, basically wooden blades, practice blades, to beat each other with, basically. Get, yeah, the bokens. And to beat each other up until about the age of 10, when they are considered to be old enough to understand that a blade is a serious thing and that some of the richer families would give their, that son a, a, a sword to practice with, um, which I'm going to get into in the academies. This is important. When you have a blade, when you we learn how to use a blade, it's one thing to practice and swish in the air. It's one thing to practice on a dummy. It's another thing to parry or to practice with someone else when you're not actually being stabby or slashy. So to get so to build confidence in killing a person, because this is what being a samurai is all about, it's about death, they will take a local convict who's been executed. They will string him up, okay, kind of like this, and then the samurai classes fight amongst each other, you know, hand to hand, and the winners, the, the people who are still standing, get one or two cuts at the convict's corpse. So they're given a blade, a katana, and they're told, stab, then slash. So that they know what it feels like to stab somebody and what it feels like to slash at somebody. And the idea is that you want to be one of the first guys to do that because the corpse isn't as mutilated. So by the, when you get to the end of it, it just looks like a pig carcass. It doesn't look like a human anymore. So, you know, that's, it's, it's grim, but, you know, so is the business of death. So that's, that's kind of the thing. So... Let's talk about the, the, the heyday of the samurai. Oh, before I get into that, women. Were women samurai? They most certainly were. So they had, um, they were called, uh, let me see if I can get this right, onibogeshas. Onibogeshas. So these are women who were usually part of a court of a, of a noble a lord, and they demonstrate physical ability. And they're trained on a naganata. And they are trained by like a, 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 a man at arms kind of equivalent. Or another samurai would come in and, and train them on this particular weapon. On rare occasions, some women were allowed to wear a sword, a, a katana in their obi. Um, but that was, that was very rare. Most of the time, it was, it was naginata. These women were very fierce. They were very. They had every attribute of a male samurai. They 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 went through the court. They had the bushido code. They went through the physical regimen. So these were not women you wanted to take off. Okay, these are these are women who just they look nice in their kimonos and everything like that. But you take them off, and off the nagata comes off the wall, and you're in trouble because they know how to use it. Uh, there's a great myth uh, or story about how there was one last stand of the onagaisha where there was a hundred of them holding off opposing forces from getting inside the castle walls, 100 women against thousands, and they held for like, I think, half a day before they were wiped out. But it gives you the idea of, yes, women can be every bit of the samurai as, as men can. All right, so let's talk about the heyday of the samurai. The uh, Warring States period was very good to the samurai, much like the shinobi. Um, they get my notes here um, so basically from about 1300s to um, the early 1600s when the uh, warring states period ended the samurai had a really good run of it 
uh, they they were they were warriors. They had they had stipends. They had um, authority. They had power. They had political power uh, in Kyoto, and it, it was just a really good time for them. And to be a samurai meant you had employment, uh, you had purpose, and people respected you because you had to go through a lot, and you have to up, up, uh, hold yourself to a certain code of ethics and behavior. So samurai are very well thought of. And so when there's the Warring States period, they, of course, go into battle and they do their thing. Now, the average day of a samurai would be something where you would wake up in the morning, uh, you would meditate, uh, you know, on, on the day and on yourself and, and what it means to be samurai. You would go through weapons training. You would go through unarmed training, you know, how, how to fight hand to hand. Um, you would have a break. You would engage in some type of activity that is educational, calligraphy, you know, the, the, the whole, you know, flower arrangement, things of that nature. You would probably do some um, strategic, tactical education as well. And every other day, you would actually go out and take care of things. So you would actually be a, be a policeman on the beat if you were a lower-ranking samurai. If you were a higher-ranking samurai, you would actually, you know, basically do reporting to your to your lord or your commander. Um, as you, but then there were parts of the day where if you were a samurai who held land, you could be a farmer. Most samurai did not do that. They became artisans. So it's not unusual to see art and literature and things of that nature made by samurai. Uh, there's, a, there's a great anime, uh, Miss Hokkaido. Uh, no, it was uh, Hakusa. Hokusa. 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 Miss Hokusa, uh, which is the daughter of the artist Hokusa. And then there's a character in that anime where, he, where there's a, an assistant where she talks about he was a samurai, and I don't know why he's here, but he likes to draw and stuff. Well, that's something a samurai would do. He would go to maybe a local artisan and say, hey, can you teach me these things? And that would be part of his education, of his refinement. Um, he would, uh, so he would engage in these activities. And this is during peacetime. So when there was war, obviously they're going out to battle. Now, they were considered officers in an army, but they really didn't act like officers. Really what they did was they brought in Erika Ritsu. Oh, is that, here we go, yeah. Miss Hokusa. Very good anime. Give it a watch sometime. It's really good stuff. I think you can find it on Netflix. Um, so when they went into battle, so went into battle, battle is how the samurai would actually achieve advancement. This is how they got forward. This is how they got, no pun intended, ahead. Okay. <laughs> I know. Yeah, right? Uh, so basically what they would do is they would go into a battle, they would lead a unit of Agaretsu, which are poorly trained soldiers, they would direct them into battle with another group of them, and then once they started being stabby with each other, then they, the samurai, would look for another samurai on the opposite side to do battle with. Because you don't get honor, you don't get benefits for killing a simple soldier, you have to go after other samurai. And if you had a if you knew a samurai that on the opposite side of renown, uh, someone who was very well known, you were looking for him on the battlefield. So maybe you would be, be able to identify him by his armor. Armor Japanese armor was very individual and it's very ornate. So sometimes they could go on the description of that. But this is where in anime you you get that kind of weird moment where everyone announces who they are to each other. You know, they say. I'm Steve Gerhardt, and Brent would go, I'm Brent P. Newhall. Let us fight to the death and for honor and glory. So you would have that weird conversation, and that those things actually did happen because they're trying to identify each other. I'm so-and-so. Who are you? I'm so-and-so. Okay, you mean nothing. I'm going on to the next guy. You know, so that's literally how it worked. Unless he attacked you anyway, and you had to kill him. Now, if you're a higher-ranking samurai and or you had an assistant, that, that squire, someone who's learning to be a samurai, that person would carry a bag with them. And as you started going after other samurai, if you were good at what you were doing, you were able to kill that samurai. You took that guy's head. And while you're taking that guy's head off, your assistant is looking around to make sure nobody stabs you in the back, spears you, or you get hit in the forehead with, a, with an arrow. So you take the head as a samurai, and you turn to your assistant and go, put it in the sack. Assistant puts it in the sack. And off you go to the next victim. This is how the samurai worked. At the end of the battle, if you're side one, or you know, if, if you had a really particularly good opponent, 
you will go up to your general and your lord, and you say, I'm going to present you the heads of these samurai. Before those heads are presented, they are actually groomed. The heads are groomed. So a woman will come in, take the head, put, you know, make sure that if the hair's messed up, that she would groom it and put it back into a top knot. Um, you know, make, you know, like a mortician, make the, the face's life like as possible. Put black in the teeth because that's, that's a show of, of, you know, vitality. And then take the head, come up to a board <laughs> that has a spike in it. Shunk, you put the head on the board and you can probably fit like three heads to a board. That's how they made them. And you present them, this, this, these boards with the heads on it, to your lord, to your general, to your commanding officer. And they would look at it and go, oh, that's so-and-so? Wow. Okay. Thank, thank goodness you're on our side. Thank you. We want to keep you on your side. Here's a stipend. Here's a pension. Uh, maybe if, if you were given land, that was outstanding because that meant you could increase your own personal fortune. Um, maybe you get a rise in rank. Maybe you, you go, okay, from now on, you're, you can name your, your heirs as samurai if you want to. These are all very important things. And these are things that the samurai wanted to achieve for themselves and for their family. So that is how they pretty much lived during the warring states periods. They just, you know, just hacked and slashed their way through it practically. Um, so how did it all end? How, how, did, how did the samurai suddenly become, well, persona non grata? Well, it, it, it took a little bit of time, but it, it started with on the eve of the unification of Japan by Oda Nobunaga. Excuse me. So Oda Nobunaga used a piece of technology that advanced Japan greatly. It's the Tanegashima matchlock. But it wasn't just that he used it. It's just that he found the proper way to use it. Beforehand, it was considered a defensive weapon, a good defensive weapon, but just a defensive weapon. They didn't really understand how to use it effectively in an offensive manner. For the samurai, they didn't look down on it. They, again, they thought it was as a personal weapon, it was a good thing to have, but for them to be able to advance, they had to do the one-on-one -on -one combat and that just didn't do it. So what would happen, so what, what happened is Oda Nobunaga put together entire units of Egarashu trained on these, on these matchlocks. And in doing so, he recreated and modernized the Japanese army. So it became less important for the samurai to go out there and kill another samurai. What became more important is that the samurai had to be able to lead these units into battle successfully and kill the other units and use those units to push the enemy back. So it was no longer about personal glory, which meant that the samurai had to stop being warriors and become soldiers. They had to learn, learn a whole new system of tactics, of strategy, of using firearms. And this went completely uh, opposite of, the, of what they had been doing for like close to 300 years, which is we're going to use all these sorts of manner of bladed weapons, bows and arrows, hands and fists, whatever, to achieve our personal gratification. Now it's no longer the case, and now you have to be a soldier. And being a soldier means that you put aside your needs and wants for the needs and wants of, of, of the unit. So that was the first downfall. When, when Samurai started learning, oh, it's not enough for me to cut somebody's head off. I actually have to lead men in battle, stay with them, and be successful in my mission. That's the only way I'm going to advance now. So the cutting off of heads and putting on spikes and presenting them, not so much a thing anymore. So then, once the technology started being a factor, you had the, the actual unification of Japan and the end of the Sengoku period. Once the country was unified under one rule, suddenly there was no more wars. There was no more battles. There were no more rebellions of significant note. There, there was nothing for them to do. They, they, they didn't... Um, they just... They, they had nothing to do. They were bored. So if you have nothing to do and you can't fight anymore, then what's the point of being a samurai? And then it gets worse. In 1635, there is the closed country edict of 1635. What that meant was that nobody could leave Japan. 
without permission. And if you did, if you came back, you will be executed. If you're abroad and you come back, you're executed. If you harbor anyone from outside of Japan without permission, you're executed. And a guy who might wash up on your shores. He's executed too. So suddenly, there are no more external enemies. So there's not even, you know, unless somebody's invading Japan, there's no one to fight. There's nobody left to fight. And the whole point of being a samurai is to fight to cause death. That's, that's their job. So then, this is where they start turning into bureaucrats. So what else are they going to do? Well, the lords are going to be as, be scared of the of the samurai because they are still a powerful force. So they want to keep them happy. So how do you keep a board man happy? Well, you give them a job in the bureaucracy. To give you an idea of the bureaucracy. Let's see here. Looking out my notes here. get to look like I actually know what I'm talking about. Put on the glasses here. All right, here we go. The most authoritative decree issued by the Bakufu, which is a tent government, to control the peasantry was the KM proclamation of 32 articles promulgated in 1649. Enjoined peasants to obey Bakufu decrees, considered the, pax, the payment of land taxes their primary responsibility, Work diligently at their farming, rise early in the morning to cut grass, cultivate the fields during the day, and make straw ropes and sacks at night. That was law. That's what you had to do. Except when sleeping, they were to devote all their time to farm work, and neither they nor their wives and children were to drink sake or tea. They were to plant bamboo and trees around their houses for use as firewood, and from the first of the year, they were to repair farm equipment to have them ready for the use in spring. Toilets had to be built near the houses and ample provisions made to store human waste, which was to be turned into fertilizer by mixing with grass and water. They were to apply such fertilization as possible to paddy and upland fields. Regarding their diets, peasants were instructed not to consume all the rice and other cereals after the fall harvest. Instead, as their normal stable, they were to eat barley, millet, and cabbage. And daikon if they could grow it. Point being that the Tokugawa government had complete and other control over everything. And to enforce that control, they wanted to use the samurai to do that. Only they didn't need to use force. They just needed to show up and say, are you making your straw hats today? Good, great. Um, is your is your crapper working? Good, great. Just don't forget to use your own waste to plant the, you know, make the rice grow. Because rice is the currency of the economy. And that's and that's why they have the, the, the uh, shogunate wants the peasants to be solely focused on this. And they want the samurai to solely focus on to make sure that the farmers are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, as they control, start controlling the economics of it, and when it's, now that they have no external trade and they have no wars, there's no, no treasure to pillage or anything like that, the economy starts to go down. So the samurai who can't fight anymore. They kind of earn a stipend. They are paid to be basically unemployed, which means that twice a year they get they get one half of their stipend, one in, in the one in the winter and one in the spring. And basically the the lords will say we're going to pay you this stipend and we're going to pay you just to sit around and be here and not work for anybody else or anything so that you don't get up to mischief and try to rebel against us. So here's some money we're bribing you. So what do they do with that money? How, how, what you know? What? Oh yes, as is John over here goes. Uh, uh, yeah, that 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 was part of it. Another part of it was um, drinking, and gambling, or you know, drinking the gambling, um, and anything that was allowed to the samurai to do, which was not much. The Tokugawa shogunate forbade them to do things like. At one point, they weren't even allowed to go to to see a kabuki show. They weren't even allowed to do that at one point. Um, so it was it was a very tough time for the samurai. So what does a samurai do when they're bored? Well, we have an account, first-hand account, Musui's story, which is a Edo-era uh, samurai, whose real name is Katsu Koichi, Kokichi, sorry. And one of the things he talks about in here is that he, is, you know, they they gamble, and they gamble and they spend money because 
there's nothing else to do. They spend money on fine swords and and uh, and clothes and things like that. So, like one point, he says, challenging students from rival schools was getting to be a regular occupation. That meant that he was just like literally picking a fight. Night, night after night, I roamed the streets with my followers in tow. Every so often, just to keep them in their place, I took them to the home of Master Hirayama Shiru to hear them tell stories of Japan and China. My foolishness was dragging me deeper into debt. I wouldn't stop. What he basically was saying there is that he's paying for these meals for not only for his the people who are following him that are supposed to be his students. He's not teaching them anything. And he's taking them to his a, a guy who's respected, but an older guy, so he has to pay for that guy's meal. So he's paying a lot of money that he doesn't have. And he goes, I wouldn't stop, even then, and borrowed money with no prospect of being able to repay. I was 21 and penniless. I had no choice but to sell my everyday sword, the Morimitsu I'd bought for 41 Rio from the dealer Oriya Kyunama. Sorry for the, uh, the slaughter of the Japanese language. At the last moment, I couldn't bear to part with it, even to make an appearance at the commissioner's house. I had only the clothes on my back. To take my mind off my woes, I went to Yoshiwara, which is a gambling district. Because, you know, when you're deep in debt, that's what you do. You gamble more. But you could win big, yes. Or you could do what happened to the rest of the samurai and sell all your possessions. So what would happen, what Masui did, was that to make, <clears throat> to make money, he profited off the misfortune of other samurai. Many of the friends I'd helped in times of trouble came to me when they had swords to sell. But since they were not knowledgeable about swords, I never had a loss. At the market, I made a practice of spending half of the profits to treat my fellow dealers to buckwheat noodles or occasional sake. They addressed me as lord and master and secretly alerted me beforehand if they heard of a customer coming with a piece of goods. That's how he made his money. He went to his samurai friends who were poor and destitute and said, hey, I'll get you some money, but I'm gonna, I'll am gonna i sell you your sword. I'll become a sword, um, you know, market your sword out there. I'll get, get money. Here's your half of it. I'm taking the other half, and I'm spending it lavishly because that's you know what he did. That's what they did. That's what low-ranking samurai did because they had nothing else to do. So that's what it looked like to be a samurai in Edo, Japan. Uh, this was probably around uh, 1820s. So what really sealed the deal for the for the samurai? was the opening of Japan by, by the United States. <clears throat> so in, 18, in 1853, again, Perry shows up, and he, has a, and he comes up with a small squadron of uh, the black boats, you know, with, with cannon, uh, 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 you know, up-to-date technology, a show of force, and he, and he, steams, into, <clears throat> he steams into the harbor, and he goes to the emperor, not realizing that it's still the shogun who's in control, but he goes to the emperor, and he says, Look at my telescope. Look at the telegraph. See how this works? And here's a steam locomotive model engine. Isn't this cool? Here you go. By the way, we're going to need you to make sure that you open two ports in your nation in case we have shipwrecked soldiers or uh, sailors that come in uh, that might happen by. And we're going to need you need to be able to trade with you. We're going we're to need to be able to make provisions with you. So uh, we're going to be gone for the next six months, and we're going to come back, and you should have an answer for us. So basically threatened the Japanese government. The imperial court passes on the note to the Tokugawa shogunate, who goes, uh, don't know what to do. Um, <laughs> what do I do here? So then this samurai lord, Lord Itokara Katsugakira, from the Anaka domain, does the samurai marathon. He gathers a whole bunch of samurai together. And says, we're going to show the fitness of the samurai. We're going to see how well they're doing. And we're going to have them do a race. And during this race, there's no holds barred. You know, you run. If you want to push someone off the trail, you can. If you want to slug someone, knock them out, whatever. You know, we want to show our physical prowess and that, that when the invaders come back, the samurai will be there and we'll drive them from the shores. Not a one makes it. Not a one. They, they, they're out of shape. They can't make it. The ones that are vicious and able to push people off the trail or whatnot would probably stumble over a rock and just go to sleep because they, they, just, they just can't do it. At this point with this display, and this isn't the only samurai marathon that happened, but this was the most famous one, um, the Tokugawa shogunate said, we, we acquiesce. So the United States comes back. Perry comes back, 1854. And they they signed the uh, 
the treaty. And, tr and not only does the United States get what they asked for, but they are also given most favored nation status, which means that any agreement they make with any nation from here on also has to apply to the United States. So anything that benefits another country also benefits the United States. This is what they do. At this point, the samurai are incensed. They're just like, how could you do that? How could, how could this happen? In a sense, yeah. <laughs> they, they, how could you do that? We are Japan. We don't bow to anybody. Why is this happening? You know what? And they looked at the Togugawa shogunate and said, it's your fault. This is your fault. So the emperor at the time, the emperor at the time had two major clans that supported him. The Chosun and the, Sets, uh, the um, Setsuma. Uh, was it Setsuma? Yeah, Setsuma um, samurai. So these two clans fully supported the emperor. In 1876, they bring the emperor in and they declare him the actual authoritative ruler of Japan. They dissolve the Tokugawa shogunate and the Tokugawa shogunate goes, hold on, hold on, just wait a second. We got samurai too. And they attack the, the Satsuma uh, forces, which are led by Saigo Takamori. We're gonna talk about him in a moment, I'm running a little over time. Um, so this causes the Boshin War. And the Boshin War is basically how the Meiji Restoration starts. And the Emperor, his forces win over the Togugawa Shogunate. Uh, there's a little bit of, uh, of forces up in Hokkaido that make the Izo Republic. Saigo Takamori, under the service of the Emperor, goes back up there, kicks their butt, and the Meiji Restoration takes into effect. The Meiji Restoration, of course, is what modernizes Japan, and this is what we're talking at the beginning of it. And they put in, they start putting in new uh, institutions, new technology, new ways of doing things. And one of the things that they did was um, do away with the feudal system, the vassal system, which meant that the samurai were no more. That's it. They were done. The samurai were banned. Now, this doesn't mean that they were jailed or anything like that. As, as a matter of fact, if you were a high-ranking samurai, you could probably find a post in the government. If you're a lower-ranking samurai, you could probably find a post in the local government. So it wasn't like you were kicked to the curb and out on the street, but what it meant to be a samurai, the whole point of being a samurai, the honor, the loyalty, the fealty, all that, gone. A lot of samurai were upset about this. One of them was Saigo Takamori who devoted himself to the emperor. He didn't like modernization that much unless it was affecting the military, which case he was a fan of it. But if you were talking about trains, for some reason he really hated trains, don't know why, but he had a problem with them. So he did not like the modernization to begin with, but because he was a great samurai, he was considered one of the greatest of his time, he followed the emperor. Okay, the emperor said this, I am going to retire gracefully I'm going to set up schools across Japan for samurai to go to to learn new trades, new things. And so while they're learning new stuff, they're still doing their combat exercises. Now keep in mind that the Tanakashima matchlock is now part of that. So that technology of firearms is part of their training, including artillery. Takamori really liked artillery. He liked things that went boom and were very loud. So these schools, about 137 of them, cropped up all over Japan. Takamori is a popular guy. The, the people like him because he's one of the three great nobles that supported the Meiji Restoration. He, he fought in the Boshin War, basically won the Boshin War on his own. And so he was very well thought of. And he went into retirement. And everyone thought it was nice and happy. And then the samurai were banned. And Takamori said, okay, I'm going to retirement. Don't like it, but here I am. Now, how many of you have seen Gundam Origins? And the scene where um, Char Ensemble at the academy with Garma institutes a rebellion. Okay, and that leads up to the to the to the uh, to the one year war, right? That is what actually it's a, that's a nod to what had happened for the Satsuma Rebellion. What happened was that Takamori was content in being in being uh, retired, but his students were mad. They hated it, and then the government did something stupid and sent in police officers to in, uh, to investigate the students, and they thought it was a way to assassinate Takamori. So they got mad, hit the naval shipyards at Nagasaki and Kyoto, took the provisions, declared victory, 
sent a letter to Takamori, said, we are in rebellion, lead us. Takamori reluctantly agreed. And he went into the Satsuma, uh, Satsuma Rebellion, whereupon he died. I mean, he, he, he obviously he lost the war. But here's the thing. He is considered the last samurai. Right. The book says the real life story that inspired the movie, Last Samurai, Tom Cruise. Don't watch the movie. It's historically inaccurate. But he is considered to be the last great samurai. So in his rebellion, he did very well until, the, of course, the end when he you know, had um, um, not as much supplies. He's being driven to the hinterlands. He's finally encircled. He uh, gets a wound in his thigh, and he dies on the battlefield. And it is, as we talk about getting the heads and putting them on a pike into being, and having them delivered, it is a sign of, way, of showing the people it's over. We have his head. It's done. It's over. After he died on the battlefield, a couple other samurai cut off his head, hid the head, in an effort to prevent the imperial forces from finding it and declaring total victory. They can claim victory because they win the battle, but they're not able to convince the populace that the man is dead unless they have his head. That's kind of why they also, back in medieval Europe, they put heads on pikes to prove, yes, the dude is dead, so your rebellion's over. At first, they couldn't find the head. And so the rebellion was kind of still on, even though they did a last charge of 300 samurai and got totally wiped out. They finally found the head. Now, this is where it kind of gets into myth. Um, they say that the head was treated well and it was washed in a stream and the emperor cried over him and all this wonderful stuff. And here is such a man, such a man. Did not happen. Did not happen. Here's how the samurai ended with the last samurai. This is an account from Captain Hubbard, a uh, captain of a vessel from Boston. He was there when the bodies of the samurai leaders were presented. This is what he had to say about Saigo Takamori. He was a large, powerful looking man, his skin almost white. His clothing had been taken off and he lay there naked. It was a few seconds before he realized that his head was cut off. Next to Saigo lay Kirino the Mutsura. Saigo's was the only headless body but the others were a fearful sight to look at. Their heads were dreadfully cut up, and it was quite evident that, that, that they killed each other. No doubt their heads would all have been cut off by their own people had time permitted. While we were looking at the bodies, Saigo's head was brought in and placed by his body. It was a remarkable looking head, and anyone would have said at once that he must have been the leader. And that is the end of the samurai. Thank you for having me at this panel. Do you have questions? That is really cool. Uh, thank you, Steve. So um, I have a question. What's your question? Um, what are some of your favorite samurai anime? Ooh, um, definitely uh, Samurai Shampoo. I've always enjoyed that one. Um, it, it Actually, we were talking about it earlier. It, mm -hmm. it has a great... Um, um, but it talks about uh, towards the end, it's, it's placed at the end of the samurai era, mm -hmm. and uh, you know just in different modes of, of thought of the samurai and also of Christianity. So mm -hmm. it's really pretty good. Uh, you know, of course, there's always you know what can I say about Rurouni Kenshin? I mean, it's just you know what, what can you say? It's 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 that, right, it's right there. What, what more can one say? Um, so yeah, it's uh, uh, the, you know anything. Uh, oh, uh, Samurai Seven. I actually really do like okay. Samurai Seven, which is uh, uh, definitely a a uh, retelling of <laughs> Akira Kurosawa's. Yeah. Uh, when the and, mecha show up. Yeah, when the mecha show up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but but yeah, those uh, those are some uh, some fun mm -hmm. some fun of the an some fun anime is like Kintana and, and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What about uh, live action? Live action, uh, pretty much any of the Akira Kurosawa movies. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, of course trilogy. There's, yeah, so, oh yeah the so, so Rashomon um, Rashomon Seven Samurai the Samurai trilogy uh, the Hidden Fortress, Fortress. and um, the Blood Throne the Bloody Throne oh, the Blood, yes, the blood yeah, Throne yeah. which is actually the the Scottish play or Shakespeare's Macbeth but yeah. it's told by the by the point of view of the samurai um, those are very very good movies there's also another movie. Where if you want to watch it and and see how well because a lot of um, 
there was a question in chat, are there still samurai today? And the answer is actually kind of yes. Mm. Um, so in terms of skill with the sword as in actually how you would use it with the katana, mm -hmm. uh, Sword of Doom uh, mm -hmm. is, is a good movie. And it shows really great choreographed fight scenes that a lot of instructors say, no, this is how you use it, this is how you wield it. And it's a good movie in general. It just shows about the descent of madness <laughs> of a samurai, but uh, uh, focusing on one particular sword. Um, yeah. Um, so the question, uh, Captain Laser Eyes, yeah. Um, are there still samurai today? Sort of. Um, what is taught is basically the, co the core concepts of the Bushido Code, and it's adapted to business, mm -hmm. um, to a lot of business, and to... Uh, you know, for people who want to improve their lives, it's a, it's a great way to, um, you know, go, go about your life, frugality, you know, being loyal to your friends and things like that. Um, but there are no actual samurai yeah. today. There are, however, samurai families. You know what I'm yeah. I so, which is a little bit different. So there are people that can, that can uh, trace their lineage back to a samurai family. And some samurai families, I think, still collect a pension. Mm, okay. um, oddly mm. enough, um, it's yeah. it's not much, but you know, it's a couple cents on a dollar, literally. <laughs> but you know, it's 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 a source of pride. Mm -hmm. um, actually, Akira Kurosawa is from a samurai family. His cool. his father, and in World War II, it was not unusual for um, descendants of the samurai. Yes, there are descendants, the samurai descendants. Uh, to in World War II to have been uh, become officers, so that was not uh, that was not unusual to have your pedigree as an officer read. Oh, I served here, here, here. Oh, and he's the son of a of a of a samurai family. Gotcha, makes sense. Now, yeah. Any any titleage with samurai families left? So, like you know, you have yeah. you know, the Maquis of something or other. You have a count. Right. Yeah, no, yeah, not really, true. because they've they've gone away from the feudal system. Yeah, there's so no so there's no real um, and and it was not considered a title of nobility, mm -hmm. even though it's hereditary. So um, in order to be a samurai, you actually have to be a samurai. Mm -hmm. You can be of a samurai family, but you have to have another samurai to acknowledge you as a samurai. Mm -hmm. So since there are no more samurai, yeah. And I yeah. guess technically because the, the government has literally, like, changed. Like, we right. no longer have a feudal samurai system. You know, you still have the title because, you you know, you were given the title. Right. But it doesn't give you any power. And that, yeah, there's no there's no real shift. benefits. There's yeah. no real power. Yeah. The, it's well, it's more of a... Once, once you have the revolution in France, you still, to mm. this day, have a dauphin. Right. You know, you mm. Right. Yeah, right. The yeah. nobility that's there, yeah. but the, the old republic what, is, you know, what swept you, away the... Yeah. And what you do have is <laughs> great neo samurai. What you do have is um, social status with being mm -hmm. a, from a samurai family. That gives you a certain level of it opens certain doors for you. Sure. Okay. So yeah. you know if you were so if you're a businessman Rockefeller, like right. Rockefeller, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you're a businessman and you can claim samurai lineage, that might open a door to an interview mm -hmm. for you or mm -hmm. so, or some type of social status. Um, quite often in uh, 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 like pre-war Japan, it wasn't uncommon for, again, I, I use Akira Korsawa's family as, as an example, where one half of the family would be a merchant family and the other half, half would be a samurai family so that you would be wealthy because the samurai could open the doors for the, wealthy, mm -hmm. for, for the merchant family. Mm -hmm. So it kind of works out in that way. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. Anything else you wanted to bring up? Um... No, actually, I think I think we're all good on the same else in chat lane has a question. Yeah, all right. Well, thank you all so much. This is the end of OnCon 6. Appreciate having you all here. Um, appreciate uh, having an audience to share all this out with. Um, all these videos will be available on the YouTube channel. Uh, we'll have a chance to process, and we'll chop them out into individual videos uh, and have them available for in as individual panel videos. You want to come back and uh, revisit this material, they will be there. And uh, yeah, that'll do it for us for uh, Uncon Six. So thank you all so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. See you. Uh, See ya. Bye all. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Bye. Bye.